Okay, so let's get an idea of the audience. Uh, who's a trainee? Okay, who's within five years of being a specialist? Who's old? Okay, so let's talk about safety surgery. I'm sorry about these fonts here, but this is the technique they use here. But I've been given some instructions of what I've got to do this morning, so we'll cover those first. So what are we going to try and do? This is the, what we call the graveyard shift, the early morning shift. I've been doing it for 22 years on this course, and three, uh, three years on a previous one, and nothing's changed. That's important, because we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, it's running automatically now. This is Robert in his garden, um, a great gardener. This is him when he was young. He's looking a bit older than that now. In fact, he's, he's four years younger than me, but I think you know, I've weathered a little bit better. Um, let's just see. And this is one of the first uh, courses we had when we were all happy before Brexit. Um, let's keep going. He cheats, like all Frenchmen. This was in uh, Los Angeles a few years ago. And one of the tips I should give to the trainees is never go with your friend to a meeting who has a camera because they will always take a picture of you and then it will be regurgitated. So we're having some problems at the moment, as you know, um, with the fishing. Sorry, let's go back. We need to, we need to go back up to that one. So we're having some problems with the fishing. This may, this may not play. This is Emmanuel Macron on the right, and this is Boris. And they're arguing about the fishing quota. Boris has a solution. And most of the fish that you're eating on this course comes from Ireland. They'll tell you it comes from the far next to us. It comes from Ireland. So they're going to tell you a story. In fact, the French are very good at telling stories. <laughs> okay, so never underestimate the power of a good story. So our story starts on the 28th of June, 1955. What happened then? I was born. And my life, I'm now 67, almost mirrors the time that we have spent as clinicians performing stapy surgery. Because the first operations in stapy surgery were performed in 1955 and 1956. That was also the beginning of the space race. So not a very long time, really. And in fact, this course has been running for one third of the time that we've been performing stapy surgery. Oh, we must see, must see this one. And we face problems just like the Americans. So May 1956, John Shea, probably the father of modern safety surgery. There were other people around about the same time, Koss, people like that, but really he's the guy that kicked it off. Very clever, very handsome, very charismatic, quite a difficult individual, I think. Uh, 
Vilma Rex worked for him, a uh, very good friend of Wilco and myself. He looks a little bit like Dr. Kildare, for anybody who's old enough to remember Dr. Kildare. And he teamed up with an engineer called Harry Treese. Harry Treese's company transformed into Zomed Medtronic. And what they showed was if you get an engineer to work with a surgeon, you can do great things. And this is Harry Treese. Now, when you quote a figure for a dead ear for stapes surgery, what do you quote? Or what's the generic figure that everybody quotes? 1%. Do you think that's true? Probably not. If you look at heart surgery, kidney surgery, bowel surgery, every other surgery, there have been big advances over the last 60 years. Quantum advances. But there's been very little change in stapes surgery. John Shea was getting results that are nearly as good as Robert. You know, his dead ear rate, John Shea's dead ear rate, was around about 0.8, 0.9%. Robert's is about 0.4, 0.5. And that sounds twice as good, but it's not. It's just a small incremental change. So all we can do, we're not going to make any massive change, is fertile around the edges and make small changes that give our patients better results. And you'll say 1% isn't very much, but if you're the 1%, it's 100%. This is the Shea Clinic. I can't go any louder. So polyethylene tubing, vein grafts. So, a synthetic strut, a bucket handle prosthesis, and a vein graft. What's changed? Nothing. It's exactly what we're doing here now. You may argue that this isn't the best tea technique, and you like nitinol, or you like uh, Teflon and wire, but in the hands of an obsessional surgeon, the results are... You can't drive a piece of paper through them. They're they're very, very similar. And what you have to decide, the trainees, is which one is best for you. We can't prove that a vein graft makes any difference. But to me, I'm more interested in engineering than medicine. I, it makes sense to me that if you have a powerful car, we're going to see one in a minute, you would like a cylinder head gasket to stop the oil leaking out. And that's my simplistic way of looking at it. Wilco will shoot me down in flames in about 15 minutes, because that's the way we do it here. So here's my Porsche GT3. Anybody ever gets a chance to have a ride in one? Fantastic. Wilco will tell you not to ride in mine. Apparently, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. <laughs> not more than once. <laughs> How much energy from that engine gets to the road? Or your BMW or your Mercedes, or if you're a trainee, your Kia? Come on. No. The frictional losses in the Nissan GTR, Ferrari, GT3 are about 12 to 13 percent. Yeah, no, that's, they're about 12 or 13 percent on the dyno. And that's because lubricants like Nicosil are used. So the best engineers in the world lose somewhere between 12 and 15 percent. How much energy gets across the middle ear? When you rattle the eardrum, how much energy gets from the drum to the cochlea? 96, 97%. So the best engineers in the world lose 15%. But God, Allah, intelligent design, whoever you believe in, has done a much better job of the ear. They're only losing 4%. And that's great for us, because it means we can get a really good hearing result. And how do we get a good hearing result? This is called a sink bodger. The older ones amongst us have got these, or a toilet bodger. When the toilet's blocked or the sink's blocked, you use this. And that's basically what we're doing, aren't we? We're putting a strut in with a bit of vein stuck on the end. And we're only losing 
I mean, incredible. So there's a learning curve in Stapy surgery. And when you start, when all of us started specialists, we were, without doubt, the best surgeons we'd ever met. And we were going to change the world. And you realize very rapidly that you're not going to change the world. You're only going to make a small improvement. And this is Gordon Hughes's work, which was done in the States. And he was very brave because he presented his first 100 cases. At a time in the States in the 80s, when there was litigation was starting, and this is Gordon Hughes's first 100 cases. And you can see that um, anything below the line is a failure. If you guys started doing Stapes surgery now and got that many failures, we'd send you off to do FES or something much simpler. Um, but he was brave to present this. So a guy called Matthew Young, who you might have heard of, because he's a friend of mine, who classified cholesteatoma for the CERL, and for Europe, um, said to me, John, I've got a great idea for some research work. Let's look at our first 100 cases that we did from 1991 to 2001. And this is our curve, uh, which was in the laryngoscope. It's probably worth having a read of. And it's called a cousin curve. And the way it works is that anywhere where the line is falling is a success. And anywhere where the line is rising is a failure. It doesn't mean a dead ear. It just means a shit result or not a good result. So you can see that for me, my learning curve came in at 64 cases before I started getting really good results. The bad news is this is a primary learning curve. And I'm, when I retired two years ago, I was up to about 1,400 cases. There's a secondary learning curve, a tertiary, a quaternary, and it, it keeps going because what happens is your colleagues send you the more difficult cases. And therefore, it's a challenge for every 100 cases. But it's worth plotting that yourself. It was, uh, it was written up originally um, in one of the British journals. Um, and if you look up CUSUM, C-U-S-U-M, you can plot your own. And uh, we've worked together. We've collaborated with Robert for a long time. Um, you know, I've been friends with him for 30 years. And uh, I thought, well, I've done 100 cases in 10 years. And when he came along to see me on my course, which was the one that went before this one, um, I thought, this guy's OK, but he's not really that good. You know, I can match him. And he came back two years later, and he'd done 500 cases. And I thought, bloody hell, he's good. And of course, now he's done getting on for 10,000. So the best way for us to learn is not to develop our own technique, but to watch the way that somebody who's done eight or 10,000 does it, because he's learned everything that works and everything that doesn't work. Um, this is inter oh, I will forget that one. This is interactive, so you know, butt in if you don't agree with me. So you saw that thing about spit to begin with, and this just is for the trainees. When you're doing your first case, be very careful who you select because your boss, Miguel Esfigui or Wilfo Bromman, is watching you, and they're going to decide. The, the first case in Stabies, it's our fault, it, is one of the biggest things you'll ever do when you get a tremor and adrenaline going around. And for my first case, I went to see my GP, my primary, primary care doctor, and I said, I'm doing a, a, a big operation tomorrow. What can I do? And he said, well, you could have some propanolol. So I looked at uh, 40 milligrams of propanolol, and I thought, that's no good, I'll have four. <laughs> the nurse had to hold me upright on the chair and I had a pulse, I had a pulse of 36. Uh, but it, the case went great. I wasn't, nothing was going to phase me. So do be careful. So you want to get the right patient selection. You want to be comfortable. You want to be illuminated. You want to have good in instrumentation and you want to have good technique. And all of these things, if you get them perfect, might improve your performance by 0.2 of a percent or 0.3 of a percent but if you're the one percent you get down to 0.8 you're doing very well if you do that in your entire career if you get down to 0.6 you're you, you you're a world leader so this is the case that i suggest you pick for your first case um preferably with the one on the left in both ears 
because if you have a patient with bilateral lobes of sclerosis and you improve them by 20%, they'll be delighted. If you have a patient with unilateral lobes of sclerosis and you don't improve them by 90%, they'll say, well, doctor, it's a bit better, but I still use my other ear. Nice to see a Carhartt knot. That's pretty good evidence that you're going to come across lobes sclerosis, and we do get it wrong. And what we're aiming for is what we see on the left side. So this is one of my first ones. Um, you want a good speech audiogram as well. My rule is about 60% um, score, but I will operate at less than that. And I've had patients who, who've said they've still got a good result. And this is the sort of thing that would be very nice to see at three to six months. And you know that we use the 4,000 frequency in Europe. That's a little bit less common in North America, where they only go up to three in a lot of cases, which is why their results sometimes look as good or better than ours. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think we should have an agreed frequency worldwide so that we can compare our results. So these are things that I found really important. Um, you know, I love being in theatre. I talk all the time, as you might guess. But if I go quiet, it means the shit has hit the fan. I have, in my entire career, we looked at, at the statistics, 92% of my cases were done with the same anesthesiologist. And that's almost unheard of. Nowadays, you just get whoever's available. But this guy was a genius. He still is a genius. And he transformed my, my working life. Um, take no chances. Um, I, you might not understand. This is an Irish lorry. And uh, the Irish are a bit like the, the Dutch think of the Belgians. Um, but down in the basement of this hospital at the moment, in the block, um, a bit of the Spanish Inquisition is going on. And uh, they will be strapping Robert's first case to the table because he doesn't want any movement. And that's why we favour general anaesthesia. There's some extremely good stapy surgeons in the UK. Jeremy Lavery would be a good example who do it under local. But I think there's a little bit of movement and I don't want that. The argument would be, I know when the stapy's prosthesis is working. Well, I don't need to know that. I know it's going to work if I get it in the hole. This is my table, which was built by the same people that built the Titanic that didn't sink. And they have just scrapped it, got rid of it because of health and safety, because they say this will only take 140 kilograms. Well, we've loaded it with 450 and there were no problems. And there's a gear in there that would power a super tanker, but much, much better than an electronic table. This is a pregnancy board for a pregnant woman's abdomen. And here we've got our pregnant woman, that's me. And there's a panic in theatre about the patient is going to slide off the table. There's nothing strapping me on. And that is at between 12 and 18 degrees. Patients don't slide off, whatever they tell you. Well, you could, well I've never had one slide off. All right, well, that's, you haven't got a good non-slip map like me and a good anaesthetist to catch them. This is only 12 degrees. It looks more than that. What we like is we like to have the ear flat because that means when we put the prosthesis in, it's vertical. And if it's vertical, it won't fall over. And you say well, it doesn't fall over anyway. Well, it does occasionally. Maybe that's a tenth of 1%, but it makes your job a little bit easier. Okay, table flat. Table rolled to 12 degrees. And can you see now that the platform that I'm going to rest my fingers on is virtually horizontal. This is the speculum that's produced by Zomed Medtronic, and I personally feel is the best one. This goes under the patient's shoulder, not on the table. So if you do have to move the patient during the procedure, it's very easy to move rather than faffing around underneath the sheets. I have a Yashagil as well. I don't really favor this quite as much. Although I think Yashigil, was a, he was a neurosurgeon, was a very clever guy. Now, the other thing that's important is if we look at the difference in profile. This is the Yashigil sticking out over the side of the table. And this is the one that goes underneath the shoulder. And as some of you have noticed, as I've grown into late middle age, I've put a little bit of weight on. And if I use the Yashigil, my abdomen touches and it moves. 
the patient. So you get a tremor. So that's the other reason for favoring the shorter holder. So image stability. For the last 20 years, I've had a ceiling mounted microscope. This is definitely the way to go. We share theatres with other specialties. The general surgeons will no longer go in our theatre because they're terrified of the microscope. It's the spawn of the devil. And it means nobody shits up your theatre, basically. So if you ever get a chance for a new microscope, like the pendulum ones are very nice and everything, but if I was given a choice between one of the, the new microscopes or maybe a Zeiss three or four years old that could ceiling mount, I'd have the ceiling mounted one. This is one of my trainees. And can you see his optical axis? He's looking straight across and vertical. This takes a bit, a bit of getting used to. The first time the instruments are put in your hand, the nurse has to show you where your hands are. But you get used to it very quickly. So here's me sitting there. And this is a really comfortable position. You've got a straight back. You're looking ahead rather than looking down. The prosthesis isn't going to fall over. And your nurse has got lots of room for the instruments. And you'll see Celine in theatre, who's a fabulous scrub nurse here, helping Robert. And she'll have the instruments all in a fantastic position. Illumination. Now, I understand about flow down tubes, Poisson's formula, but nobody's ever been able to explain to me about light down tubes. But we use a transcanal approach. And you're going to see Chris Aldrin later, who's done over a thousand. I've done well over a thousand. Robert's done 10,000. I've only done one endoral slit in all the stay pieces I've ever done. Chris has done one, and I don't know about Robert. But the narrowest part of the operation is the tympanic annulus. And your slit has no effect on that. All it does is causes a bit more blood to go down the canal. So when I argue with my German colleagues and things is, uh, they say, well, we like to get the extra light down there. But this is a five millimeter speculum. And Chris and I reckon we can operate to three. And that's a six millimeter speculum. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I think there's about twice as much light. So there must be a sort of inverse proportional law. So what you need is a very thin speculum that's pressed hard into the canal that controls the bleeding and you get the light that you need down there. Yeah, who does transcanal and who does transcanal or impermeable? Okay, who makes a slit? Endoral. So we can discuss this later because the whole thing about this is controversy and I, I want you to say, John, that's bullshit because he's going to... he's. He's going to say that anyway, so. I've, I've done thousands of endor to do mastoids, because that's the way, but, but I, it doesn't help me for a cicloplasty, well, a little bit for a cicloplasty if it's involved with any other middle ear surgery. But I don't do post auricular, I, I terrifies me. I don't know where I am. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody want to argue? I mean, no, they're not going to argue. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But you, you, you do what you're happy with. And for the trainees, you want to go and watch some of these guys, you know, watch Wilco, watch me, watch Chris Aldrin, uh, you know, watch TV Jim on and think they've got one or two good ideas, which I'm going to take home with me. And then when you've done your training, if you work for five or six people, maybe you'll advance the techniques by a little bit, but you're never going to cure the world. So I like hypotension, which involves injection of epinephrine. So I'm constantly fighting with my anesthesiologist because he's trying to bring the blood pressure down and I'm putting epinephrine in to bring the blood pressure up but it works and we have a rule that for this is ASA this is American Society of Anesthetists that we will take the systolic blood pressure during surgery down to the resting diastolic if you go further than that you can lose cerebral autoregulation and the patient can wake up a bit gar, -gar. we've never had one well, we thought we had one, but he was eating a steak an hour later. So he, he was obviously okay. This is a mastoid. And this is what a good anesthesiologist can do for you. Look, that's two hours there. 
and it doesn't shift by more than three or four points. And, and th this makes a huge difference when you're operating. I'm sure Miguel will tell you that when he's doing some of the skull based stuff. And we use a laryngeal mask. Does anybody use a laryngeal mask? Very safe. Never had a patient lose their airway, ever, whatever the pundits say. And they never cough when it's removed, which is exactly what you don't want, coughing at the end of a stay piece procedure. No, but that's, maybe they don't like it. Maximise your field of view. So choose your instruments. You know, I've got quite big hands, size eight. The girls are at an advantage here. You have finer hands, so your hands don't get in the way. But if you choose your instruments and you choose angled forceps, look at the difference. There's a huge difference in the field of view that you've got down that speculum. And you see how we rest our fingers on the speculum, because we've all got a tremor, whether we like it or not. But Robert will look as though he's got no tremor at all because he rests his fingers like this. Hey, nice talk. Yeah, this is Piper, your Brad Border Collie. Watch this. Piper, that's... <laughs> your poor Piper, you're such a smart dog. So, uh, what can your dog do? Fergus, Bud Light. So, choose the best instruments. So, make good use. We'll speed up a bit of good instruments. This is one of the early uh, Aura fibres that James Robinson and I designed. It was a lovely fibre because you could bend it at the end, but uh, a lovely uh, endo-outer probe because you could bend it at the end, but the fibre fiber was not reusable. Uh, this was the Aura XP. Originally, our gynaecologists were given a, the big Aura, which was like a big refuse disposal bin, and they found it so noisy that they gave it to me, which is why I started doing laser surgery. Then we had an XP. You're going to see the Luminous today, which is a lovely laser. But get the best you can. The Omni Guide's nice, but the fibre's again expensive, and that uses beam path technology. When you're selecting an endo outer probe, they vary. See again, this is a big fat one, and this is slim. Much easier to operate with this one than that one. Just another thing to think of. Only one millimetre smaller, but again, that's one millimetre that isn't in your ear canal. Good instruments for separating the joint. And I'm going to show you a trick about the joint in a minute because the joint knife is never quite long enough. Has anybody ever noticed that? It goes three quarters of the way through and you're sawing away at it and that causes vibration. So we tend to modify a beaver blade. This is a beaver disposable blade. And once a week I sneak into the ophthalmology theatre under cover of darkness and steal about 10 of them. And then I bend it to suit me. If you cut yourself with this, it never stops bleeding. So this is the one that I suggest you try. This is a crocodile force. If you take one thing away today, this will transform your surgery. That's the box on the crocodile forceps. And you put it one millimeter in, squeeze the forceps, and then bend. And that will give you the best joint knife you have ever used in your life. It's razor sharp with a diamond edge. It'll go through in one go, and you don't have to swipe at it. Right, so let's do an operation. We take a vein graft, we can argue that later. You take a vein off the back of the hand, that's the best quality vein. And this is like peeling toilet paper off the roll. We get rid of the adventitious tissue, put it on one side in case we get a tear in the eardrum, split the vein, and we stick the sticky side down, that's the outside. The first 150, I didn't know that the outside was the sticky side, and I used it the wrong way around, it made no difference at all to the results. And this is what we want to see when we start. We want to give adequate exposure to see half of the incus, the facial nerve, the posterior crust, the pyramid, and the stapedius tendon. And there's our corda. And if you can't see all those things, two things happen. You can't divide the joint unless you're using an endoscope, when it's possibly, possibly easier. And we're going to argue about that later as well. And you certainly can't crimp the prosthesis. This is testing for the joint, my only contribution to uh, stapy surgery. It's a synovial joint, and sometimes you can't find it. So if you lift, let's just play that one again. If you lift, you get negative pressure, and the joint's always lower than you think, as Wilco says. 
So you're scraping around at the top when it's lower down. This is what a good camera can show you. You can see the rouleau here in the blood vessels. I tell the medical students it's red blood cells, but that's just to show how clever I am. And so there we are, we can go in and we can separate the joint. You can only assess stapes mobility if the joint has been separated. If you don't separate it, you will get it wrong. And you want to put a press on the top and lateral pressure as well. You've got to, dis well, you just put it back together again. It works, it works, just like putting a, no, 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 just put it back together, you're fine. Because you've, all you've done is separate it. You've only opened the synovial capsule, you haven't done anything else. So we're now doing the rosette with a laser. I think I'm using one watt here. But in fact, there was a subiculum there. Um, and I think, yeah, you can see the subiculum, which is getting, getting a bit in the way. So I'm going to use a pick. It's such an accurate tool, the laser. Getting the anterior cross is difficult, but remember the anterior cross is much more vestigial than the posterior cross anyway, so you can always fracture it if necessary. And people say, what's the point of the laser? Well, the laser turns bone into charcoal and separating charcoal doesn't cause vibration. So there's the, there's the stapes coming out. We'll do our rosette. These are my eyelashes touching the microscope, causing this movement. And then all we do with the drill is blow away the charcoal. The drill's just a fan. It's not doing anything else. No, I work at that. I work at that magnification. Not now, because I've stopped. That was when I was 63. I'm 67 now. So as of yesterday, for anybody who forgot to send me a card, so there's our perilymph, and we now measure the distance between the perilymph and the incus because we don't add any extra on with the cost technique. We put the vein over the hole and the prosthesis just touches the vein because we believe that causes less vertigo. If the prosthesis is too long, the vein pushes down like an umbrella that's partly closed and you can get a perilymph leak. What prosthesis do we use? Well, this is pretty much what John Shea was using, but it hasn't changed. I favor Teflon because you can trim it to an exact length, whereas titanium, you've got to take the right length and you're going to have 0.25 of a millimeter, which for us is too much. And this is the Robinson bucket handle, which is also available in titanium. And this, you know, at the end of my career was my favorite prosthesis, but you use this one when you have a short incus. So when the lenticular process is over the middle of the oval fossa, whereas you use this one when the lenticular process, the long process is a little bit longer because you want to go just distal. And you use a cutting block to cut it to length. We've not, not got long to go, you'll be pleased to hear. Here's the vein graph going in. I've got a suck blow sucker which sucks and blows, uh, which works for, well, works nine times out of 10. There we are. Just a word with that, when we first started doing internet surgery, Robert came to Wales and uh, we were using my suck blow sucker and the surgery was live going out on the internet. And there were a lot of my inverted commas friends there. And Robert said, the sucker isn't working, do something. So I got down in between his legs underneath the operating table and blew down this pipe and then realized they were filming me. And it looks for all the world that something obscene was going on. So never operate with your friends unless there's a 15 second delay. This is the bucket handle going in. It's easier to place in my hands. Robert, Robert doesn't have a problem. He just says, oh, I'll put another one in just to show you. But in goes the bucket handle. Just resting on the vein. This is difficult. It's a bit like patting your tummy and rubbing your head. Lift up on the incus. And I'm not sure the handle makes any difference, but it, it makes you feel a bit better if you can just slip it over the top. I think there's probably less necrosis, but I can't prove it. Wilco might be able to tell us. Do you think there's a, a difference? 
this is the um i don't know what yes yeah it will fall in it'll fall in and the same applies with an acyclophasty this is rotating and if you're going to use this prosthesis you need to make sure that it's faced up towards the attic because if you try and rotate it the other way it'll catch on the denticular process there we are that's nicely in place nobody minds about the rotation what you don't want is is in and out movement and then crimping if you haven't exposed those markers that i said to begin with you will not be able to do the crimp which is at the end of the operation you think thank god for that it's all worked i want a crimp and you can't get the crimper in there robert will show you a lovely technique with two needles do not try it until you've practiced 50 times it's extremely difficult to do he'll make it look very easy and our other contribution um spreading the vein and the bending sign if you prod it and it bends it must be in the hole if you prod it and it flips out it's not so this is the right length we've measured it it's in the hole the vein graft has been spread the bucket handles over don't fiddle around end of procedure and we might be able to see a round window reflex you did just do this once there you are just there and that's just to convince the medical students okay so here's my final figures 0.7 percent i'm not quite as good as robert i've had vertigo in 0.6 dead ears due to surgery five most of them in the first 10 years one patient who used a q-tip and destroyed his ear another one we think used a q-tip and we're not sure about the third one um seventh nerve weakness i had three one of which lasted for over a year and then made a 100 percent improvement and i had a suicidal tinnitus which i presented 25 years ago at the royal society of medicine and i said i have had a patient who had a perfect hearing result not db across the board and she said she'd got uncontrollable tinnitus and she committed suicide it subsequently turned out that there were big problems in the family with another member of the family who got a drug problem and there were financial issues and this was what we call the straw that broke the camel's back but i admitted it and then everybody in the audience there was an audience of about 500 people who said they'd never had a problem with a patient with severe tinnitus the hands gradually started going up saying well yes i actually had one who sat in the car and put the yeah 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 has anybody had a suicide with tinnitus yeah no I, well i've had tinnitus but the, but you can feel suicidal right no doesn't, doesn't sound like it so work with your colleagues in other specialties as well all right don't hold back i'm pretty good all right then so have some have some sympathy for the patient I will, this is our new foreign minister Disagree. We should be looking for the good in our opponents, not always be looking for the faults. There's good in everyone, you know, Lord. except the French. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after I've finished, this is where all the fish comes from. This is my back garden in Ireland, and just over to the right are where all the mussels and the prawns and everything else come from. And if you go directly out from here which Wilco has you end up in uh, Newfoundland and if you go just behind this hill it's the Skellig Islands that were in Star Wars and that's where Christianity was kept alive in the 7th 8th and 9th century and all the hunter-gatherers lived on the shore here um, for 5,000 years 
and we go whale watching and dolphin watching. Thank you very much. So I don't know whether the block is ready. Is, are they ready in the block? We probably ought to try and put up the cases, oughtn't we? Um, let me see. But they're not in the they're not in the files, are they? Right. Hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? Good morning. So we finished the presentation. They've all been a very subservient no, audience and very polite. So we're going to argue that just a Dutchman is causing problems. Um, would you like to explain? Uh, would you like to explain the theatre setup? Uh, good morning, well, Celine. Can you can you tell me if you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. First, first announcement: You are all invited to uh, John House. John Holt's house in Ireland. You noticed that? That was a clear invitation to go there. Am I right, John? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Good, good, yeah. great. We'll sleep in the garden. <laughs> so this is just, maybe we can start with the position of the, of the patient. Uh, so you can see the patient is just lying down like this. And I'm uh, perpendicular to, to, the, to the patient. Because, uh, you know, I'm going to do a transcanal approach, and I like to have this kind of position. The other thing is the setup that I'm using, which I think is important to spend some time with, to explain. Uh, the first point is the speculum holder. So there is a plate, I may show you at the end. There is a plate which is placed uh, underneath the head of a patient. And one part of the speculum holder goes into the plate, and this is the second part. So... This is nice because you can adapt the position. And of course, as you can see, you will be able to fix the speculum with the speculum molded. There are other types of uh, speculum molded, just like a snake. But this one is nice. I mean, it's just a very easy way to do it. I'm, I'm going to show you this. All right. So the second point is the suction system, which I think, John, you'll be able to, you will be able to uh, show more than me. Uh, with a negative pressure, if I remember uh, what is it which means that when you press the pedal, as you will see, I don't use uh, my hand for the suction. It works only when I press the pedal. And when I, once I release the pedal, it stops sucking. So that's a very accurate uh, system. Uh, and I'm using it just like a, um, a real instrument. Uh, maybe, John, you can show the, the case, right? You have the slides. Robert, John uh, had to go out for a small detour, uh, ah, so he'll okay, so obviously. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. Do Already. <laughs> Robert, do you, so agree, gonna... do you agree if Sorry? there are any questions that they will be um, directed directly to you, or do you want to accumulate the questions till the end? No, 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 they can ask questions at any time. And any question is allowed, eh? Mr. Oates. Uh, he's coming back, yes. Yes, I can see that. Can you show the case, John? I can try. We had a little, a little bit of a problem. I'll try. <laughs> anyway, that's a right uh, uh, revision stages operation. I can explain the case just before John is going to find the case. Uh, so I was operating this patient uh, on the right ear and left ear many years ago. And um, um, I had really good results both sides. That was, I think, something like 10 years. And after several years, uh, there is a progressive recurrence of the airborne gap on the right side, which means that, uh, if, if I know, according to my experience, the long-term failures are more related to things like uh, eroded incus. So I choose this case um, because, you know, French surgeons don't make any mistake. We don't have any complication. We don't have any failures, 100% of success. But finally, I was able to find one for you. So uh, I'm going to show you this. Uh, so I selected this case because I think we're going to find eroded incus, which is going to move to uh, malleus to state autonomy procedure. The second case will be a primary surgery. John, do you have the audiogram? Yeah, that's fine. All right. Is it, is it the first case? Yes. So you see, if you look to the audiogram, we have an airborne gap, which is mainly on the high pitch uh, frequencies. And also, again, this is more related to uh, incus necrosis, which I think we're going to find it. So we'll see. I hope it's going to be like this. 
All right, first step for me is to take the vein graph. So I take the vein from the dorsal face of the hand. And it's also always debatable uh, whether or not we use a vein graph or any interposition, but if we are planning something. And of course, you can use vein graph, you can use pericondrum, you can use fascia. But the difference between the vein graph as a tissue, pericondrum or fascia, is that the vein is really elastic. So it allows you to stretch the vein correctly, perfectly. And it stays very uh, thin uh, with time because when we do revision, we can do, uh, probably see that the vein is, is there. So you, you could see you have to find a vein there, and I'm going to take it. Okay, Robert, I'm just going to ask the audience a question. So does anybody use a vein graft? One, two, three. Okay, hopefully we'll convert you over the next couple of days. Yeah. So one very small incision, and I'm going to try to find this uh, vein, which I don't find yet. Okay. Now, the problem is that I have the light that I have to put it there, because I don't see it. Okay. 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 This is the vein. Okay. So I'm going to um, select this one, and we need to. As you will see, pre-shape the vein. I think it was interesting to show you this, and not only the uh, middle ear procedure. Uh, so what I will do, I will remove as much as I can the perivenous connective tissue from the lateral side of the vein. And as you know, the principle is to use the, the intima of the vein to face the surgeon. I mean, the lateral side will face the foot plate because it's sticky. Whereas the other side, the intima, the medial side of the vein will, will uh, face the surgeon. So you see it's only a very small incision and two stitches. Resolvable, of course. And also I would have to trim the vein to make it smaller because it's quite big. But I always like to take a larger one because just in case you make a tear, uh, it's always better to have a residual vein to uh, to use it to close the tear than to make uh, the tympanic membrane or sometimes the skin, depending on the presentation of the skin. It could happen. All right, see any dots? I'm going to close the skin. Robert, yes. Have you ever had that you tear the vein when manipulating? Because I'm always surprised how much you pull on the vein when you repair it. Uh, I didn't get the beginning. Sorry about that. Uh, have, you, have you ever ruptured the vein while harvesting it? When you pull it, I mean, you pr you you prepare your vein, but you quite uh, do it brusquely, and uh, you. You, uh, I mean, you get a lot of vein out of it because you pull on it, etc. Yeah. Have you yeah. ever damaged the vein or? The yes, of course it will happen because of, of the thinness of the of the vein. But it's when you damage the vein, it's only a very limited uh, tear that you make. So then I'm going to use the tear to cut the vein horizontally when I open it, you know, through the instrument. Clear. Okay. Can you? Uh, okay. All right, so now I'm going to pre-shape the vein. So we can go to the microscope. Just let me know. Maybe this is, uh, let me see what kind of uh, vision you have. Too much light. Maybe, yeah, too much light. Let me see. Uh, too much light. Okay. I will decrease. Is that better now? Yes. Better. Very good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is the vein. So I need to put this instrument through the vein because we want to hold the vein uh, to be able to remove this uh, perivenous connective tissue. So I will put it like this. And um, so this is still the lateral side of the vein. I'm going to increase the light, I think.
like this. You can, I, I, I take this peri connective tissue and I use the knife to remove it while I'm pulling it. That's it. So, so this is what we need. And you see, we have a nice vein graft now. So still facing the lateral side. And now I'm going to cut the vein transversely. So we'll go, if I make a tear, for example, here, then I will turn the vein and I will use the tear to open the, the vein graft like this. Being part of the incision, yeah. Yes, exactly. So we have a glass plate, and this glass plate has a hole in the middle. I'm going to use this to pre-shake the vein, because one of the difficult things with this technique is to be able to um, move the vein within the middle ear cleft and sticking to everything sometimes. So it's quite of a tricky technique, I know, at the beginning. So this technique of uh, using this hole to pre-shape the vein is quite good. So all I need is a, a very small part of the vein in order to cover the other window, that's it. And now I will push the vein down into the hole so the part run will stay wet while the external part will dry. And if you have some residual vein like this, it's always better to keep it somewhere on saline solution just in case you have a tear. And now I will start the procedure of the uh, middle ear uh, approach, I mean uh, the uh, transcanal approach. Um, so I use a speculum and I'm going now to perform the infiltration of the skin using a mixture of dilocaine adrenaline. So this is the right ear, you remember, this is 12 o'clock. 3 o'clock, 6 and 9 o'clock. So I'm going to make it one infiltration at 12 o'clock and the other one at, at 6 o'clock. There we go. And now I will introduce the speculum in order to find the right one, which allows me to have a uh, clear exposure of the, of the tympanic membrane, uh, at least the posterior half of the tympanic membrane. And you see at the moment I'm not exposing perfectly the tympanic membrane, so I will move the head down. I will show you uh, later after surgery the position of the head of a patient. That's important to be able to move the head separately from the body of the patient so you can uh, put the head on hyperextension. So Robert, we've been discussing uh, speculum size. Can you ask Celine what size this speculum is? Yes, I'll let you know in a second. So this is 3.5, so I will increase uh, every 0 0.5. So this is 4, 4.5, it's pretty narrow, 5. I think that's the best I can do. Even 5 is quite uh, quite big. I think it's too big. Let me see. I think, no, no, no. Uh, that's a bony canal down. Okay, I'm going to use the 4.5. The 5 is too big. Because if you, if you use the bigger one, then we have a long flap and it's not good. Peut-être on déclive encore, s'il vous plaît. So it's going to be a very narrow canal, 4.5. Stop. It is smaller. Let's go with, yes, a but it's good to show. 4.5 is not very big. Not no. a lot of light. Yeah. No, 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 that's it. Good but selection. that's interesting to show difficult case more than uh, easy one. So, Robert, another question, because that's what I noticed. You use, how much do you inject when you do the anesthetics? Uh, I never know exactly. Uh, but you use two syringes. Two syringes, yes. So he injects quite a bit into the ear. Yes, bit. yeah, because it helps to get a, a cleavage plane. Yeah. So that's, I think there's no risk to... to uh, inject a lot of solution there. Do it very slowly, it otherwise you get a blister. <laughs> yes, and That's it decreases the, also the bleeding, yeah? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, supposed to. I hope it's going to be <laughs> the case. All right, so now this is the exposure I like to have. That is it. I will some, put some better than at the beginning like this. Then saline solution. So this is exactly what I like to have at the beginning. Yeah? You can see the tympanic membrane. Can if you please? Uh, so you see the Mali sandal here. So this is 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 and 9. So the plan here will be to perform a skin incision range from 6 to 12. And I'm going to elevate the posterior half of the tympanometal flap. So I'll, I use this instrument. You see it looks big because of the narrow canal we have. And if you, you have to notice the distal tip of this knife, 
This is a round knife, but the distal tip is bent, and that's an important point because then you can go into different angles, the anchor angle and the stupor angle. So what I will do, I will make the skin incision first with this, and then I will use a smooth elevator to elevate the flap. Now I don't really see the uh, stupor angle, but I can move the microscope, and when we do that under microscope, it is important to move a lot, uh, the microscope. Okay, so now you see this uh, smooth elevator, and uh, on my left hand I use my a sucker. Uh, at the moment is a 1.2 millimeter diameter sucker, and I don't want to suck like this directly to the, onto the skin because you can make a tear. So it's always important to place the sucker just behind the elevator. I'm going to move so you can see a little bit more the exposure. Now we are close to the uh, to the Can you, you hear me? It's John. Yes. Can you explain how high up you take this flap and why? Well, it's always difficult to know. Uh, the point is that if it's too close to the lanolus, it's not going to be fine because once you do the bony memory section, then you you have problems. So uh, you don't have then enough. Then if it's too long, then if it's too long, then you have a really thick flap, and it's not good at all. So it's, I don't know exactly, it's just a feeling to have long enough like this, you know. The, the answer, answer is, is not, not too close <laughs> to the annulus, and if we still had Benoit Gratacap, he would say it is the right length. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, nearly done, but not completely on the left. So I just want to, you know, I'm following horizontal line. That's important, because if you do a, a straight uh, elevation, then you can have in the middle, for example, you can make a tear. Can we? So what we have here is, you can see the mucosa of the middle ear, and you can see the annulus here. So I know that I can elevate now the uh, the flap at this level. There's no increased erosion, unfortunately. So let's see what we have. Center. Yeah. Okay, I need to elevate the, the inferior part of the flap. And you see the uh, annulus there, and then now the elevation of the flap. Okay, and now what you can see is this previous prosthesis. So we need to understand why we have this residual elbow and gap. This is strange because I don't see any problem yet, but sometimes you find it by. Uh, um, Checking everything, can we see? So first, I'm going to dissect the incus like this. Oh, you see, that's the first point. The, the piston was not completely attached, or I, because it was completely trimmed, but it was not very stable. The Malish incus mobile. So I would change the prosthesis because it seems to me that it's not connected perfectly, it was not tight enough to the, to the uh, incus for the hook. Robert, can you indicate the facial nerve in the round window for a moment? Yes, I'll show you this. So what we have is the facial nerve cannulae. The facial nerve is on the left, right here. This is the facial nerve, and it's not um, exposed. And well, on the right, you can see the Robert, round we've got a question from Miguel. I'll let him put the question to you. Yeah. What do you think is the reason of uh, of the gap? Uh, I just, don't know. Uh, don't know yet. I don't know yet. I was okay. surprised because, in fact, you could see that I was able to remove this prosthesis too easily, which means that it was not completely connected to the incus. I think the strange. posterior crosses. Some of the posterior yeah, crosses still there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes you have to cut it, but it's you, it, it, it's not a problem if you re, if you leave some part of the. So what we have to check is the distal tip of the incus, but it's still good. There's no problem with the incus. So I will preserve the incus, of course. You see, it's mobile. So uh, I don't know. Really, I don't know what is the cause of that. So now I will uh, dissect the other window, removing the previous vein graft, and trying to find the uh, previous uh, fenestra. Um, 
I always reopen the, the, the penestra because I believe if you put the piston like this, it's not going to be very stable. And you see the previous vein, which is still there. So we're going to use the laser now. The laser, s'il vous plaît. That's it. Patient. I'm going to measure now the it, distance, but was, I will. Was this one of your cases or somebody else's? Yes, yes. Yeah. Your... So you didn't listen to my presentation, eh, John? Pending will go off. Would you have anything? So the previous procedure was four millimeter, which is a bit short. And I think, Miguel, I think this is the cause of failure, I think. Because you see now I'm measuring and I'm at 4.5. But it's strange that uh, it was related to a uh, long-term failure. Very strange. Robert, can you so explain? maybe because of a vein. Can you explain the measuring device to us? Yes, this is the measuring device. I have uh, three notches. You know, the lower one is means 3.5, the mid one is 4, and the, fir the first one, the upper one, is 4.5. So you need to touch for primary case, the full plate like this, and then see which one of these uh, three notches is becoming in contact with the inkers. I would use the mid surface of the inkers, and you can see it's 4.5. And I cut the previous one at 4, so I made some mistake in determining the length, I think. But usually when it's a short procedure, uh, as a cause of failure, it creates uh, immediate or short-term failure. So it's very strange. I don't know. So we're going to use the laser now, which is the uh, Luminis uh, handheld probe. It's a CO2 laser, which is really good because it's very safe, as we know. But in the past, in terms of uh, perinephalic fluid, because it's completely absorbed by perinephalic, but the problem is that in the past we could not have any handed piece for the CO2 laser. But now they made it with a fiber. We, we could not deliver the CO2 on a fiber, but now it's fine. Right. Uh, Robert, this is not a hollow fiber uh, laser. Pardon? Is this a hollow fiber or is, or is this a just hollow a, fiber. a hollow it's fiber? It's a hollow fiber, yeah. yeah. I think. I think it's a new technology. So it's pretty good. I designed also the distal tip of this uh, hand piece because you can. You can bend it according to the situation. Right? So the setting here is 3 watt. And set, s'il vous plaît. I'm going to use the 0 0.7, 0 0.7 millimeter uh, sucker. I'm sorry, I try not to hide the, the field, but it's so narrow that it's not easy. So you see here, got a pretty good view. The, We've got a good view. Membrane. Right? There you go. Also to notice. Okay. I was used to use a foot pedal to, to fire the laser. Here, the nurse fires uh, the laser. So there's even less uh, movements. But the uh, nurse fires, and he doesn't move his leg at all. Yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh. Okay, let's see. Now I'm going to use the uh, macro drill. 0 0.7 millimeter diameter burr with uh, also stop, or you can use, of course, the uh, heater. So this, although it's not bone, it's good to do it with a uh, with a macro drill like this. And you see now you can see the perinephalic fluid coming up. So I think now we have the new finish time. There we go. You can see it, I hope. Yeah, okay. we can see it. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to measure now again. Mesureur. I'm going to put it at the distal tip, and it's definitely 4.5. Okay? Yeah, 4.5 will be fine. All right. So I'm going to put the vein now. So I could not see my quarter timpani, so maybe I cut it during the previous operation because I couldn't see it in the field. I don't remember. Cut it or overstretched it. It's always difficult to know. So I, I take it with the sucker like this, and I stick the vein to the sucker, and now I will introduce the vein with my left hand and stretch the vein with my right hand. This is With this technique, I think you really need to have both hands free 
in order to hold the vein. Uh, it's it's a really important step to be sure that I will uh, cover completely the other window. So you know, I'm, you know, I'm holding the vein like this. Now it's fine, and now we are facing the intima of the vein, and of course the I know that the fenestra is there. Okay, so now I need to cut the prosthesis. I'm using this cutting block, and I'm using the cost piston, the basic cost piston, which is made in Teflon, 0.4 millimeter, because I'm using a vein graph, creating 0.8 stapedotomy, so plus the vein, so we need to use 0.4, not 0.6. So I put it on the 4.5 millimeter hole. This is a flat cutting block, which means uh, that's an important point, because I, I know that sometimes we discuss that with Chris. They are cutting block with a groove here. So if it means that the loop will go into the groove inside, so you need to put it uh, to, to uh, reduce a little bit the length. In this case, it's 4.5 because the, the, there's no groove, it's flat. Okay, so I'm going to hold the uh, loop on one side and cut the shaft on the other side. And now we need to break the memory of the loop. I will grab it with uh, the needle like this, holding holding the shaft. So you need to hold the shaft like this. And then you open up the loop like this, you break the memory. You know, the Teflon has a memory, so we really need to break it. Otherwise, we cannot place it around into it. Okay, so now I'm going to place the piston. First step is to place the, the shaft. So I'm using now 0.9 millimeter sucker to introduce the to introduce the, the prosthesis. Okay, let's see. Now I will introduce the shaft first. There we go. And now the loop goes around the incus. And all I need to do now is to print the loop. I will do it two hooks. One is used to hold the posterior half to control the penetration of the shaft, and the other one to close the loop. And this trick, rather than using a, a cutting uh, uh, um, an irregular forcep, is good because in this case we have a really narrow gap between the malus and the incus. You can see. So you can control what you're doing, and then you can close it around the incus. And now it's pretty stable, I think. So I'm going to look for the bending side. Can we? So the piston should bend, but not move. I think John showed you this. If it's too short, then the piston goes away. But I did it during the previous operation, so it's very strange. Definitely the cause of failure was a short prosthesis. Now it's clear. If I move the incus, the malleus, I mean, everything goes well. All right, so I think it's done. And uh, I will now reposition the... So you see, there is no... Usually, uh, when you do revision, you can see the quarter tympani right in the middle, but you don't see the quarter tympani, which means that I probably either cut it or overstretched it during the previous operation. So, uh, but the patient did not complain, so pretty good, in fact. It's very strange, and with this quarter tympani. Sometimes you preserve the quarter perfectly, and the patient complains, and sometimes you cut it or overstretch it, and it does not complain anything. So, I mean, it's very difficult to know. Perhaps you could tell yeah. us about the packing material, the antibiotics, yes. and the post operative management. Uh, there's no uh, antibiotic, only antibiotics, only steroids for the first day. And here I'm going to put this nerve cell, which we will remove on the fifth day. And then all patients have a short-term post-op audiometric test at day six may need to rule out any uh, possible complications such as, of course, bone conduction. Uh, that's important. And uh, they will leave, and the prescription when they leave is only a eardrop for about one week. Because in the past, I didn't do eardrop. And I have some cases, some patients coming back for external otitis. So I decided to put this uh, as a routine. And there's no more otitis there. Flox, ofloxacin or? Yes, ofloxacin. Okay. And then I also ask them not to fly or use the TGV train for one month. Uh, after one month, all is okay. But there's diving is 
supposed to be forbidden, and I always try to push them not to dive. I'm talking about uh, deep dives um, later. But if they really want to do it, because I had to operate from professional people who had to go back to work, and they, I asked them not to do it before one year. And by chance, at the moment, I don't have any complication for stuff like this, even when they dive. So maybe the technique of a van graph probably protects, but I still, uh, to be sure, I just tell them not to do it anymore if they can. Okay? okay at least a month without flying. Um, have you ever had a patient who's had a problem flying? We have what? Most of us would say a month flying, and I have colleagues who say three months without any flying. But have you ever had a patient in your career who's had a problem in an aircraft? No, never. But I believe if they do it too early, uh, they can have some blood in the session tube, and do, this could create some problems. So I think this is the best way to wait a little bit, and then I think it's fine. Maybe I can show you, because uh, Thibaut is going to start, but just before... I show you. Vous pouvez mettre la caméra de son. I show you the the, the the setup down there, which is a. You see, it's a very. Uh, I would say basic one. Hold, hold on, uh, we don't have an image yet. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, and usually, uh, when I do surgery abroad uh, in other countries, I always take my instruments with me, and also I take this system because it makes a huge difference. Ça doit être bon normalement, là. Hold on, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, waiting. We lost the screen. It's on uh, channel five. Channel five. It's coming. I think. Uh, yes, we're with you, uh, John. Uh, Robert. Uh, there we go. Okay, okay, Vinny. So this is what we have. We have. Uh, you see the the plate. This is the plate. So this plate goes like this. Okay, within one, one other plate. Uh, this is very nice because then I can put my speculum like this and stick it to according to the position that you want to have. And then, of course, the, 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 the last part, as, as I show you. Uh, you could also see down there the foot pedal. Uh, on the left is the suction. When I push, it sucks. And when I stop, it stops sucking. And this is the osteostat. So I have both on my... Uh, right and left legs, and uh, this is the setup, okay? And the position of the head. So this is, you can see that the head is separate from the body, so this head can be um, put it more on hyperextension if needed. Okay? Very clear. So I Very think clear. Uh, you can go with Thibaut now, although you have any questions or I don't know. Any questions? There are questions. Robert, there are questions. Two questions, Robert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, um, Professor. My name is Misha. I'm from London. I'm a trainee. Um, just wanted to clarify the uh, dose and duration of steroids post op. Yes, I use Solimedrol uh, for 120 milligram today and tomorrow morning, and that's it. Is that intravenously? Yeah, sorry, intravenously, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Does your anesthetist no give uh, no antibiotic anymore? Does your anesthetist give on danzatron or granisatron, essentially acting anti nauseant or not? No. Il faut qu'il revienne là. Il faut qu'il revienne avec la caméra. Uh, question about the vein graft. Do you always take it from the same hand or do you use the non-dominant hand or how do you decide which side you take it from? Yes, I use the right one because on the left there is the uh, anesthetic. So, uh, but you can use both sides, of course. This is not a political decision, I would say. <laughs> and then for the prosthesis, there's a small and a large hook. How do you decide which one you're going to use? Of, of what? Of what? For the prosthesis, there's a small oh, and a large hook. No, which there's always... 0.4 millimeter diameter. Sack. No, he means the loop, Robert. He means a large loop and a small loop. It's always the big yeah, loop. I, I, I use the large loop all the time. Because if you use the regular one, I think that the loop is too small and it doesn't fit sometimes. In this case, for example, it's very strange because the interest was pretty thick, uh, although the uh, loop was not completely attached to it, last, because you, you notice how it was easy to remove it. Uh, so if you use a regular one, the, the loop is too thin, so it's 
more difficult to close. Anybody else? Okay, we'll go. One more. Okay, one more. we'll go to Thibault now. Well, last Sorry. question. Uh, Dr. Yes. Risk, are you always using uh, all point four uh, for prosthesis? Never all point six. Never. No. No. You know, if you use all point six, it means that you uh, you need to create uh, all point more than all point eight, or you need not to interpose anything. But you remember, I do 0.8 millimeter safe dotomy, and I put a vein graft. So you have to think about the thickness of a vein, which is thin, but all around it makes something a little bit thicker. So then 0.4 will be fine. If you do not interpose anything, then I guess you have to use 0.6. Okay? Okay, thanks. But I also use 0.4 for total prosthesis when I do malice to safety dotomy. The, I use a, a, a top with a hydroslap side head and a Teflon shaft, 0.4. Okay? One, All one, right. more, one, one more question. question. Uh, would you operate a patient that has less than 10 dB, or would you, in primary cases, or would you wait until they have more than 10 yeah. dB? Yeah. You know, the, the, the correct answer is at least 25 to 30 dB airborne gap before doing any surgery. But sometimes it's a case by case discussion. I would say this is the answer, but sometimes, um, sometimes um, you need to make a decision in specific case where you follow a patient for a long time and it's stable within 20 dB, so then you have to make a decision. But usually 25, 30. Okay? So I think Thibault is waiting. You can go. All right? Thanks very much, Robert. Quite interesting. I mean, uh, in the UK, all otosclerotics get offered a hearing aid because it's free. But I notice that patients who send me questions from North America say, we can have insurance cover for stapes surgery but nobody will pay for a hearing aid for us. So that's skewing clinical treatment because maybe 70% of patients manage for 10 years, 15 years on a simple NHS hearing aid oh, behind the ear, unobtrusive, can't see it, and is ideal with an open fit for the type of conductive loss you get with otosclerosis. Thibaut, hi, John here. How are you? We don't have any sound from block five. Hello, Thibault. Thibault. Hello, Thibault. Okay. Hello. We can hear you, but not very loud. Thibault? Are we? Thibault, we cannot hear you. Thibault? Oui, là j'ai le micro, mais je, je pense qu'on n'est pas à l'image. Ah oui, oui, oui. Thibault. Ah oui, d'accord. Ah, Allô Allô, Thibault, bonjour. Do you hear me? I have no, I have no uh, feedback for the sound. Oui, oui can hear you. Pour nous donner le retour son, Michel, ici, s'il te plaît. We can see retour the... son, Michel. Allô, do you Hello? hear me? Yes, Thibault, can you hear us Thibaut. Do you hear me? Hello. Yes. Hello. Bonjour. Uh, bonjour. So I explain you the case. Yes, please. Uh, it will, it will be uh, in the implantation of a bone anchored hearing aid, a ponto implant. The case is a young man of uh, who is 23 years old, 
it was operated on three times on each, each year for cholesteatoma. And he has a bilateral mixed hearing loss, uh, 45 decibel mixed hearing loss on both sides. On the city on the left here, for montrer l'image de gauche, you can see there is a complete soft tissue opacity of the mastoid of the middle ear, <coughs> l'image de droite, and uh, for the middle ear, no aeration of the middle ear despite the presence of a T tube. You can see the T tube, it is in place, but there is really no air into the middle ear. And so, uh, in that situation, uh, the best way to in improve his hearing is a bone encode hearing aid, which will uh, correct the conductive hearing loss on both ears. And then, after he was operated on before in another center, uh, we will able to re revise the tympanoplasty on, on the right and left ear. But the priority is to give him hearing. And so this is why we uh, will implant uh, a Ponto bone encode hearing aid. OK, on vient là. So the, the patient lies in the classic otological. Alors, vous êtes sur. Est-ce que vous pouvez voilà, adapter pour ne pas être surexposé? Ou je. C'est plus facile comme ça pour vous? C'est bon avant? Bon, alors. Classic autological position. And the first step is to put the. Uh, implant in the right position. The position is 45 degrees posterior and superior to the auditory meatus. Alors, il faut dézoomer, il faut montrer le cube blanc là. Dézoomer, baisser un peu, voilà. Zoomer un peu plus là. Voilà. OK. So, the implant, I will put the implant there. The first step I will use a technique with just a punch skin resection with a 5 mm diameter punch without soft tissue reduction. And uh, I will use the mono technique, which is a technique with a one shot drilling. The first step is to measure the thickness of the soft tissue at the site of the implant. Up, up with the needle, and then it will allow to determine the length of the abutment. The rule is that the length of the abutment has to be three millimeter longer than the thickness of the soft tissue. In that case, I have a six millimeter thickness soft tissue, so, so I will use a nine millimeter abutment. With the monotechnique, which is a technique with a single drilling, this is uh, suitable only for four millimeter implants. That means this technique is good for adults, not for uh, children, where you may use a three millimeter implant. In the previous technique, the principle was to perform a little hole three millimeter deep. Then, if there was still bone in the depths to deepen to four millimeter with the second drilling, and then with the third drilling to widen the, the, the hole. With the mono technique, there is one drilling to 4.75 millimeter depths and at the side of the implant. So, now once I have measured the thickness, I can make infiltration in order to decrease hearing, uh, bleeding. Okay. And now I will make the skin resection with the punch.
I remove the skin and all the soft tissues down to the periosteum. And after that, I will perform hemostasis with a monopolar cautery. So. Okay. Question from a, so. a difficult Spanish surgeon from Madrid in the audience. He said, why do you pick the right side when the audiogram is virtually identical? Because the right ear is a little bit worse than the left ear. So both are quite identical, but uh, the right ear is a little bit worse. So. Uh. so, and now I will make the incision of the periosteum, this to read. Oui. And I will deflect the periosteum on a surface larger than the diameter of the implant. So I can feel the bone and I can also see it. I don't know if it will be possible at the camera, at the video. Est-ce que vous pouvez regarder dans le trou avec la caméra ou pas? Là, vous n'êtes pas assez vertical. I try to show you that it is not a blind surgery. I see clearly the bone in the depth there. And once I have deflected the periosteum, I will use a cannula to protect the soft tissue during drilling. This is a particular technique the ancillary provided by Oticon, you have this cannula, and all the drilling will be performed through this cannula, which protects the soft tissue. Now I put the cannula in place, and I ensure that there is no periosteum in the depth under the cannula. And once I am in the right position. I hold the cannula with the left hand and I will perform the drilling. Okay, montrez-moi la fraise. This is a mono drill. It is uh faut dézoomer un peu s'il vous plaît. Voilà. Encore et mettre au point parce que ça pas l'air au point. It is a elliptic drill. It cuts, it's very sharp, and it will cut directly to 4.27, uh, 75 millimeters at the side of the implant. So the drilling is performed at uh, 2,000 rotation per minute under irrigation. We irrigate before, allez-y, during and after drilling. Allez-y. Okay, that's done. You can see the bone dust on the burr. And then I will check that everything is okay. So I can check through the cannula that the drilling is completed. And now the nurse will prepare the implant. I will change the speed of rotation to insert the implant at 15 rotation per minute, very slow rotation in order to avoid to hit the bone, and with a torque of 70 newton per centimeter. So once uh, I will prepare the implant, so I take the implant up and I can show you, this is a BHX implant by Ponto, Oticon Ponto. This implant is suitable for uh, Ponto and Baha bone encodering aids. And so, uh, because uh, I, it allows to show the best of the earring processor by OP, or Oticon, I use this implant rather than the Baja implant 
that are suitable only for Baja sound processors. Now I remove the cannula and I will check that everything is okay, the retractor, the decoller. Oui, un instant. So I check the margins of the hole. I can see that everything is okay. I can check that in the depth there is still bone. So the hole is well for the implant. It's good. I just put a little bit better down and I will insert the implant. Voila. Up. I start without irrigation and once implant is engaged, allez-y. I count the turns, one, two, three, four, and I am at four, 75 turns, four and three quarter, and I will complete by hand for one quarter turn, and that's okay. The implant is in place in right position. Then I will insert of the implant this silicon capsule in order to avoid that with the post-op edema, the skin goes over the implant. This capsule compress will be let for one week and remove after and we wait four weeks for OCO integration and after four weeks the sound processor will be fixed on the uh, fitted on the implant. So you have seen it's a very simple short surgery with respect of the soft tissues around the implant. It's really a very convenient technique for adults. So do you have questions? Nice T Bill. I'll just see the audience have put any hands up. Does anybody want to ask any questions of T Bill? He's done a lot of these. Okay, T Bill, we have a question from the audience. Wait one minute. David Connard from the Netherlands. Did you consider, um, given the fact that it's a very young patient, to, to uh, offer him a, an active uh, bone implant? Bone conducting device, sorry. Uh, what sort of uh, alternatives do you ask? Uh, a bone bridge, for example? A bone bridge, yes. Uh, it should be also a very good solution. Uh, the difficulty in France uh, at this stage is that the bone bridge is not reimbursed by the National Health Insurance, and the cost for the patient is uh, 8,900 euros. On the other hand, uh, the Ponto and Ba bone and cord earring aids are fully reimbursed by the National Health Insurance. But if the bone bridge were reimbursed, then it would be a, a very good alternative. Right, any other questions? More questions from the UK. Thank you, uh, Thibault. Is there a difference in terms of the extrusion rates and the post-operative skin complications with the mono technique versus MIPS or a standard periosteal flap? Uh, the, my answer is that with uh, uh, previous punch technique, uh, without any special ancillary, I practiced that since 2012. Or with the MIPS technique, the rate of extrusion is around 2% in my adult patients. For the mono technique, it's too recent, I cannot uh, answer to you. Uh, I use it since few months. Uh, at this stage, uh, there is no failure of OCO integration or later uh, extrusion, traumatic or non-traumatic extrusion, but it's too recent. I cannot answer for the monotechnic. Okay, thank you very much, Thibaut. Very nice. We'll see you later on. Okay, see you later for the cholesteatoma surgery.
rendront impeccables. You might question the sanity of these two guys who decided to pull off an illegal urban wingsuit. You might question the sanity of these two guys who decided to pull off an illegal urban wingsuit stunt in Rio de Janeiro. As you can see, the men were Red Bull wingsuit daredevils. They actually successfully threaded the needle between two skyscrapers in Rio. One of the daredevils attempted to fly by one of Brazil's famous monuments. Fortunately for him, that was his final trip.
5, ah oui, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, 2. Donc, tu as le son. Alors, après, tu as, as bien le son. Donc, j'ai trouvé une, un branchement. Quand tu vas venir avec la caméra, on va faire l'essai, mais ça devrait marcher. Euh, j'ai le temps.
Bon, je parle dans le micro. Est-ce que tu as, est-ce que, est-ce que tu m'entends 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4. Bon, c'était simple. J'ai trouvé le, le branchement qu'il fallait, donc. Euh...
I mean, well, finance, finance John, is to to totally unimportant. Okay, John. Okay. Good uh, morning. I would like to start, if this works. Um, as John sa always says, I'm now going to rip apart his presentation, and I really would try to to try to do so anyway. Um, being, uh, I, I came from an academic background, and I think our approach was po possibly slightly different. Uh, how do you value expert opinion? And uh, in academia, because I know, of course, who's who's from uh, academics? Uh, we we are all now currently all taught that there is a level of evidence. Don't, don't no level of evidence. Well, I'll talk about it now. And uh, you need to realize that all the stories, especially when John is talking, uh, you have expert opinion and a, and layman's opinion. And it's somewhere, no, it's always expert opinion. I mean, you, you need to rank uh, what everybody says as personal experience, which may not apply to you. Uh, we've, we've had some time in the past to look at what factors may determine a surgical outcome in stapedotomy. Uh, to tell you honestly, we truly do not know, but we do know surgeons that report very, very high numbers and uh, very high quality. I definitely do think experience is uh, a factor. Um, as you know, we're all uh, a big group of friends for many years, and as you can tell, these photos were was uh, were made when we were in Brazil, and um, yeah, you know, we we were a bit younger then. I remember that. And of course, John was uh, there, and uh, unfortunately, our colleague is no longer here. And of course, they were always very distracted when we were at conferences. And it makes you wonder why. Well, I can tell you, because I was present. It was always something like this when John was distracted, and uh, he would never admit that to his wife. But anyway, uh, I'm, uh, this is a short outline of the, the presentation. I'll tell you a little bit uh, to get you back on the level of evidence, a, a, a small story, which is actually true, and then some details on surgical procedure and po possible factors that may influence your outcomes during surgery. Am I talking too fast, Mariano? Can I go faster? She's not responding. Okay, good. Okay, so a, sh a, sh a slight deviation to explain you about evidence-based medicine and the pitfalls that we all make. Because um, with all the stories that you hear, of course, I mean, it's expert opinion, but it's 
is the myth, is the truth, when we talk about diameter of the prosthesis, is there any value to that? And that's a, a very interesting discussion. But you need to uh, realize that many of the studies that are, are uh, I mean, expert opinions are not based on uh, studies. But many of the uh, items that we discussed, there is a huge risk of bias, which means that if you do research, there are many factors that may influence your results, even though you're not aware of them. They're co confounders. And John, w w John, pay attention, because this is new for you. Uh, so just to give you an example, like th this is a good video. You might question the sanity of these two guys who decided to pull off an illegal urban wingsuit stunt in Rio de Janeiro. As you can see, the men were Red Bull wingsuit daredevils. They actually successfully threaded the needle between two skyscrapers in Rio. One of the daredevils attempted to fly by one of Brazil's famous monuments. Fortunately for him, that was his final stunt. So not all things are true. Uh, this this is a true true story actually. It's not in medicine, but uh, we are happy if we do research if we have a hundred cases in our sample and to publish about it. This was uh, about about a sample that they did in 1936. Actually, quite important it was about the American elections, and they had a sample size of more than two million. So that's huge. I mean, there's uh, there's hardly any study. I don't know of any study in medicine that had a sample size this big. So they did a sample size in America to predict the election outcome of 1936. And what they did, of course, I mean, how do you collect your data? They ch chose the phone book data and car registration plates to ask the patients what their voting uh, would be. Uh, what president are, they, uh, are you going to be voting for? And that's very interesting. I mean, that's how we do research, I think. And uh, apparently, all the results show that Langdon was going to win, Alf Langdon. And of course, the fact that you know, don't know his name has to do with the fact that he didn't win. And why was that? Huh? He, had he had was supposed to get 55% of all the votes. And it's a huge sample size. In medicine, we don't have a sample size of 2 million. If we do staple surgery, Robert, he has uh, 5,000, 6,000 patients, but that's the biggest series probably in the world. Etc. Uh, many searches, uh, studies, I've done studies on cochlear implants. I'd be happy if I had uh, 120, 2 million. So uh, it's clear he had an, uh, an, a Democrat against him and he, uh, he was supposed to win. But then it turned out to be different. And uh, this guy, we, we all know, uh, Franklin uh, Roosevelt, he won. And how can that be? Because they did a huge sample, huge population. How can it still go wrong? Why? Because of course the, uh, there was bias, and this is called selection bias. Because this was the period of um, uh, 1936. You see the happy family with the dog outside of the window in a car enjoying life. But the truth in that period was, of course, that people were standing in line for food. And if you do a study according to car license plates, you don't get get these people that were standing in line. And that was, of course, a major selection bias. Why? Uh, why do I? recall this study because I think it's amazing to see how things can go wrong in most of the things that we read and I'll discuss some of the pub pub uh, publications right now there's a huge selection bias and we read something oh that seems sir uh, this the piston diam uh, diameter of six millimeters is better than a four it's very interesting to see what's the actual value of the study and um, has anybody ever seen this before um, so th this is uh, the, the ranking of quality of research. All uh, b below the green area, and jo John is the dark green area when he talks, that's expert opinion, which means the value, of, I mean, it's his opinion, and it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody. The higher you get, the higher you go, you, you increase the level of evidence, uh, the number becomes smaller, and when you're level one, you have a systematic review, you reviewed all the good studies, and you graded the, the literature, and you, you're, you're able to make solid predictions, okay? Something to remember, because all we talk about today are personal experiences. That doesn't mean that they have no value, that's not what I'm saying, but it does mean that we cannot prove it's applicable, okay? So uh, if, you, if you look at the surgical procedure, what, what factors determine uh, the, the, our outcome? You need to realize that there are so many variations. Uh, do you do the surgery on the local, do you general anesthesia? Is it transcanal or endoral? That by itself, you need to multiply by two. Uh, I mean, two times two, you already have four variations. And then, of course, do you use a curette for the rim, a bony rim resection or a drill? 
Uh, who, does anybody use a drill, a skeeter, to get the bony rim resection, to get the exposure of the stapes? I, I myself like to, not anymore, I like to use the, the, the um, uh, how do you call that, the chisel, yeah? uh, and et cetera, et cetera. How do you make the perforation in the oval window? Do you use a, a skeeter, do you use a laser or micro instruments? And the good question is, Robert is still sitting here, is he using laser or is he using micro drill? Which is, what, what, what is it? Eh? It's a hybrid version of it. So you need to realize all the publications that you read, there's a huge variety of surgical procedure. And of course, we like to look for factors that we can apply to all our surgery. If you just at look at the variety of prosthesis, you see on the, the most uh, left side, you see the Arwinger piston. It has been modified by now. Of course, the 19 all the automatic crimping, the K piston, and of course, the Buchanan and the Teflon piston. Many different prosthesis are around there. And do they all give the same results? That's a good question. So. I will discuss just only a couple of facts, because, I mean, you can talk about this endlessly. But we looked at a certain period at crimping and non-crimping prosthesis, so the prosthesis that crimp themselves or don't need crimping, and the prosthesis that you need, uh, need crimping. Of course, there had been a discussion, Robert uses two hooks to crimp it. But the crimping part of it is considered by many a very difficult phase in the surgery. And of course, I'll talk a little bit about the diameter, because of course there was a bit of a discussion, should it be six or, uh, or four? And I agree with Robert with the vein graft, actually, when you use four with the vein graft, actually you probably use maybe 0.5 millimeter, maybe 0.6, who, no, who knows? But it's not just 0.4. I won't discuss the other uh, topics because of time restraints. I, I did a study on, on, uh, on this, uh, uh, on different, uh, issues of crimping. On the left side, you see a typical metal prosthesis, or it can be Teflon as well, that you need to actively crimp or reset the memory that you broke before you put the prosthesis on. On the right side, you see a prosthesis that I've used in, uh, for, uh, for a long time. That's an, an A. Wangen, uh, Daniel Wangen from uh, Switzerland, designed a prosthesis that you clip on firmly onto the uh, incus. The question is, does it make any difference? Is there any difference in it all? And to tell you honestly, uh, to, to explain to you, there's non-crimping. Robert had the procedures uh, that Robert is, is a crimping procedure, the Teflon loop. And this is the, uh, the K piston as well. And the non-crimping procedures, the, uh, the, the nitinol, when you activate it by a laser or a diathermal correlation, it'll close the prosthesis by itself. Um, th this is no another example, and you see that uh, it all works fine with the, with the prosthesis if uh, they clip uh, on this. We did a study of a, a series of patients, and actually we did find a difference. We found that the, the prosthesis, the non-crimping prosthesis, had better airborne gap closure. And as you can see, I'm not sure if I can highlight it here, uh, is there a pointer of any sorts? As you can see, um, non-significant, but these two are significant. And it, that's when you look at the average airborne gap closure. So we found that the average airborne gap closure was better for the non-crimping prosthesis that you clip on tightly than the crimping prosthesis. All these surgeries were done in that, ca uh, in that period still without a vein graft, to tell you. And so it's interesting to know that the 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 clip clipping uh, had the clipping procedures had lesser results than the non -crimp, uh, crimping uh, that that were very tight. The disadvantage, however, was that a serious number of the patients that had the non crimping complained about distorted sounds. Don't wake up, please. Thanks. Uh, the uh, the patients that had a better hearing, their hearing airborne gap closure was better, but they had distorted sounds. And I remember that Robert and I talked about this ten years ago, and we did a quick study with his patient. None of his patients had a, a distorted sound at certain points. And the hypothesis, although we cannot believe it, so it's level four of uh, um, uh, evidence or level five, I should say, you can see that the non-crimping prosthesis at times attaches too firmly. And what you could see that what would happen typically if the sound would get much louder, that the non-crimping, this one, the prosthesis would be so tight that it would angle in the foot plate. That's the hypothesis, because it was a scratching sound that people complained about. So we were able to get a better airborne gap closure with the non-crimping, but a serious number did have some ne negative effects. If you want to read about it, it's on the 
uh, the, the publication about this uh, research was uh, done uh, uh, is published there. And of course, you need to see uh, the, the scratching sound is very probable that it came from the procedure that was too firmly fixed to the incus and causes uh, scratching on the foot plate. Uh, there's no space to move. The same thing about the prosthesis diameter. This has been an, uh, been an old discussion. Should you be 0 0.6? Even some some advocate to use 0 0.8 millimeter. And here, and um, all my life, I've been using 0.4. But it's very interesting. If you want to do a systematic review of the literature uh, around, you, uh, there's there are def definite procedures that you need to use to check the literature. Uh, you typically look at uh, 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 certain keywords, and then you need to uh, you look for many articles. Uh, we did that, and we found in total uh, like 2,600 articles. But then, of course, you look for duplicates, and eventually you screen the abstracts to see if there are any relevant uh, publications about this. Very important to this procedure is that you cannot do it alone. Preferably, you do it with two, and you have one additional referee if there's disagreement on the articles. So this is a procedure that you do. Both both researchers work independently and screen the literature according to a, a given uh, procedure. Okay. So and what you need to uh, it's now well established that if you want to review literature on the value of the publication by itself, of course you need to look at the relevance, uh, re relevance, but maybe more importantly on the risk of bias. Uh, you need to see was the study randomized, which is very important, of course. <coughs> was was the, the the researcher or the patient or the uh, the, the one that measured the eff uh, efficacy of the treatment was he blinded to the procedure? That's very important. Otherwise, somehow you do manipulate your data, and of course standardization in the design and outcome was very important. And then is if there's a complete uh, data collection. Very important to look at now is that you, uh, the general health, this accumulates to a an assessment of the general risk. Uh, if the general risk of bias is low, uh, it's indicated medium is an M, and uh, very bad is, of course, uh, undesirable. When we looked at the literature published on prosthesis di uh, diameter, uh, you see here the, the, the guys that published about it. Uh, I even published about it, and then in the end, you, you see none of the publications are actually very high value publications. They're all with a medium risk of bias. And the same thing with other publications. And here you see even uh, the publications don't even report how they did the study. It's just a summary of words. It's just actually expert opinion, which means it may apply apply to them, but it does not apply to the whole population. And even Ugo Fisch, yeah, but it's of course in 82, evidence-based medicine didn't exist in that period. But you see the publications that uh, the, the god of uh, surgery, ear surgery, also published, uh, did, did publications that are of relative value at most. So if you look at the literature, there's no proof whatsoever that the prosthesis diameter has any positive or negative effect. That's the conclusion of all the research we did on all the literature, starting from the 2600 articles, minus duplications, etc. However, in some research that we did in the lab, we did find a positive effect of a slightly bigger diameter. But that's purely in the laboratory, in a model. We did that together with uh, Manu Harbans in uh, Canada, in a, um, in a model. It, uh, in a model, it seems to make a difference. In clinical practice, there's no publication that supports the discussion of any di uh, diameter. And of course, maybe one of the most important factors is the surgical surgeon's uh, experience. And I think one we need to realize you need to find a good teacher. If there's sound, and there is no sound. If there's no sound, we're not going to do it. Well, no sound. <laughs> I can't blame the, them. Let's see. Did I do anything wrong? I don't know. Leave it. It's a good video. Anyway, so of course, uh, finding a good teacher uh, helps uh, a lot. Um, we also did quite a bit of research on laser types. And uh, we did some clinical studies, but uh, we did also a lot of laboratory research on lasers and the, uh, had the different advantages of lasers. And this is a nice video. This was during a lion broadcast. Let me first go up. Uh, you need to re realize there are two types of lasers. You can apply a laser with via the microscope, 
which you would use in focal cord surgery, etc. But also some surgeons use it for ear surgery. And you have a microfiber delivered laser. And I think we all, and it's also expert opinion, there's no scientific proof, but we, we all promote fiber delivered stapedotomy, uh, laser, laser delivered. Because micro manipulator via the microscope has inherent risks. This is surgery performed with the lion. Uh, we were all part of the lion broadcast and we do a lot of surgery. This was one of our colleagues that did uh, laser surgery, stapedotomy, and uh, this occurred. And this is the major risk, I think, of a uh, microscope guided surgery. Have a look at the incus. You see the incus, you see the stapes. He's now going to make a one shot perforation of the foot plate. And then, uh, as you can see, it's not only the foot plate. And, and this is, I think, a major risk of a micro manipulator because the movement of the microscope itself is uh, uh, too big to be precise. Uh, I'm not sure if M Miguel agrees. Uh, do you use micros uh, microscopes or not? No. Okay, so we all really advocate, if you want to do a, a laser-driven uh, st uh, surgery, the fiber-delivered uh, fiber uh, laser is the best. Uh, we looked at various um, lasers um, and laser characteristics. And these are the four lasers that we tested. That was the KTP laser, which has been used for many, many years, but now is becoming a little bit of out, uh, outdated. Then, of course, the CO2 laser is a very practical laser, a very economic. Uh, I, I think if you buy a CO2, even the fiber is maybe 50 euros. If you compare it to a 300 euros uh, fiber for CO2, there's a huge difference. So the, this, uh, the, the uh, sorry, I'm talking about the diode laser. CO2 is, is very nice, but very difficult to deliver. Eh? It's actually not a fiber that they use, but they use a hollow fiber, which is like, like a mirror system to, to deliver the CO2 to the foot plate. And there's a thulium laser. You probably have not heard of it, but it's a very popular laser in urology in many cases because it combines a little bit the advantage of CO2 and KTP. Uh, and what you need to realize, of course, we shoot at the oval window at the foot plate, but you need to know well what's the absorption of the uh, of the laser in the liquid because you wouldn't want to shoot right through the liquid into the endothelium of the uh, of the uh, of the cochlea. And even though like we used the KTP a lot, and I still like it because the fiber is very flexible, it's very uh, affordable, it, is, it has, does have an inherent risk that it has very low absorption in water. So uh, it's, it has uh, fallen a little bit of, uh, out of grace because its absorption is not very good. Diode is not so very good either, but the, of course the major advantage of diode is that it's very economic. My experience is you frequently need to touch with the diode to be uh, effective, but uh, maybe someone else has uh, other experiences. Thulium should be the good mix, and the CO2 has the highest water absorption. Uh, CO2 doesn't go through. If you shoot through the foot plate, it, does, it gets absorbed fully in the endolymph and not in the tissue. This is a small example of what we did. We did lots of uh, research on this, and I'm not sure if it runs. Let's see. What you need to look at is you see, uh, we fired the laser, you see all the heat accumulated under the foot plate, which is advantageous. Of course, you get heating of the, of the liquid, but you, the major advantage is that you don't shoot into the endothelium, which is good. Um, and we also looked at sound development. And uh, obviously, uh, the this, this skeeter is uh, highlighted here. I think, I, I think it indicates it. Let's see. And in theory, sorry about this, back. In theory, is, uh, obviously, a skeeter makes a little bit more noise and maybe potentially be a cause of tinnitus after surgery, potentially. And all the other lasers, like the CO2, has the least uh, sound production. The Arc, uh, the Ebbing uh, Yak laser makes a lot of noise, which doesn't seem to be very well. So we looked at um, uh, explosion sounds, and as you can see, indicated by the three stars, those are uh, significant differences between the, the different lasers concerning the sound production just of blowing a hole in the um, foot plate. And the microburr, obviously, the most, uh, the, the is the most, uh, the loudest. So if you look at the literature, because we, we ha and I explained to you how we screen the literature uh, with two persons, uh, evaluate all the literature, etc. We looked at the postoperative outcome and specifically at the hearing results of uh, postoperative outcome. 
Uh, this is how we do it. We look at uh, what are we looking for, stable surgery for oat sclerosis. Uh, in the uh, uh, determinant is the laser. And we looked at all the current uh, bibliographs where you can find the publications. In total, we found 1,050 publications. After removal of all the duplicates, we ended up with 383 articles. And then, of course, you start screening. It's a lot of work. You start screening the abstracts to see are, are these articles about what we want to have, uh, what we're looking for. And at the end, if you do a critical assessment and we assess the, the studies, as I explained to you on the risk of bias, et cetera, et cetera, eventually you end up with uh, eight at most. Okay? So that's strange. Yeah? There's a lot of publications. And if you truly look at the value or the quality of the research, it's very low. So there's a lot of work still to be done for us. And on these in these studies, we didn't find any consistent outcomes on uh, ammo gap, et cetera. Uh, when you look at uh, the, the, the effect of uh, the lasers. And of course, a major discussion has always been that laser is so much safer because you mobilize less the foot blade and less risk of, uh, of uh, sensual neuro hearing loss. Uh, but that's not, uh, not the case, actually. We didn't find that. We did find that the laser pr protects against unwanted um, mobilization of the foot blade. The same thing on hearing loss. We, we screened the literature on specifically on can we find any differences in, in hearing loss if you use laser or if you do, uh, between the lasers. And the truth is, there are two studies that show the difference, of which Robert and I published one, and an Italian group uh, published about it. And we did find that the hearing results, the airborne gap closure, was better with CO2. The question is, why? <laughs> we don't know. But th that's what we found. Um, uh, in general, I think we can conclude that all lasers uh, have a slight advantage over a micro burr because there's no physical contact, so less risk of mobilization. So if you, if you have a very small airbone gap, it's something you should consider if you have it. Uh, important to realize that different lasers have different characteristics. And in our study, which we did not publish, we found that the thulium laser, which is between the, uh, the CO2 and the other lasers, gave a higher number of dead airs. And we found that uh, its absorption is between CO2, which is very direct, and the other laser is that it, it, it causes uh, bubbles in the, in, the, uh, in the air. And we assume that the bubbles eventually cause the trauma. Although, uh, it, that's all my animal studies, we didn't find it in clinicals, of course, because you cannot detect that in the clinical setting. So, uh, lasers seem to have an advantage, but it's not... Uh, uh, the, the realize that the level of evidence is, on all the studies, still very low. And that's a, a major issue. John. Lost your step. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion because you see Robert, he carbonizes the foot plate. Well, we've seen, seen the res, uh, revision, so we, he has a, a vein graft there. But normally, Robert, uh, or we here, we carbonize the foot plate and then we scoop that out, say, with the, with a micro drill. Um, is this a micro drill surgery or is it both? I don't know. It's a difficult discussion. Uh, it's probably both, and the results are very good. In uh, Amsterdam, where I worked, I used solely laser, and I made a, a small hole with a needle. I never used a micro drill because, in a, in the academic center, frequently the micro drill is not nicely aligned, and it's it's like enlarging the hole that you don't want it to be to be too big. Any questions, John? Then you need to think of the questions. Uh, really blowing away charcoal um, if you've used your laser correctly assuming you're not doing one shot it all it's doing is blowing away the debris and giving you a nice hole um, it doesn't always work sometimes if you have a thick foot plate you might be there for 10 or 15 minutes doing a little bit of burning let everything cool down a bit of flushing with water do it again and again and again we were talking during the break 
I think the most important thing with any of this surgery is if you get into difficulty, you stop for a couple of minutes and you just let your pulse calm down and everything else calm down. Phone a friend if you need to. And if you're in real difficulty, close it. Nobody will ever criticize you for closing an ear, but they will criticize you for giving a dead ear. Potentially. Adam, where are you, where are you from? And uh, uh, My name is Adam Holm from the Netherlands. Yeah. I, th I think the most difficult part is removal of the superstructure. Because uh, making a staplotomy opening is not that very difficult if your foot plate is fixed. Sometimes when I remove and I fracture, yeah. mostly the, 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 the anterior cross with a needle, sometimes the foot plate gets mobile again. Yeah. And then I have a difficulty. And then I use a laser. Well, this is always solvable. That makes it much more difficult. So how do you remove the superstructure? Uh, we'll, we'll see it now with uh, Robert, I suppose, uh, with the laser and then the drill. It's a two-step two uh, procedure. In the past, I used to use a, a small hook and yeah, would it put would it put it, put it inside the crura and break it uh, while supporting it with a shaft, like uh, supporting it. But uh, what you say, I've had that happen before, that you get an unwanted mobilization. And then, the, of course, the question is, do you want to continue? Uh, if you have a laser, I suppose you can. Even if in a patient with a large a bone gap, you think, well, that that's foot plate is fixed. No. Uh, it's sometimes it's so only fixed anteriorly. Yeah. And then you, 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 you try to fracture the crust, and uh, yeah. the whole foot plate gets yeah. mobile again. If we truly mobilize it here, uh, we put a perforation on top of the foot plate, and we close if we don't do, we don't do the perforation. I, I've had a foot plate in the past as well, and that's uh, quite uh, nerving. Now I probably would remove it and put a vein graft in, but in those days uh, I would leave it, not go further. Any other questions, Miguel? Yeah, no. Sometimes it's not a matter of one or the other. Sometimes we are combining them because yes. I, I think uh, Robert also uses this, uh, uh, especially when we are using dioid, the, yes. the laser that we have because we don't have the CO2. Uh, we, we like to debilitate and also to make some hemostasis there in, over the foot plate yeah. and then use the burr yeah. to make the hole. Um, and, and sometimes when you start seeing some purulent coming out, then you stop and then you use the drill yeah. instead of the laser. The so diode is dangerous if you continue making the hole, huh? once, once you, uh, because it goes absolutely through the liquids and uh, the, the diode will shoot through. Yeah. Well, this is true to a certain degree of the KTP as well, isn't it? Uh, compared, KTP, compared with the CO2? No, no, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. KTP uh, goes yeah. absolutely through water. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, we loved, we've used for many years the KTP. Yeah, but yeah, it was yeah, great, yeah. But you, you do have to risk that you shoot, shoot through yeah. and then uh, you risk uh, yeah. damaging the ear. Yeah. Okay. Okay, another question there. John? John? <laughs> okay. I, I like to make my fenestration similar to what you described. But my question is, in your practices and in your experience, is there any role for perforators? And if so, when do you use them? Like the, the the hand drill, etc. Yeah. Uh, since I work here, no. <laughs> In Holland, yes. <laughs> I, I've never used a perforator, so I. You, you know, when you do, we were talking about doing your first stapedotomy, and I'm sure most of you remember doing it. it, it it's a terrifying experience because you've had this build-up from people like us saying how you've got to get it right and all the rest of it. It's probably the most frightening operation you do in otology. Whereas wow. what happened to me was my boss was doing a stay piece and said, come have a sit down, there you are, make the hole. So I didn't have a whole night beforehand to build up the adrenaline and everything else. And the first one went well. And that was the only one where I did an end oral incision. And it was the only one where I used a micro drill without a laser. After that, every other one was done this way. Well, the, the question is, um, I think if you, have, you, if you don't have anything else, uh, you can absolutely use small instruments yeah. to make a hole. Yeah. It's been done like that for many years. Yeah. My impression, level five evidence, is that sometimes the fragments that you, you lose, because you sometimes uh, you see the fragments go down <laughs> to the ear, may not be that advantageous to the ear. So I do think uh, skeeters nowadays are not very expensive. Uh, I mean, the osteostap is very nice. I have one privately. I, I have one I do surgery elsewhere. I use it, uh, I take it with me. It's it's very affordable, relatively, uh, I would say. So I think osteostap would be the first investment to do it, make. And if you can, I would buy a diode because the diode is very ex affordable too. All the others are very expensive. Uh, might I be the... 
your name and where you're uh, from? Uh, I'm uh, Andro Kosic from uh, Zagreb, Croatia. And I want to be the devil's advocate oh, good. Here, just a little bit. Uh, we're just, just going uh, ex- uh, to publish a study on 400 uh, uh, surgeries, uh, stapedotomies that we've only done with the perforator. And we've always done it at our hospital in, in the last 60 years doing the reverse fish technique. So first do the, oh, yeah. first do the fenestration, then, then, then the put in the procedure, yeah. and then remove the super sh- superstructure in the end. Yeah. So I've, we've never had, uh, I, I was trained that way, and I enjoy the perforator very much because it gives you a tactile, uh, uh, it gives you a feeling on the foot plate, and you can feel you going through the foot plate. So, uh, whereas in non-contact techniques, you don't have that feeling, and you might go through or, or might uh, enlarge this, uh, the, the the hole. And we do a tight gap, a tight hole, a uh, small fenestra. Don't use any sort of a graft or closure, just two two bits of gel foam, just to uh, uh, get, yeah. get a little bit of blood yeah. clotting on there. And uh, the results yeah. are, are pretty much the same. So, I would... Uh, I would, n- you know, uh, high tech is fine, but perforators and just a gentle hand will also do the trick well, as well. But th- this is a prime. We're talking primary surgery, yeah. Because yeah. I Primar- think the discussion on the revision is, uh, revision is different. different. Revision is different. Um, yeah, primary surgery. Uh, I've done that for 16 or 17 years, as, uh, like that as well, and uh, my results are were pretty good, but they're not comparable to the results here. What I said at the beginning, the results in stapy surgery have changed by a fraction in 67 years it's not like other surgery it's only tiny amounts we're arguing about minutiae here a good surgeon with a perforator is better than a bad surgeon with a drill and a laser so this is all level five evidence and 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 i think we should go to level life evidence okay robert can you hear us because you're working on the hand i I can see that he's getting getting the vein graph we're we're heading off to you okay hi Hi, robert Robert. can you hear us we're now checking your work can't can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Just. Okay, great. So Lou- it needs to be louder. I, I was just uh, I was just preparing the vein. Can you turn so, the so volume up a little primary, bit? Uh, maybe, John, you have the case. So you can present oh, the yeah, case John. with the, uh, with the yeah. airborne gap. It's case number two uh, with a large airborne gap. John, oh, yes, here well, I have it. I put the laptop away. Yeah. You, you know, John. Wake up and stand up. Hold on, hold on. We're working on it. Come on, John. Come on, John. So I'm going to make a, a short presentation of the case. Then you go to see uh, Thibault. I just took the vein, but I will wait for the preparation of the vein. Bonjour, Céline. <laughs> yes, I'm working with Céline right in front of me. That makes a difference, yeah? Yeah. It's, a lo- it's an old couple now. Uh, <laughs> we're just trying to connect, Robert. It'll be two seconds, hopefully. Yeah. We met that table on the wall. Yeah, John Oates, don't remember this is case number two. Two, two. All right, so you can see the description of the case. So it's a typical, uh, I mean, right side hearing loss with a pure conductive hearing loss. Uh, it's a kind of mixed hearing loss. You'll see the audiometric test. Uh, Right now, table on the So it's a unilateral case. The other side is completely normal, but everything's fine. So as we discussed, we started with at least 30 dB, but he airborne gap, but here it's more than 30 dB, so everything's fine. And I, you notice that I use the training four all the time. That's important to prove that we have an airborne gap. So I think we could move to Thibault. He will explain the case, and then I wait for you for the vein graph, for the vein preparation, okay? Okay, sounds fine. Là, par, là, par contre, Michel, il faudra monter le son parce que je ne les entends pas. Hein. Okay. 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 Quel âge, ce gaillard Leaving room 6 to room 4, actually. Uh, room four. It's a bit like the hunt for Red October, yeah, isn't yeah. it? It's <laughs> oh, Vladimir. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Thibault. Hello, Thibault. Can you hear us? 
Timo. Well, he can't. He, I, I don't think he had a headset on. Okay, John. What do you see? What do you see? Well, there's an airborne gap of about 20, 25. Do you hear me? Wait, yeah, yeah. we can. We can, Thibault, can you hear us? Retour. We can hear you, Thibaut. Okay, and and so uh, the case, <laughs> I will show you during this course three cases of cholesterol that illustrate three very different three different situations and are very characteristic. The first case this morning it will be a tympanoplasty in canal wall down technique with mastoid obliteration with bone su substitute. And tomorrow we will see a tympanoplasty in canal wall down technique without obliteration and a canal in tympanoplasty in canal wall up technique with mastoid obliteration. So the case this morning is a 31 years old male he was operated on one time for cholesteatoma on the right ear in 2004. And he has a mild hearing loss yet that you can oh, see okay. and intermittent otorrhea at the clinical examination. He has a large erosion of the auditory canal with a recurrence of cholesteatoma into the mastoid and a scarred tympanic membrane and you can see on the CT there is a large erosion of the auditory canal and a erosion of the lateral semicircular canal quite large cliche de droite but also on the coronal view erosion of the fallopian canal and erosion of the superior semicircular canal so the plan is to remove the cholesteatoma uh, to close the inner ear uh, to preserve it as possible and to perform mastoid obliteration with a glass bone substitute called glass bone and to perform uh, a tympanoplasty with osiculoplasty so uh, you will uh, go back to Robert yes, and I will start the there, approach. Yes, there are uh, some questions. Hold on, yes? Thibault. Just a question, Thibault, because the, the shape, uh, this is a cone beam. I think it's, it's really very accurate. And the shape of the of the lateral canal and even the superior, uh, it's a little bit widened, it, it looks like. So aren't you afraid that the cholestetoma might be inside the inner ear? Are you considering that? And what would you do in that case? Uh, 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 I'm not afraid that uh, the cholesterol goes into the middle ear. In my experience, it's extremely rare. And uh, if it do not go uh, into the inner ear, then I, I protect, uh, I, will, I will remove the matrix of the cholesterol from uh, the canal and close the canal with cart uh, fascia and cartilage before the obliteration. If the cholesterol goes deep into the middle, uh, the inner ear, then I remove the cholesterol and probably obliterate uh, the labyrinth. But uh, I'm not afraid that uh, it will be the case. Tibo, what's the labyrinthine function like? Please, what? What is the labyrinthine function like? Uh, uh, he has no uh, clinically no uh, dizziness or vertigo. I didn't perform uh, video nystagmography in, in his case. Fistula test negative. The mm. fistula test when you press on the ear. Does it uh, do anything? Negative. There is no no clinical sign of fistula. No complaint of uh, okay uh, vertigo when uh, blowing nose or for instance. Good. We'll let you get started and we'll go and see what. Napoleon's doing. Here we go to Robert. Okay, so Robert's preparing the vein graph. Voilà, it's all Looks nice. It's pink. Okay, why. are you with me? Are you yes. with me now? We're with yes. you, yes. It's a very nice vein okay. graft. Okay, so I was just waiting for you to... Yeah, yeah, French good one. Yeah. You know, the French, the French vein graphs are really good usually, yeah? Yeah, it looks like very nice. So again, I'm preparing the vein. I've already removed the uh, perivenous connective tissue, and I will now... Um, Put the vein over the hole as 
a preview show and then I will cut the vein like this. I don't use the large one as I explained to you. Now this is really a nice uh, way to appreciate the vein as I said. Uh, this was made by Jean Bernard. Huh? Jean Bernard found this idea which I think is really nice. Very simple to do. And if I have a, a thick, thick uh, vein, if I think it's too thick, then I put it on the press and make it thinner. Okay, so we're gonna. So I was starting to make the uh, to show you the infiltration. Too short of a uh, mixture of uh, adrenaline and xylocaine. Okay, I'm gonna do it now, and then it will move the the head down. So uh, one at twelve, one shot like this. And do you put the needle on the bone? Yes, you have to, to be in contact with the bone. You go down there like this, then you can you can feel the bone, okay? And then you can do it. It helps a lot to, to find the clivet plane and to decrease the bleeding. It happens sometimes that we can create uh, temporarily a facial uh, weakness uh, due to the infiltration, and you can see that Immediately post open and then it discovers. It, it disappears within uh, less than one hour. And Robert, sometimes you, you inject a bulla, huh? that you get a bulla of the, the eardrum. Yes. Do you get yeah. that too? Yeah, we can have that sometimes. But uh, it's not a problem because it goes in a stop, in a superficial part of the tympanic membrane. So it's, it's not a problem. Even if you open the, the bubble, it's, there's no perforation of the drum. Okay. Very, uh, very funny to see that. It, it goes under the skin, the external part of the external layer of the uh, drum. The most uh, lateral layer. Yeah. yeah. So again, what I want to have is a, a good exposure of at least the posterior half of the tympanic membrane. <coughs> so I'm trying to find, you see now it's a more, uh, it's a nice, uh, expo expo exposition, exposure here, and I've got a nice uh, diameter now, I think. Can you, can you meter, sir? It's a six millimeter. Uh, it's not that large, but uh, it's much better than before, the previous case. So now we'll fix the speculum with the speculum holder. And you see the anterior wall is bulging. This is why I cannot make a uh, bigger. Okay, so now I will start with the round knife as before. I will increase the magnification, so maybe it's more interesting for you to see that. And as usual, I use the better thing to uh, start with uh, cleaning the ear. And now I use the round knife. So again, as I explained to you, the distal tip is bent, so I'm gonna start with the superior angle. Right at the end of the distal tip of the of the speculum, and it goes from, let's say, five o'clock here up to one o'clock, a little bit, than, a little bit more than twelve. And then I will uh, again elevate the flap, and you see I'm starting very progressively to stay uh, on the same line. And you can, you just have to expose the bone or underneath. And this, this is not a knife. Huh? This is a, a, a flat. A smooth elevator. I just want to control the bleeding also at the same time, so I use the sucker. But you see again the position of the sucker. I don't try, don't, trying to avoid uh, sucking directly to the skin. So I'm going to keep going on until I reach the the analyst. Chris has just arrived, so uh, he's a bit like team. Meghan and Harry, you know, he's pops ah, yeah. up everywhere. So then the British team Bonjour. is fine now. Bonjour, Chris. Ça va? Yeah, it's over there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, now it's fine. So you see this, the same this, line. This is a revision case, is it, Robert? Oh, it's no, no, primary it's a primary case. I was just wondering, it's a little bit more bloody than maybe normal. Yes, it's right. Yeah. Martin, on me dit que ça saigne. 
And he can me. I told that to my to my nieces, eh? Uh, she doesn't like. <laughs> All right, she's doing a good job. So you see the analysis. I'm going to focus on the analysis. So we need to see the landmark before opening the middle ear. So you see, let me show you. So you see the skin here. This is the analysis, the white line here. So I know the mucosa will be underneath. So I will go into the gap here. You see the quarter tympani coming. Decora. I need to uh, to elevate a little bit more. You see now the energy is coming very nicely. Can me? The bleeding is from here. But I cannot stop it. The, the laser we use is a CO2 laser. As, as you know, uh, CO2 is not very good for coagulation. Decola. I need to elevate a little bit more to my right. A little bit more. And I think it's going to be fine. I want to have a clear exposure without any problem due to the uh, to the can to the uh, to the flap. There we go. I think it's fine now. Alors, peut-être en déclive encore un peu, s'il vous plaît. Stop. 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 Plaron. Okay. So what we can see now, I'm going to do, we have plenty of time, so I will do a step-by-step -step description and take my time to go into detail. Can so we have a, a nice view of the distal tip of the incus right here, and a little bit of a stapler's head, and you could see also here the uh, corda tympani right here. So the corda tympani runs to the bone here, a good point is to try to expose this cord tympani a little bit more in order to preserve it. And I will try to do it uh, with a strong knife, uh, a strong hook. I have a special hook for that, which goes into the canal of the corda. All you need is, all we need is to remove, no, no, remove a little bit of bone, which is covering the uh, cord tympani. This will help me to elevate a little bit more the corda. Don't suck, of course, directly. It's not so easy in this case because I don't have access really to the to the canal of the corda. Let's see how it goes now. I will do it later, maybe. It goes right here. Crochet, s'il vous plaît. I would love to demonstrate that to you. So it's a nice instrument. No encore le so you need to stay uh, away of the of the quarter tympani. I don't think I can do it now because it's very deep. Okay, so now I will start with the uh, curette to do the bony rim resection. I prefer to use the curette rather than uh, chisels. Sometimes I use chisels if I have a really thick bone. But in this case, I think it should be fine. So I will use this curet, which is a really efficient one. And you do it just like ice cream, so just uh, cutting the bone. And the point is to expose the facial nerve on the left and the uh, pyramidal process of the stapes tendon on the right. There we go. So you see I'm doing it step by step again. Making the bone thinner and thinner. I don't want to, of course, overexpose the incus. So I do it from the incus to the right. And I will remove this bone. This will help me. Okay, let me see. The, the bone is pretty thick here, can we? So you see again the corda it goes into the bone right here. Crochet, crochet pour le crochet fort. But I don't. Robert, try to, uh, yeah. How many staples do you do per year? Do you have any idea? I don't know. Um, I have done close to seven thousand cages primary so it's 
you know, the COVID has decreased a little bit the number, of course, because people didn't want to be operated and we had to stop it. So the last year was different, but it's something around, I don't know, between around 400 per year, four to 500. If we include the revision. Okay, let's now try with the chisel writing. If I use the chisel, I like to decrease also the thickness of this part. Otherwise, with the chisel, if it's too thick, then you have the risk of making a, a big uh, fracture of the bone here. Uh, I don't really like it. Okay, so I'm going to try now with the chisel. This is what I'm trying to do. That good. And in this case, your nurse uses the hammer, right? Huh? Yes. That is it. Yeah, we, we. Okay. Yes, she's, uh, we are working together since many, many years. So, so it's just, uh, uh, she knows everything. I mean, it's just, I don't even have to ask. It's just, uh, and even when we, I was introducing new techniques. She told me she knew too much. It was just a case of giving the right amount of money to find out. Yeah. But e when, even when I was introducing new techniques like malleus relocation or new prosthesis, like uh, even the malleus replacement prosthesis, I just had to show her once and then she understands everything. This is just uh, perfect. I, I, I'm sure she would be able to operate. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. She's very skilled. So you'd see my exposure is not good enough. I don't want to increase the size of my bony rim resection. Stop. So I move the head down. Montez la tête, s'il vous plaît. And now you see it's going to be better. Stop. Plus right encore, s'il vous plaît. So it's pretty good. I, I just want to remove a little bit of more bone on my left. Not very much. And I'm happy now with that. Can you, s'il vous plaît? Okay, that's fine. So unfortunately, it's a little bit bloody. So perhaps point out the landmarks for the audience. Yeah, yeah, of course I will. Give me one minute to remove this bone here. And this what we have. So we have now the incus, of course, the quarter tympani, the tapis tendon, the, the, the posterior crus. So we have the two landmarks, the fascia nerve on my left, which is exposed, there's no bone and the pyramidal process of the stapes tendon, which is here. These are the two landmarks I like to have. Okay, first step now is to uh, do the incudiostapes joint separation. So I will move a little bit the uh, microscope. We need to find the uh, location of a joint and John show me that, which is a good point. You just try to, because you can't see it. So you don't exactly if it's here, here or here. And if you elevate a little bit in case you can see the movement here. So then you go into, and I like to use the circle to stabilize the increase while I'm doing this, okay? And you just stay, you go inside and you move to the left and you move to the right. And now it's fine. And then I can check. I will check now malus increased mobility. And you see malus increased fine. And uh, now I'm gonna check the stapes from top of the head. It is completely fixed. So we can continue. I will use the laser. The laser, s'il vous plaît. I could use the laser to cut the tendon, but it's not completely ready. So again, as I said, I'm using the Luminis uh, laser, which is a CO2 laser. Uh, in the past, I was using a lot of different types of laser, uh, oh, but all of them, there was a common point, all of them were used with a handed piece, which for me is a major, major point. I never use micro manipulator. And this means that with, with uh, fiber, you can touch the target, so it's absolutely accurate. This is important when you have a decent fashion nerve, narrow elbow, uh, you can have things like that. Um, but in the past, CO2 was not possible with uh, fiber, except with OmniGuide, which was the first system, which was a holo, a holo fiber. And I think well, it's not the same with this one. But OmniGuide was too expensive. Uh, so we moved to this one. But in the past, it was KTP. I, I tried KTP, Argon in the beginning, Diod. But this is good. Really, I'm pretty happy, especially for the full plate. You will see that. Right? Uh, so you need to be a little bit away from the, from the, from the target. Uh, 
Okay, you see the spot. Fe, fe, fe. But I, I really don't want to cut the, 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 the superstructure with the laser. Otherwise, I need to increase the, the setting, and I don't like that. So you see, I bent the digital tip myself right now. I just adapt it. Fe, fe. With the KTP, it was much stronger, but I, I don't mind. I like to do it uh, in, in, the, in the combination of both. Okay, so now I'm, I, I cannot reach the anterior cruise. I don't think I can, even, even with a laser. Let me try with a laser, but I don't think I can. Donne-moi le laser encore. Le laser encore, s'il vous plaît. I can try to reach it, but it's going to be tricky, I think, because the, the gap is very narrow. Right? Uh, uh. Okay, let's see. I'm not sure. It's got a little persistence to feed the artery. Yeah, as well, small one. It's not going to be a problem. So I want to stabilize the superstructure while I'm drilling. So I'm drilling out from left to right. So I will put my sucker on the other side. Or you can also put it on the on the incus like this and push a little bit the superstructure. This helps. And then you just leave the diamond dust doing the job by itself. No pressure, step by step, like this. A progressive movement. You control what you're doing. It's a thick uh, posterior course, very thick. Because the problem, as we discussed with Miguel, it's the time, even when you separate the interdependent joint, it's not an easy process. Because this is the time where you can completely dislocate the superstructure and the foot plate. Here you can see what I'm doing. I drill transversely because the, the, because of the thickness of the superstructure. Now it's fine. I think the, the posterior cruise is cut. And now I need to cut the anterior cruise, which is more tricky. But once you have uh, drilled the, anterior, the posterior cruise, it helps. I'm going to use the laser already to vaporize the, the, the small artery. Try to decrease the bleeding. But, you know, coagulation is not good with uh, CO2, right? Eh? Right? Uh, okay, there we go. All right, now the la, la fraise encore. So this is the problem, eh? to reach the anterior cruise. Always been the problem. So I will try to drill out like this, but it's not very easy. And by doing this, of course, the risk is to dislocate the anterior I, I always try to uh, cut it and not, or to drill it and not to fracture it, because you never know if you still fracture, you can fracture the entire foot plate, so it's not good. Okay, I think it's fine. I can now remove the superstructure. And of course, once you have removed the superstructure, the gap will remain much better. Okay, let's see. Okay, this is done. So now I can remove the superstructure with the sucker. Okay, let's see what we have. I'm going to measure now the distance from the incus to the to the foot plate. What the took? I will remove all this fibrous tissue covering the uh, foot plate, and then I will measure. So I use a shuknesh hook. You, you see, you say the way of I use this shuknesh hook. I, I put it, uh, I introduce first the, the hook, and then I pull like this on the other side, introducing and pulling. So you know exactly what you're doing compared to the position of the facial nerve on the left. Uh, there is some residual postural cruise here, but I don't mind because the uh, uh, exposure of the foot plate is fine. I j no, attendez, donnez-moi une petite seconde d'abord, on a le calmé. I just want to be sure that there is no connection, uh, fibrous connection between the tympanic membrane and the incus. And you see, if I move the malice, everything's fine. Okay, so I will now measure the distance from foot plate to incus. And what I'm going to do, I think I'm going to use a bucket prosthesis, which we're going to be fine to demonstrate the bucket prosthesis. I'm going to measure now, because there is a decent fashion, not very much. And the, you know, the, there's no much gap between the facial nerve and the, the incus. So it would be nice to demonstrate the bucket. So I'm going to measure first. 
Uh, so what you mean is that the ink is, is a little short, that with right. the normal prosthesis, yes, the prosthesis exactly. will touch the invasion nerve. Yeah. yeah, which, it, in fact, in my experience, I never had any problem with that, but I think it's always better to try to avoid that. Okay, so let's try to now measure. And uh, you see oh, the bleeding in the middle. This bleeding is annoying. I think it's 4.5, but I need to check. Yes, 4.5. The upper one is in front of the ink. So 4.5. But if I use the bucket, I will cut it at 4. Set on the key, mon plan, s'il vous plaît. Stop. So now it's the sta stable army time. Flaron, s'il vous plaît. And I'm going to use again a combination of uh, laser and micro drill. And if the laser works well, with one shot, you make a nice rosette, and that's enough. And you will see that I'm not performing a laser stapedotomy because in that case, you really need to uh, use high setting, which I don't like. Uh, to me, I prefer to do it uh, with a combination of uh, just the laser to decrease the resistance of the foot plate and then helping the drilling up procedure. Three watts, s'il vous plaît. Three watts, eh? I use three watts for the foot plate. Prêt? Feu? There we go. Not so good, but I do the one. So sometimes it works better than sometimes. So I don't know. Never know. Okay, that's enough for me. And now I will drill out this uh, fenestra with the uh, 0.7 millimeter burr. So you see, I'm starting the drilling right before touching the full plate, and then you're approaching the full plate. It's quite a thick full plate, I must say. So I'm going to use the trick of the saline solution to help, so which means that I'm going to introduce uh, the burr within saline solution to decrease the resistance and to help for the drilling and to decrease the risk of heating the labyrinth. And especially when I do that, especially when I have uh, obliterative foot plate. So I'm going to drill out this foot plate progressively. Uh, uh, it's more resistant than usual. Wait, we get a cut. So again, you see, I'm just leaving the bird doing the job with the 0.7 sucker with my left hand. It's nearly done. I just need to increase that. So it's a very low speed. I control everything with my uh, foot pedal. Okay, that's fine now. We have a nice uh, stapedotomy now. Let me focus on that. And I will cover it with the vein now. Okay, let's take the vein. Here is the vein. So we are now facing the intima, as I explained. And then we grab the vein with the uh, sucker. So this is, you, can, you can see that the, the external part is dry, while the uh, inside is still wet. OK, let's put it with the sucker and with the needle. Pushing the vein down. That's the point. Just you know where the fenestra is, so you know that you have to trust yourself and <laughs> put the vein and then hold the vein like this. And then you know I'm just pushing a little bit the vein like this. The bleed is a is a problem. Eh? I, it's not clear, but that's the best we can do. I know we have hypertension, but it's uh, come on attention là. Anyway, that's the best we can do. Not easy. Okay, so let's go with the bucket. So I, you remember I measured 4.5, but I had to take into account the thickness of the length of the lenticular process, which is 0.5 in my uh, experience. So I will remove 0.5 millimeter, which means I'm going to use a 4 millimeter long uh, bucket. So you see this beautiful procedure. I like it very much. You have a hollow head like this with the wire loop all in Teflon, 0.4 millimeter shaft again. And I'm going to cut it right now at 4 millimeter, just like a regular piston. And then I'm going to take it with a sucker, 0.9 millimeter sucker, and I will uh, introduce it within the middle here. 
pouvez me tenir, s'il vous plaît Ok, let's go back to the middle year. And I will introduce now the procedure. Okay, so again, I will use the sucker to introduce the procedure. So I will put the shaft first within the fenestra like this. There we go. Mm, I think it's a little bit too long. So usually it's fine, but I'm going to remove a little bit. Can you put it in the place? Because I feel the resistance. So I will re reduce to 3.75 which should be fine. There we go. I will reduce a little bit, and this will help. But usually it's 0 0.5. Everything is very important, and the length of the procedure is of major importance. Everything is in detail. We know that this expression, though. the details are in the devil. Okay, there we go. Or the other side, eh? the devil is in the detail. <laughs> That's the opposite. Okay, so it's fine. I put the shaft. Now I need to rotate the prosthesis in order to place the anterior part of the prosthesis head right in front of the lenticular process. I need to rotate this prosthesis on the other side. Okay, like this. It goes right in front of the, of the lenticular process like this. And I will need to, uh, I need to rotate a little bit more, which is not easy, I don't know why. There we go. Okay, now it's fine. And now what I will do, you need the combination of both hands here. I will elevate a little bit in kiss with, uh, with the hook like this. Not too much, of course. And then while I'm doing this, I will try to introduce the pocket procedure right underneath the lens to the process and then release the inkage. And now it goes well. There we go. And now I have this uh, wire loop, which I don't think is going to be really interesting, but because we have it, we just trying to put it over the inkage, but in this case, it's not possible because the inkage is, is too thick. But anyway, it's very stable usually, so this doesn't mean anything to me, the, the, the wire loop. All right, I think it's it's fine. I try to see the bending side, but it's not so easy because it's pretty narrow here. And set it will so I'm going to use the 0.7 sucker and look for the bending sign uh, right now. But I think it should be okay. You see now the distal tip of the shaft and you see the bending. Okay, that's clear. And sometimes I take a little bit of time to cover, to restretch the vein a little bit more, but I think it's fine. Okay then. So I will reposition the flap. Okay, very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I think it was the interesting case to choose this procedure. Yeah, I nice to see you using that procedure. Yeah, it's not that frequent. I'm too old, I should say. My name is Fahad. Thanks, Robert. Um, yes. Do you think the chance to for the prosthesis to be dislocated because the handle is not, I mean, I mean, is not 100% uh, enclosed over the lung process? I think. Yes, it's true. There's, a, there's always a risk. But if you see the design of this prosthesis, Adesi, um, you have a kind of anterior opening of the hollow head, you see? And so you 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 can insert deeply with that uh, the lenticular process within the prosthesis head, which helps to stabilize the prosthesis. But it's true that there's nothing clearly as you have to with the piston to completely fix the prosthesis to the incus. But with experience, I must say it's pretty rare to have prosthesis dislocation. So it seems that this design, the hollow uh, deep uh, head that we have, 
works fine. And I'm pretty sure that the the, uh, the wire loop doesn't help in the stability, I think. I Wilco pointed out earlier on, Robert, that the, the only time the wire loop is important is if you tried to use this prosthesis without a vein graft. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. an interesting point. We w one must think that there is no risk of increased necrosis with this type of prosthesis because there is no crimping. Uh, but um, but I had cases of this of increased necrosis even with a bucket prosthesis, not frequent, but this uh, can happen because I had cases like this. Which means something interesting is that the uh, cause of increased necrosis is not related to uh, no, or not always related, or not only related to the crimping. No, uh, it's it's the blood supply that comes up through the, the stapes. To the, it's related to the blood supply, I think. Well, yes, it, because, yeah. it's, it's, I think. it's interesting. There are a couple of publications, either mechanical wear and tear, because you see it when there's vibration on the foot plates, that the pressure on the incus is the higher with the, steep, uh, with the uh, prosthesis, and of course vascularization. But then again, why does the incus not erode when you leave it in the mastoid where you do mastoid surgery? Yeah, so that's there, a good point. Multiple points to it. And, yeah, uh, it's unclear. true. But uh, I think it's a, a probably a combination of a poor blood supply. Can we have friction Ro of the prosthesis? Can I don't we have know. the video of Robert, please? Yeah, yeah, it's coming with the video. Okay. Oh, we can see you, but we cannot see you here. Yeah. So, so yeah. hold on, hold on. One minute, one minute. And then you move to Thibault. Okay. Very interesting. Using the vein graft allows you a little bit more surgical variation. Because you can leave the piston on it like this, and you don't need to worry that the piston will go in. Because the no. vein graft, so the vein graft does add some tools to your toolbox if you use it. Using the yeah. vein graft, it, he look, makes it look easy, but it's not. It sticks. It well, and just, I mean, you don't notice it, but just the way he moves his microscope from the vein graft and then it's back into the ear. Takes me over oh, this and your focus. Oh, there's blood again. Get deconnect the vein graft because you need the suction. I mean, it looks very easy like this. It's not. But having the vein graft does allow extra uh, surgical solutions. Can you, can, John, can you go back to the, because they don't respond to the telephone, the technician. So uh, they just have to uh, switch the. I think they're smoking. Are, they're, you're back. Okay, hide the là, patient. Là aussi, vois, we we don't want to see the patient. Il y a des morceaux osseux qui Questions sont about this one. Okay. Mobile. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, it's good, but yeah. we prefer not to see the patient at all. See the patient. Uh, we can't see it. Um, questions, other questions. Now it's the chance to ask questions. And there are no stupid are no questions. questions. Nobody wants to ask any questions. Except no, we've got one. Adian. Home. Netherlands. It's another Dutchman. Another one. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, I was inter interesting. Uh, it's, about, it's about the same size. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you, you, uh, yeah, you, you, you used a drill to, to crush, uh, to, to, uh, to remove the anterior crust. Have you ever had any problems with the incus or dislocation of the incus? Because I, I saw you lift the incus a bit. It's, uh, yes, always. Yeah, it's true. But uh, if, if it's a little bit, it doesn't create any problem. Because it's very difficult to reach the anterior cruise without touching a little bit the incus. So you have to control what you are doing. I know that I'm touching the incus. I know that I'm elevating a little bit the incus. I, I can see it. But I know that there is a certain degree that you cannot go further. But it's difficult to explain. It's a question of experience. You know that you can do it and without dislocating the incus. Oh, you have dislocated the incus accidentally as well in, your, in the past, haven't you? Yes, I show that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've see, I put that one on, on YouTube to explain that we can make problem with that and how to deal with problems. That's what we have to show, sure. Not only the easy game. Well, I think we all have, haven't we? I suppose what you would do, you'd probably do a malleus uh, Relocation the malleus tapedotomy if that happened, would you? Yes, sure. We'll In that the, case, there's no other way. Because when, when you, it's, it's an important point. When you touch the increase, and if you, uh, to know if you have dislocated the increase, it means that 
the malice increased joint is, is going to have a problem. You have to touch again the malice and check again the malice increased mobility. And if you check the malice, the increase will move like this, up and down. If you dislocate even not very big, the, uh, the joint, when you move the malice, you can see the increase moving like this, lateral movement, which is different. Then in that case, you can be sure that you have dislocated more or less the increase, and then you have to, in my opinion, remove the increase and do a malice to face the autonomy procedure. But but if the increase is like this, yeah. it's fine. Yeah, so it depends on the axis that there's the mobility. Yeah? That's what you said. Yes. Uh, yeah. are, are we going to see in malice relocation today, this, these days? Uh, this is going to be the next case, okay. which is uh, supposed to be a malice ankylosis. And I must say that also we have to change a little bit the program for tomorrow because unfortunately our colleague and friend, Francois Cassez, just uh, uh, as his father died. So we, we, we have to, he's not able to be part of a course. So we need to um, reorganize yeah. the course yeah. for tomorrow in terms of light surgery. But it will be fine. We'll yeah. do that. So I feel sorry for him anyway. But okay. it's unfortunate. Okay, we need to go to Thibault unless there's one yes, more we go to Thibault one now. last okay. question. Okay, see you later. Thanks very much. No okay. Hello, hello, uh, Graf. Mostly with the. Oh. Oh. Ah, from the. Hi, Thibaut. Can you hear us? Oh. Hello. Yep, we can see you. Pretty so I, I see you the situation, show you the situation. Petit Rosen. Aspiration 12. So I elevated the tympanometal flap, and there is a very large erosion of the posterior wall of the auditory canal with uh, mastoid with, which is full with cholesteatoma there is an anticotomy there and there is a stable scarred tympanic membrane so i elevated the tympanometal flap in order to check the middle ear the middle ear is safe, and there is a complete ossicular chain, petit crochet, with aspiration 10, the incus there, uh, the malleus head is there, malleus handle there, and there is bony reconstruction around the malleus and the stapes. Uh, there is a mobile stapes which is not very visible and there is here bony reconstruction against the the incus and also against uh, the stapes. So I separated the stapes from the incus and now I will be able to start the resection of the cholesteatoma. I will first remove the bigger mass of cholesteatoma from the mastoid. Uh, and uh, remove progressively the cholesteatoma uh, with the mastoidectomy progressing. Alors, uh, oui. uh, I show you, we, at the end, uh, after removal of, of cholesteatoma, I will obliterate the mastoid with bone substitute. It is a glass substitute called glass bone. It is very. Oui, mais je peux pas dézoomer plus. Hop, est-ce que je peux right, faire? Right, you have to turn the. That's better. Yes. 
it looks like crystallized sugar cluster. And to use it, I will mix it with blood. And uh, with the coagulation of the blood, uh, the bone substitute will be coherent. And then after that, I will use it to obliterate the master heat. So we will, the nurse will do that. She will mix 2.5 millimeter blood with the five uh, cubic centimeters of bone substitute and put some riflamacin in uh, to prevent infection. So come back to the ear. Alors, Flester et Aspiration 15. Pince râteau. Hop. La patte. So, Thibaut, was yep. that bone from the canal all missing from the disease, or have you actually had to remove much bone? Please, do you mean? Uh, yeah, so question? we can see that there's a, you know, basically an open cavity here. Had that bone already been destroyed by the cholesteatoma, or have you taken that posterior canal wall down? Uh, I don't know. I have not the report of the previous surgery. Okay, so this is revision. Okay, okay. Yes. Yeah, fine. It was operated on in 2004, that means long ago, and it led time for the cholesteatoma to recur and erode the auditory canal, but I don't know if the first surgery was performed of our polymastoidectomy, grosse fraise et aspiration 30, in canal wall up or canal wall down surgery. Up. Allez. Comme ça. Ouais. So, hop, alors de l'eau. So, I will look toward the limits of the mastoid, the segment and the posterior wall. Comment Non, parce que j'ai vu Glassbone, donc... Euh... Hop. Ça va me donner... Euh... Même taille diamantée. Grand rosane en attendant. So I am very careful. Hop. Hop. Et on est surexposé. Hop. So I wish to remove the mass of the cholesteatoma, but to let the matrix in place in order to protect uh, the canal. Oh. 
13. Oui. Je l'ouvre. Aspiration 20. So I have to identify the tegment in order to follow it because I, I have to go to the superior semicircular canal, fraise la taille en dessous. Je peux pas dézoomer. Comment? I will perform an open mastoidectomy and then obliterate. Up. Malade vers moi un peu. Stop. So my landmark is really the tegmen. So I have to skeletonize it and to follow it. Je vais mettre plus bas que. En rosène. Hop, à la patte. Oh. And I take care to avoid to uh, suction on the lateral canal. Comment? Non, 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 non. Non, non. Non. Ça, c'est sur, sur le canal latéral. Hop. Cluster. Hop, mouché.
five. Rosen. Oh, so I will revise my landmarks. Up. Here is the tympanic membrane there, up the anterior attic there, the ossicular chain with the head of the ossicle there, the lateral semicircular canal there. So at this stage, I will remove the incus and the malleus head. I have separated the incus from aspiration 12. The stapes. Lavage moi-même. Lavage moi-même. And so I will cut the neck of the malleus because I will keep the malleus handle intact as a landmark for otoscopy, post-op otoscopy. Ciseaux de Dieter. Oh, merde. Si, micro ciseaux. And I separate the prostanza that I want to keep from the ossicular chain, micro ciseau fin. I cut the tendon of the malice, and I will now remove the incus. I hope that it is sufficiently detached from the stapes. Petit crochet. I look to the stay piece. That's okay. And here is the incus. Micro pass. Donnez. And the malleus head. I have to cut the tensor tympani, which is there, micro ciseau fin. Comment? Uh, oui, micro pince. And here is the malleus head. So now I will perform the dissection from the anterior attic to the antrum, the tyrosin. There is some bony reconstruction there. I try to happen to understand what it is. I think to is fresh enough, which is under that. I will 
thrill here is Bonnie Bridge à ce 13, voyons, deux tailles en dessous et aspiration 15. Non, donnez-moi la fraise, allez. Si vous me donnez le moteur sans fraise, j'ai l'air ben, de quoi Hop, c'est un peu gros, c'est la taille en dessous. Voilà, de l'eau. Voilà, cette kérosène. I remove carefully. At this stage, I don't see a fistula. I think there is erosion there, but uh, no visible fistula at this stage. Micro studio fin. Hop. Voilà. Non. Euh. Ah oui, oui. Malade vers moi. So I will start now to levate matrix top. From the mastoid towards the attic. Up. Alors, I have to complete the mastoidectomy there. Aspiration 20 et euh, fraise, euh, grosse fraise cuite. Fermenté. En haut parce que... Thibaut Oui, yes. Euh, on va peut-être faire ce qu'on a dit. Tu nous dis quand tu veux qu'on interrompe nous pour aller déjeuner pendant que tu continues à poursuivre toi et qu'on revienne pour la fin comme, comme prévu. Ça te va Oui, ben là, euh, à mon avis, vous pouvez... Euh... Aller déjeuner, si on peut reprendre dans une heure à peu près. Oui, 14 heures, on va essayer au maximum. D'accord. 14 heures, okay. oui, 13h30, allez. Si 13h30, possible. le temps de monter, ça va être chaud. Hein. Bon, on va faire au mieux. On va faire au bon, mieux. Bon, j'opère doucement alors. <rire> D'accord, oui. Allez, à tout à l'heure alors. Oui. Ils vont casser la croûte. Vous allez me donner la...
Thibaut, can you hear me? Hello, Thibaut. Yes, do you hear me? Uh, yeah, we're just coming back in now after the lunch, which was very nice. Sorry you couldn't be there. Okay. Um, it looks like you've made a lot of progress. Do you want to yes, I give us a description? Yes, I will show you the situation. Uh, it's a smooth. So the situation is that uh, I performed the canal wall down mastoidectomy and I removed the cholesteatoma except where the, there was erosion of the, of the labyrinth. Point uh, mousse. Here, if I show you point mousse. The landmarks, you can see here the stapes, which is bouché, intact. The tympanic portion, portion of the facial nerve, which is naked. There. Here, there is erosion of the lateral semicircular canal, and I just let the matrix on it, I will remove it now. There was near erosion of the superior canal, and I can see when there is water, the blue line of the superior canal there. And I was able to remove the cholesteatoma, which was over the canal, and there just ender. The blue line is just there. And there is the biggest problem, which is uh, at the superior face of the lateral semicircular canal, there is, I think, erosion of the canal with a labyrinthic fistula. So I will remove the, the remnant of matrix there, protect it, then remove there. And, and protect. Alors, vous allez me donner aspiration. What are you going to put over there? You're going to put some glass or some fascia or fat? I will put fascia uh, before to obliterate. Alors, petit rosen et aspidis. And so first, I remove the matrix on the lateral wall of the lateral semicircular canal. And I think that here there is, on the lateral wall, erosion without fistula. Uh, you can see it's operat fistula. Up. Okay, no, no fistula, but erosion of the canal. But behind that, there is fistula. Now I have to remove the matrix there. The remnant of cholesteatoma, and it is not the same thing. You can see here I am in the lateral semicircular canal, but it's crochet. Just remind us, what's the hearing of this patient's hearing like? Uh, please, I did not understand. The audiogram of this patient, what is the hearing level like preoperatively? Preoperatively, he has a 25 mixed hearing loss. Okay. And was he dizzy? No. Clinically, no dizziness, no vertigo. He will. 
un petit rosen. Boucher. Fraise. C'est beaucoup trop gros. Non, non, pas d'eau. Rester. Expiration 12, 13, 13, deux tailles plus petites, 13, so will just trail there with the day member and then close, deux tailles plus petites, Deux tailles plus petites encore. Allez. De taille plus petite, grand rose en attendant. Elle. So, Thibaut, we're going to pop over to Robert for a few minutes and then okay. we'll come back to see how you manage Alors, the fistula. 10. Is that okay? Le petit Rosen. Je ne vais pas faire plus là. Hein. Je ne vais pas faire plus. Alors, vous allez me faites voir une fraise. Hop. Je donne un petit coup de fraise et je vais mettre un fascia là-dessus. Allez, celle-là. Inspiration 12. Bon, Marion, si je jette un coup d'œil. Regarde Marion. Ben, je vais mettre, ça va être couvert par l'obispo. Thibaut, can you hear me? 
Yes. Can you just zoom out so we can see the whole picture? Just for one minute. Five. So now I, I drill the area around the opening of the labyrinth, and I will cover it with, with the fascia and then with the obliteration. Hello. Allez. Le fascia, micro pince. Pointe mousse. Hop. Et vous allez me donner. Voilà. Un gel foam, un normal. Voilà. Ils sont avec Robert là. So now uh, I will perform the mastoid obliteration, micro pince, le cartilage, pince mousse, le cartilage. Hop. And so I prepared the cartilage of the tragus to reconstruct the posterior wall of the auditory canal before to obliterate the mastoid and so I will insert it like that petit crochet I just have to close the anterior attic before to perform the, the obliteration. Montrez-moi ce qui me reste comme cartilage. Avec de la lumière. I keep some cartilage to reconstruct, to reinforce the tympanic membrane. But I need there to put some cartilage in the anterior attic in order, point mousse, to close the anterior attic before the obliteration. Yeah. Okay, and now I will be petit crochet. able to perform the mastoid obliteration. C'est sûr qu'ils sont avec moi, ils sont pas avec Robert. Ils sont d'accord. Okay, in three minutes you will go to Robert. I can just show you le glass bone. Pince le gin. The beginning of the obliteration. So you can see here the bone substitute mixed with 15 Grand Rosen 
mix with blood so it becomes coherent and I will progressively call them obliterate the mastoid with this bone substitute. I start in the anterior attic and I will progressively obliterate all the mastoid. I remove the gel foam that I put on the fascia, which is on the, um, the fistula, the labyrinthic fistula, and I will push the obliteration toward the anterior attic cluster in order to prevent to prevent any retraction and I can check through the auditory canal that there is no over obliteration but it's well maintained by the cartilage you can see here the fascia that I put on the labyrinthic fistula we oui, just 30 seconds up oh, oh, oh. Oh, then and so I obliterate the labyrinthic fistula with the bone substitute. And so now, Brugine uh, uh, obliteration, you can go with Robert and you will come back for the end of surgery for the tympanoplasty. At the stage, I just finished the, the obliteration. Oh, then. With you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, did you make the case presentation? No, not yet. We were watching t -Bird. I can okay. try, but every time it does it, it cuts you off. Okay, okay. And then I so fall off the stage. Okay. Three times. All right. Maybe you can do it now? Yeah. There's supposed to be a epitympanic malice and cirrhosis. There's a CT scan, which I don't have here, unfortunately. So the... What is the main cause of the epitympanic malice ankylosis? A very narrow epitympanic um, space, and there's a contact between the malice head and the uh, epitympanic wall. So I think it should be this kind of problem. We'll, we'll see preoperatively, but the city is really in favor of that. And also the fact that we have not a large urban gap, unilateral. And uh, no history of cross but the fact that it's uh, not a large air bone gap also related to this in, in the majority of cases, in my experience. So, yeah, we've, so got the, we've got the description now. Okay, good. So, you see, there is no other history. Neither know any uh, previous otitis or thing like that. No trauma. Monte la tête, s'il vous plaît. And everything's fine. You will see. Bon, ça va. Table vers moi. Table vers moi. Okay, we've seen the audiogram, so we'll come back to you. Okay, good. Stop, stop. Okay. So as usual, I try to find the right size of speculum. Come in a second. <coughs> so if it's a malice ankylosis, what I will plan to do is a combination of malice relocation and the salastic bending technique uh, from malice to take this full plate. Okay, this is, I think, the right side. Quel est la dimension? Let me. That's a 6.5 uh, millimeter diameter. Uh, Just a little bit less light, Robert. It's a bit bright. 
Yeah, yeah. You give me one minute and I fix this and I'll be ready for that. All right. So is it better now? A bit better, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's go with saying the same way at the beginning. <coughs> and so you see this, uh, if it's the problem of the epitympanic malice and kilosis, it's always interesting to discuss the cause of that. It is important to understand that this is always congenital malformation. It's never or nearly never related to ligament fixation. I know that, uh, as we discussed, I think, two, three days ago, uh, Hugo Fisch was describing a ligament fixation of the malice, and he was also saying that even for atosclerosis, there was a ligament fixation in, in, in I think it was 30 or 40% of cases, which I never found. But more important, yeah, yeah. yeah, but more important is that uh, there was a, a very nice paper made by uh, an American uh, anatomist who tried to understand uh, the cause of this <coughs> malice epitympanic fixation. So I think he, 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 he made a study on 200 <coughs> temporal bones, uh, and he found malice and kilosis in all of them, I think, because it was already... I don't, I don't remember exactly, but anyway, it was a big study, and he found that in all cases, it was only related to a poor epitympanic space, and never related to a ligament fixation. So it's interesting to know that. Okay, so now I'm close to the end of this. So the, you see that I'm, <coughs> again, using the same kind of approach. I'll be ready with the, with the end of this in a second now. And it should be okay. Now I'm going to use the uh, the needle. I think it, the knife is not used to be. That's better, I think. <laughs> okay, let's do it now with the mucosa. Like this. Okay. I think I need to go to the right a little bit more. The color encore. Okay, there we go. Can they? So at the beginning will be the same. I will do the bony rim resection again and try to expose the, the, the same landmark. You see the cord tympani here. And then I will do the bony rim right now. Because even if the CT scan is in favor of Madison kilosis, it doesn't mean always something like that. So it's only the middle exploration to determine exactly what is the, the cause of the conductive area loss. It's only when you touch the osseocular chain that you can determine exactly what is the cause. So imaging is important, but it doesn't change anything because you have to do the you have to check the osseocular chain mobility in all cases, and then it's only when you do this that you determine exactly what is the problem. This is why I have lots of personal doubts about the interest of the preoperative CT. I know it's not in agreement with the vast majority of uh, ENT surgeons now, but I really think it's Cone bean is much better, but in France we have problems with the cone bean because we cannot prescribe cone bean for ear. We can for sinus, but not for ear, and it's uh, by law we cannot do it. So it's forbidden, it's crazy, but it's like this. So you see again quite a thick bone, but you see this curette, how efficient it is. 
Okay, let me see about the quarter before doing maybe with the chisels in a, in a second. Ten minutes. Okay, don't need the crochet pull tunnel. Again, I'm going to use this uh, strong short hook like this to try to open up the quarter the canal of the quarter, which is done now, so you see it's much better now. So I can now remove this bone without any risk. And we'll see, that good? That good, okay. <coughs> that is it. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so you see it's strong, strong bone, eh? Very thick. Very thick. Try to rotate this bone, and I will remove it now. There we go. Okay, now I can continue with the curette. Safer now. Uh, to be honest, I don't really like the chisels. I'm always afraid about uh, this uh, instrument going really down and then damaging the fallopian canal. I never had it, but that's, I'm always afraid about that. So I'm very cautious about this. And I don't like the... Personally, I don't like using the drill because I have this bone dust, but I know it's, of course, very efficient, spe specifically in this case where the bone is very strong. And I found, when I have a case of uh, Madison kilosis, I found cases like this with a very narrow area and thick bone. Like in this case. But you see this correct? Oh, efficient it is. It's very nice, very strong. And it's French. It's French. I need to enlarge a little bit because I still don't see the facial nerve on the left. Okay, it's going to be fine. I think in a second I'm going to move the head now. Uh, on va bouger la table, donc vous mettez la table en déclive, s'il vous plaît. I have to move the table on déclive and not the head now because it is maximum the head. So I need to stop. Montez la table maintenant. Okay, I think it's going to be better now. Stop. All right, so now we see everything. And I'm going to check the osteocular chain right now. Oui, alors attends, je fais la, la, oui, d'accord, je fais juste la démo et je le fais passer à vie. So what I'm going to do now, uh, John, I'm going to do the separation of the uncleus okay. joint separation, okay. and then we're going to check the osteocular chain, and then we you go to Thibault because he wants to show you the osteocular re reconstruction, okay. and then I'll be waiting for you, okay, for the manuscript yeah. location and yeah. everything. Okay, uh, so I'm going to do the uncleus joint separation now with the joint knife. Allons-y, je vais séparer. Non, pas tout de suite. Je vais te dire ça dans une seconde, Michel. Un neuf. Hein. Attends, hein. Okay, so this is the joint. And it's very strong. So it's strongly fixed, in fact. So you see already that the state yeah. is mobile and in it. So definitely, it's the... It's a block, eh? A block yes. of bone. A tape seems to be mobile. Let's see. So I'm going to check. You see, very strongly fixed. Yeah, so it's no going to be movement. tricky to relocate. It's going to be fun. So now from the tape is head. Yeah. yeah. Which is mobile. But I'm going to check it again because it's sometimes difficult to know exactly. And uh, uh, it's better when you remove the interest to check again. So I think you should go to uh, Thibault for his osteopathy. Okay. I'll be waiting for you. Robert, can you wait like this so we come back exactly at the same place, face? Yes, yes, I stay for you. Okay. okay. We need to go to Thibault. Yeah. Hi, Thibault. Hi. 
So I, I show you, I show you uh, the reconstruction. You can see the complete mastoid obliteration, and I perform a tympanoplasty, and I just measure the length of the prosthesis that I have to use. I put inside a dummy, you can see here's the panoplasty with perichondrium and a reinforcement with cartilage. And I put in place a dummy of prosthesis. It is 1.5 millimeter and it is the right length. So I will now place a partial prosthesis, 1.5 millimeter long from the step piece to the cartilage that reinforce the tympanic membrane. So uh -huh. I will use a medal prosthesis. So this is a Dresden clip, huh? Yes, it is clip partial prosthesis 1.5 millimeter. Here is it. It looks like the clip prosthesis by Kurtz, but the difference is that the clip is symmetric. In the Kurtz prosthesis, there is an anterior and the posterior side for the clip here. Uh, it is completely symmetric. Uh, the anterior and the posterior side of the prosthesis have two teeth to go uh, beside the, the stapes tendon. And so, Thibaut, this is not made by Kurtz? Please? Uh, who makes these? Who makes No, no, these? it's not a court, it's a prosthesis by Medel. Medel, okay. Yes, Medel passive middle implants. So I take the prosthesis with the section tube. So you can see here the prosthesis. Uh, Petit crochet. She has, as I explained, a symmetric clip with two teeth anterior and posterior, and two on each side. And the head can be bent if necessary. Not the case here. And up, I will place up, the prosthesis on the stapes head like that. So I will place it with a suction tube and then insert it up with the hook. And the prosthesis is on the step set. I just have to push it a little bit to place it correctly. And now I can put back the cartilage in the right position, point mousse. and check if everything is okay. And that's okay, the cartilage lies on the stapes head. And I can put now the deeper part of the dressing of the auditory canal. La bande. I put some silastic 
on the tympanic membrane and auditory canal. The thalastic will go, will go in the anterior tympanometal angle. And I will put... Thibaut, do you, do you put some sort of flap over the bioglass, over the glass granules, I, a, over your cartilage? Do you place a flap over all of that? It is covered by cartilage there. Yeah. yeah, but do you, do, you, do you put another flap, a vascularized flap over the... No, I, I didn't yeah. put a flap from the external part of the auditory canal. I have a perichondrium to finish to cover the cartilage and, uh, and the glass And bone. the glass, okay, yeah. Alors, le, Thank le you. de Merocell. I just want to, to put a little piece of Merocell to maintain the tympanic membrane in the right position. And then I will finish to cover the auditory canal reconstruction. Went smooth. Allez-y. Stop. And now uh, I will cover the reconstruction with cartilage, with uh, perichondrium, gros pince. Stop. Oui, c'est bon. Oui, oui. As you will see, I cover all the reconstruction of the posterior wall and the glass bone with perichondrium, went mousse. And I have still another piece to complete that. To achieve that, alors, l'autre, um, une gros pince. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. What moves? Voilà. And so there. Glass one is completely covered by perichondrium in cartilage. Pince morcurette. Stop. Torsion. Have you ever have to go back into one of these cases? Yes. And if so, what, what do the granules look like afterwards? Uh, they do not ossify completely. It makes a mix of fibrous tissue and granules. It don't uh, transform into a dense bone. And so it's really, uh, it's quite easy to remove uh, because uh, of this persistence of some fibrous tissue between the granules. Okay, Thibaut, thank you very much. We have some questions for later on. Uh, okay. Uh, we need to go to Robert. Yes. Because Robert is waiting. Thank you very much, Thibaut. It was a uh, very nice surgery. Thank you. Get me down, man. Okay. With you. Nice view. Dry uh, Gorda. <laughs> oh, dry Gorda. <laughs> Okay, there we go. We have this uh, exposure. So you see the Maddie's handle here, which is very uh, strongly fixed. Uh, I've enlarged a little bit the body memory section because of course when I will have relocated the Maddie's, I don't want the Maddie's becoming in contact with this place. The point will be to reduce this angle between Maddie's and Staples head by removing the incus and then relocating the Maddie's. First step is to uh, separate entirely the malice from the tympanic membrane. So we change the orientation of the, the view now. Of the and speculum. that's relatively and easy because it's not mobile. Tableau en avant. Yes, it's much more easy. Yeah. Tableau en avant, s'il vous plaît. 
So I will use a very fine needle and the distal tip of the needle is bent, so it's a little bit different. So, and on my left hand, I would use a uh, circle to stabilize uh, the uh, obstacle chain also at the same time, although it's fixed. So and you, you turn the patients to away from you. Yeah. So I'm going to make first uh, an incision through the periosteum of the malleus, like this. And then I will elevate a periosteal flap. That's important because this is give you the, the fact that you cannot make, you don't make a tear. Of course, it happens. You can make a tear, but usually it's a limited tear, not very big. So you can take a vein graft or a small piece of fascia or anything to, to close it. But usually if we do a periosteal following the bone, it's pretty good. You see how anterior is this malleus, and you see it's a really anterior malleus there. I'm going now to the umbo, which is always the difficult part of the dissection, but in this case, uh, it will be not so difficult because of the fixation, as you said, will come. Okay, I think it's nearly done. Now I need, in autre s'il vous plaît, droit. I need to go anterior to the malleus, of course. I'm going to use another one, which is not so bent, because the distance between the anterior wall and the malleus is pretty high, pretty low here. Okay, it's nearly done here. A little bit of a distal tip. One more. You know how I'm following the bone. I'm going to turn with the microscope in order to see the uh, the handle. So as you can see, how the, the bling is very low here, which is very, very good. There we go. I think it's done. You see the entire angle is, is done. I will check the tympanic membrane after that, of course, but I need to dissect now the neck of the malleus. So that is the first step, separating the completely the malleus from the tympanic membrane. And then I will cut the tensitite tempon, tensitite tensitite tendon, removing the, the incus, and then relocating the malleus by overstretching the anterior ligament. You see how I stay in contact with the bone always. There we go. I think it's done. Yeah. You have to, to be sure that you completely separate the drum. Otherwise, if you have some residual uh, connection between the drum and the malleus handle. When you relocate the malleus, you can make a tear, and sometimes a big tear. So it's not good. What well, would be different, I mean, in terms of reconstruction. Okay, I think it's fine. So we're going to check now the tympanic membrane to see if it's fine. And this is good. There's no perforation, so it's good. All right. No, now I need to uh, remove the incus. And then I will relocate the malleus. Okay. Crochet. Of course, the cord is drying out a little bit. So I can remove the incus like this with rotating movement and uh, using also the sucker. Okay, that's fine. And now I'm going to cut the tensor tamponite tendon with uh, a knife like this, close to the neck. That's it. And now I'm going to relocate the malleus posteriorly. I'm going to take a hook. So the technique is to take a hook. I need what I want to do is to overstretch the anterior tympanomalia ligament and uh, preserving the superior ligament, of course. So I'm going to use this uh, hook, which is a long one, quite strong, and I will put the hook close to the neck, because if you put it here, then you can break the malleus, which would be a problem, of course. So the, the hook on one side, and I would advise that you put the circle on the other side, because you can control the, mo the movement of the malleus in order to, to try to avoid a real dislocation of the malleus. So I'm going to reach the resistance, and then I will... Uh, 
pull progressively the mouse posteriorly, and now it's gone. You see? Now I change completely the new position of, to the new position of the mouse, which now is going to be exactly over the stated head. Alors, ça vous aimez maintenant, s'il vous plaît. And you do that to optimize the angulation for your yes. uh, prosthesis, huh? Yeah, I want to have a vertical position of the prosthesis. That's it. Yeah. Table vers moi, s'il vous plaît. So. Okay. What you need to do now is to measure the distance from the stapes foot plate to the malleus. But first, as I said when we were discussing in my office uh, two days ago, I just want to be sure that I will place the malleus first at the right level. So I will stick the malleus back to the tympanic membrane because, you know, when I was starting in, uh, introducing this technique, I made some mistake. Uh, I didn't take care of this and the malleus was that medialized and I measured too shortly. So I just wanted to stick the malleus back to the tympanic membrane first, like this. I think this is good. And now we can measure. There you go. Okay. So I use an elongated stapes measuring rod. I will check again the stapes after that. But I'm going to measure now uh, from the stapes foot plate to the malleus. So I'm, this runs from uh, five to eight. So I'm now touching the anterior pole of the stapes. You can see the second notch is in front of the malleus, which means six. And I always add 0.5 because of the deepness of the prosthesis head, of the groove of the prosthesis head. Tell me. Let me check the stapes, because I was not completely sure that it was perfectly mobile, so I need to check that. Yeah, it is mobile. That's it. Okay, ciseau. I will cut now the stapes tendon. I, I use it to stabilize the the bend. Now, faites un peu en profit, s'il vous plaît. Faites un peu en profit. La tête en profil. Stop. Oui, non, non, ça va. C'est juste ça. Ok, on y est. Ok, so now we're going to cut the prosthesis right now. So the prosthesis I'm going to use is a different one than uh, Thibault. It's a torp. And uh, this is made by Grace Medical. We designed also with John. Huh? John helped me to design that with the synastic banding and technique and everything. And... Uh, the aim is to attach the prosthesis to the stapes. I want to have uh, two points of stability, one with the malleus, one with the stapes. So, okay, let's go now with the uh, prosthesis. So this prosthesis is made with uh, hydroxylapatite head and uh, titanium shaft, and you see the elastic band coming through the shaft. You can see that. So I'm going to cut it. I want to have 6.5. It goes through the prosthesis head, so I need to go first at 5.5, because of course, I, after that, I will pull it back. So I put it at one millimeter less, 5.5. Then I will cut the shaft. And I will pull it back, and we'll have 6.5. Then it goes. This is 6.5. Okay, good. Now, the beauty of this is that the cyanastic band is coming with the prosthesis, which helps a lot. Let me see, maybe the pants, maybe I will push a little bit the band a little bit lower. Maybe one. That's it. I think it will be fine. And then I want to put the band like this. And now I will introduce the prosthesis. So I need to introduce the shaft of the prosthesis first. Always, I always do this. Introducing the shaft first and then attaching the prosthesis to the stapes. It's not a very large gap again. As you can see that, pretty narrow. Uh, I hope you can see clearly. So far, so very, far clear. very clear. Okay, good. Okay, let's first place the prosthesis. I don't care about the synastic band at the moment. I just want to place the shaft right here in contact with the with the prosthesis, with the sorry, with the foot plate. And now I will I think I will put the malice within the groove first. Depends on the presentation. But I think it will and help. Robert, you, you put it in with the forceps, not with the suction, huh? 
Suction. Suction, okay. And then now the forceps, yes. So let's see what's happening now if I put the malice within the groove. Coursiers. It's, it's okay, already good. Center a little bit. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I have to move a little bit, change the orientation of the of the speculum too. And now I will introduce the malice within the groove. And so, the, finally, the last step would be to attach the prosthesis with the bend. So I'm holding the torp. Now I'm, you know, placing the prosthesis underneath the malice handle. Like this. So it fits nicely. And it's definitely the right length. But now I want to attach it to the stay piece with the bend. Oh, so the, the technique is to use uh, a hook like this. Of course, I probably dislocate the prosthesis temporarily. This is not a problem. I just want to place it to place the bend around the stay piece, which is tricky. Of course, this is the tricky part of the technique. So you see, there is a dislocation of the prosthesis, but I don't mind. I will reposition it again after that. And it goes underneath the tenor like this. So it fits very well. It can be. And now I need to adapt the position of the torque. Because I want to be sure that it will stay like this. So you see, it does not stay completely like this. There's a tendency to see the prosthesis lateralized a little bit. So I need to modify a little bit the position of the and let's see who play, of the uh, band, the attachment of the band to the prosthesis. So you'll see I will push the prosthesis down like this until I found the right position. Because I like to have a contact with the foot plate itself. So to do this, first I will push the prosthesis like this and then pull a little bit the band like this. And that's much better now, I think. Can we? Now you see the distal tip of the shaft is definitely in contact with the foot plate. And if I move the prosthesis, they are moving together just like a single unit. That is the point of this technique. And now I will check, but I think all is fine. I need to reposition the flap and see if everything stays in place with a nice condition. And and also, okay. It looks nice because you can see that if I reposition the flap, there is a little bit of a tension, but the good one, not the big one, not severe. And if I re elevate the flap, everything stays in place. This is a good sign because if the prosthesis, for example, is appears to be uh, too long, when you do this, when you re-elevate the flap, you could see the prosthesis uh, uh, going backwards, posteriorly. But I think now it's fine. I have a vertical final position, contact with the, with the malleus, contact and stability with the stapes, not too much pressure. So it's fine. That's okay, I think. All right. Okay then. See, Robert, do you ever see a problem with re-ankylosis? You've repositioned the malleus. It happened to me only, I'm not sure perfectly, but I think two or three cases. So what I do when I revise, I use the previous technique, the old one. I will cut the neck and remove the head. But the difference is that as the malice has been relocated before, the malice sandal is still... Just lost you for a minute with the sound. Probably we can see you, but we've lost the sound. C can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you now, yeah. yeah. You're just well, saying I, you cut well, the neck, yeah. Yes, I, I come back to the previous technique, you know, cutting the neck and removing the head of a malice. But the big difference is that uh, the mani sandal will remain in a nice position overlying the stapes head rather than the previous technique where it, it was still anterior. So you had to bend the procedure. So I would do that. But it's, it was only for two free cases, no more. Right. And I think Thanks it's related much. to the uh, etiopathology of the, of the, of the epitympanic malis ankylosis. Because when we relocate the malis, but this is my feeling, yeah? you change Robert. the position and the orientation of the malis head, and I think it's uh, probably a larger gap with the epitympanic wall. Robert, just a question. Yes? Uh, 
affecting the the, the neck of the malleus now? If uh, it's something, do you think it makes a difference leaving the head now, or just to prevent those few cases that could? Uh, yeah, bring yeah. Because those? if I, if I remove the head now, the malleus will be uh, uh, held by nothing. That's the problem, because it, it I, I've already completely separated the malleus anterior from the tympanic membrane. So if I, it's only. Uh, um, held by the superior ligament. So if I remove the head, the malleus endo will not be attached to anything, so it will fall down. So, you know, yeah. this you, have, you have cut the, the tendon also, the, the tendon of the no. malleus, you have to cut it? Yes, I cut the tensi tamponite, otherwise you cannot relocate it. And Robert, in case of revision, of course, of course, the, the malleus handle is attached to the eardrum. Yeah. So you can, at that moment, you can cut the head off. Yes. Yeah. 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 When I revise this case, it is very nice to see that the malleus uh, remain in good position, and still attached to the tympanic membrane. It's healing very well. Okay. So, yeah. Let's see if there are any questions. Camera. John. Okay. There are some questions, uh, Robert. Okay. No problem. Thanks, Rupert. Um, what about if um, you, you, you are going to check the ossicular mobility before uh, before the incus dislocation? So just only, I mean, I mean, separating the anterior malleus ligament and keeping the the incus in place. If there is, if the problem is only in the anterior malleus ligament. No, 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 no. Look. The, it's related to the cause of the malice ankylosis. It's never, never related. Also, I know Hugo Fish said it's related, but it's not true. It's never related to the anterior ligament fixation. When Davis, I think that's the name of the guy, made this temporal bone uh, dissection to try to study the, the cause, the mechanism of uh, malice ankylosis, 200, 200 temporal bones of malice ankylosis, very impressive, that, that, that's in the US. He never found, that's important, he never found any ligament fixation, ankylosis or temporosclerosis or any other. He found that it was always related to a very poor epitympanic space, which was too narrow, abnormally narrow. So progressively, the malice head becomes in contact with the epitympanic wall, creating the fixation. So it's not related to the ligament, that's, that's the point. So even if you cut the ligament, the malice will remain fixed. Okay? Um, I have a, one commentary and uh, one question. So first yeah. commentary is, uh, um, so the celastic bending actually, in the end of the operation, actually dictates the position of the torpor thesis. Um, uh, it could be for a Nova surgeon, it could be a problem because uh, the, the strength of the celastic bending could dictate the position of the prosthesis foot and uh, and um, uh, connection with the with the manubrium alley. So um, so placing the celastic bending could actually, you know, the the change the the final position of the of the prosthesis. That's the first commentary and a question. And the second question is, uh, would you recommend maybe if you completely mobilize the manubrium malleus and completely separate it from the tympanic membrane, would you actually recommend extra packing to keep the, everything a bit um, under pressure and down? Thank you. Uh, I understand the first comment. The second one, I don't understand. You remove the incus and you put what? I didn't, I didn't get that, sorry. Can no, the second, the second question is actually, would you recommend extra packing to Press ah, to, to press the tympanic membrane down, so not to have the problem with the lateralization or something like that. No, really, I didn't have. Well, I, it's not, it's not true to say any, but the, the incidence of tympanic membrane lateralization was extremely low in this case. Why? It's because by placing the prosthesis, you maintain, you hold the malleus on the horizontal position. So when I revised this case, I, I nearly never had any lateralization, which is a very important point. So you don't need a packing. You could do it, of course. I think it helps. But I, I never do it because I never saw that kind of thing. And the second the second thing is the uh, uh, the position of the synastic band. This is exactly true. This is why I show you that when you put the torp, uh, then the torp was fine. But the co I was not happy with the connection of the distal tip of the shaft with the foot plate. And this is related, of course, to the position of the band. That was exactly what I explained. So you just have to adapt the position of the bend to be sure that the final 
aspect will be perfect. But the, the difference is that if you don't use the stylistic band, you do not increase the chance of stability. By using the stylistic band, you increase the chance of stability by using torque. Uh, so there is a balance, and it's, uh, it's difficult. It's a tricky, it's a very difficult uh, technique, I know. But my result, when I compare my result between forps and torques, and I published that in the uh, literature, were significantly higher, much higher with the torp and the stylistic bending. Because, uh, and it's interesting, it's related to the cause of failure, much more important than the success rate. When I was able to study my own failures between forps and, and torps, the main cause of failure with forps was prosthesis dislocation, and when I was using torp, the main cause of failure changed completely. It was not anymore, or very rarely, prosthesis dislocation, which means that it was really holding a prosthesis in a nice position, but too short prosthesis because I didn't make, I didn't take into account that there was the medialization of the malleus tendril. So I need, that was the big mistake at the beginning, so I know that. This is why I told you, you need to reposition the malleus, sticking back to the tympanic membrane to be sure that you will position the malleus on the right position and then you place the procedure and you cut the procedure on the right leg. And I decreased uh, the incidence of uh, failure by a uh, new uh, technique like this. So each technique has its own difficulties, but what I want to obtain with this is just flexibility. And you notice that we have a flexibility with the fact that it's moving together and also stability, of course, that's the point. And I think we increase the stability with the band. Any tricks or tips for the Nova surgeon doing this technique? Pardon? Sorry, I didn't get any, that. Any tips or tricks for the new young surgeon doing this technique? Well, I think they need to train first. It's, it's something tricky. Yeah? The malice relocation technique is easy. Um, the malice replacement procedures we may take, talk about tomorrow is easy. But uh, of course, the band is, is difficult. So, but it's like everything. You need to train. You need to train on temporal bone several times until you get the right way to do it. I just give my, my way of doing it, my feeling, my tricks. I show you what I do. But at one moment, there's, there's a necessity for all of you, all of the young surgeons, to try to do by, by themselves. And it comes with experience. You just uh, and I would say, time. Robert, it's much easier with this prosthesis than yes. it was in the old days where we cut a band yeah. Yeah. and then had our heart in our mouth trying to get it over the stapes. Prosthesis yeah. works really well. And we, had, we had cases of erosion of a stapes head at the beginning, you remember that? Because I, we had to trim ourselves the band and the band was too narrow. With this technique, the band is very, uh, it's tight, but it's very elastic too. So I, the, now the incidence of erosion is very low. Thanks very much, Robert. Oh, one more okay. question. Hey, uh, first of all, I would like to see the images of the CT scan, if possible, because I'm really I, I curious how I'm you sorry. make the diagnosis. And the second question is why you didn't prefer a PORP? <laughs> well, we, because uh, I just first to say, we, we're, we're going to cover PORPs tomorrow because Chris has a diametrically opposed view to Robert, okay. as you've probably okay. gathered, the faculty all disagree on everything. Um, so we will be discussing that. John, tomorrow. John, give me one minute. Give me one minute. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the CT scan, I don't have it, unfortunately. But I, I, on the CT scan, what you could see is that you have uh, the uh, Mali set, which was in close contact to the uh, epitympanic wall. And there was uh, already a fixation that you could see on the CT scan. And the second thing, I, I did the publication. I was using Forbes for many, many years. In this situation, in every case, I had an erosion increase, missing increase, I would say. But I was, as I said, disappointed by some cases of recurrent dislocation of the, of the port. So I just wanted to find a way to improve that. And there was a guy, B. Moret, who is part of our friend and, and faculty, who was one of the first to say we should use torps instead of forps to get better results and better stability. So I was interested with this point, and I started doing it especially when I was uh, introducing the technique of stylistic band. And I was able to compare two groups, a big one, 200 on one side or 400 on one side and 600 on the other side, I don't remember. It was a big group, it published on autology and autology. So you could see both groups and my, my results, but I don't say it's the best technique, I just say my results. 
and you ask me why I changed. So, so it's my personal position. I changed because my results with Ford were significantly lower than with Tort plus Silasic. There was a great difference. I show you tomorrow. So this, for these reasons, I keep going on with Ford. Well, that's a good okay, point. thank you very much, Robert. A good point for we'll, uh, We can talk about that tomorrow yeah, yeah, yeah. and maybe have a drink okay. this evening. Bye. Maybe. Okay, John. Um, for this part, uh, you need to be active because this is an active session. You've been laying down uh, too much in the chair and uh, have with your eyes closed. So uh, we really would like to know your experience and your opinion about this. Um, uh, counseling your patient before the surgery. And, and I think a major issue on this surgery, of course, it's all elective surgery. So the patient needs to be well informed to be able to um, have make an informed decision. Uh, from a legal standpoint of view, these are the points that officially should be included into in an informed consent. Uh, of course, a, a good explanation of the disease itself, but also the potential uh, uh, prognosis of future consequences, etc. And um, in the France, it's uh, obligatory as well to uh, inform the patient and to inform the alternatives and the potential risks. So what risks do you cancel with uh, stable surgery? John, I'll ask you first. Or oh, Chris, can you stand up? Can you stand up and talk? Yes, please, use the microphone. One of the problems in the NHS, I'm sure those who work in the NHS, is time. And there isn't time to do a stapes consultation during a general clinic. Okay. Uh, so they have two consultations. This is not the right answer. No, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> they have two consultations. So we have a sit down to begin with for maybe 15, 20 minutes, which is the maximum you can allow in an NHS consultation. Uh, usually I've got some videos prepared that are a lot shorter than those ones I showed you this morning. So I can show them what the condition is and we talk about it and I normally suggest, if they've got a conductive hearing loss, that we have a trial of a hearing aid first. I give them some links so they can go and look at the surgery, YouTube links and the names of several surgeons. And I'm not prejudiced, I'm happy to give the names of competitors. Really? And then I bring them back. That's not how we know you. Yeah, yeah. Oh. In the NHS, that's <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> then I bring them back after yeah. they've had three or four weeks okay. to think about it. Anybody in the pub public? In the audience, what kind of informed consent do you do? Informed consent? But wh what does it consist of? Uh, uh, comp 101% uh, complete deafness and facial nerve paralysis. Uh, that's it. It's like written in everywhere. That's why I'm that's giving that. It's, it's generic. generic. Yeah. Okay. So it's not informed consent. <laughs> well, uh, I got you. Well, you're right, but nobody, uh, not many have series that are big enough. Yeah, okay. Well, we know you. Yeah, okay. So, um, so what, what, Chris? You're in private practice. Uh, yeah. So I was interested. You said something about facial nerve paralysis. But what what incidents do you give them of that? Just out of interest. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Some stapy surgery. So I I give I say because I do have big figures, so I can give them my figures. So I say they have a one in two hundred chance of losing their hearing. Um, that's a similar incidence for increase in tinnitus. How much? Similar one in two hundred that actually tinnitus. Get, yes, not that get tinnitus. So the the figures with tinnitus is that if you get a good hearing result two-thirds of them improve, and a third of them get no difference, and probably about one in 200 get a significant increase. Um, taste, a third of them get alteration in taste, but usually it's transitory. It usually lasts about four to six weeks. Dizziness is actually surprisingly uncommon now with stroke or with a stapedotomy in a vein graft. But I do warn them about that. That'll facial nerve palsy, I t to be honest, I don't actually mention it, but I think the figures are probably of the order of, you can get this sort of temporary delayed facial palsy this sort of thing that we don't really understand. But actually, from the surgery, it should be remarkably low, I think, because, you know, as you can see, we see the facial. John, John or, uh, Chris, very interesting. 
so you say 30 percent gets uh, taste, uh, taste yeah and they do how much re uh, of them remain with taste disturbance i have one patient that kept on yeah well i mean they, they they definitely do get persistent taste disturbance so it's really important to speak to them about what they do so i've been involved in a a, a case not of my own but of a patient who was a a manager of a national chain of restaurants who was not told about in England. In England. Oh, it and it had taste disturbance and he was never told about it. So that's unforgivable. So you've got to tell them that. But the majority of them, it does get better. What's interesting here is, uh, and w when you speak to quite a lot of surgeons, I mean, I n never deliberately cut the, the nerve, but quite a lot of people do. When I was training, I was told it's much better to cut it than to stretch it. And there's a big debate of, amongst people. I, I don't buy that, but I think some people have got quite a low threshold for cutting it. And surprisingly, in France, it seems relatively low, and you'd have thought taste was important here, but maybe post-COVID nobody cares thing is, anymore. The other thing is if they get a good hearing result and a taste disturbance, they don't ah. mind. If they get a bad hearing result and a taste disturbance, they immediately become a wine taster or something, and it's a disaster. Adrian, but, do you want to share your experience? patients do get that persists. And out of my series, there were three patients who had persistent taste problems for years. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of patients out of 13, 1400, but it's still a big ha okay. handicap for them. Um, I, you just alluded to this, um, Mr. Aldrin. Do, do you do anything about the taste disturbance? Do you get the patients to do anything? How do they manage it if they have taste disturbance? Uh, I don't, because most of them get better, and I think long term, I'm not sure what you do do about it. I mean, one of the, the interesting ones, I've got one at the moment, actually, inevitably, a doctor sent from elsewhere, and not for a stapes uh, operation, but for an acicular plasty, and you'll see tomorrow, I use the Dresden Kurtz clip, which is very similar to the one that the original, Tebow actually. used. Actually, Sorry? The, the original, yeah. Yeah, the original one. Because some people find And, in, think and what happens then else. is you you put the prosthesis on top of the... Stapes, and I'll be interested to see what the panel say, is what do you do with the cord? Do you tuck it underneath, or do you put it over the top with your cartilage on top of it? And this lady's got you know, got good hearing, but she's moaning about her taste, and she's about a year post-op. I don't know what you do with that. I mean, you could go and cut it, maybe, but I, I'm not sure. What, what, uh, what do you think about that, Miguel? You must have had some you, patients you must taste have disturbance. Had yeah, but I, I, I'm not so sure cutting the cord will no. solve the problem. <laughs> uh, no, uh, absolutely. They'll emphasize more attention to it. Yeah. Doctor, what have you done? <laughs> Peop, do people put the cord between their prosthesis, their pulp and the cartilage? What do you do with that? Or do you try and take it underneath? Or? Well, it, it depends because it, uh, it uh, I put it where it naturally probably goes because it, it's, it's different uh, depending on the cases. If you can just uh, move it aside and do your secular reconstruction, then I will leave it there. If it's in the middle of the way, then I will try to put it in the more natural position where there is less tension for the corda, if I have not cut it before. But in principle, you wouldn't worry about putting it between the no. cartilage and the head of the prosthesis? Because no. I, I haven't it's, done it's, well, it's, but I, I, I don't do it, but I know some surgeons even do a prosthesis on the gorda for hearing. I've never done it bef in between. No, because and one of the prosthesis I'm using is uh, the head is um, uh, for hydroxylapathite, so I'm not using cartilage there. No. Uh, Any other opinions? Well, I was going to say that sometimes patients have a, a particular female patients, and this is not me being mis misogynistic, have oh. a, a disproportionate uh, yes. response to having a stitch in the back of their hand Chris, for the vein graft. Them now. They really don't like that because they imagine it's going to be a big scar with a big stitch and they've got nice rings and beautifully manicured hands and you have to persuade them that actually it's a tiny little mark and they're not usually going to get a lump there. They do get some irritation sometimes for a few weeks and you have to explain that. I noticed something strange that the cholesteatoma patients, they never complain about uh, taste disturbance, almost yeah. never, but they, even if you cut it, but their cord is already dead, probably. <laughs> That's I, I, don't I, know. I don't think so. I, I think so. No, I don't think so. It's been no. irritated for many years then. Well, I don't think the cord is dead at all. There's no. That's definitely true. I mean, there's a, a paper that was done in our region looking at specifically at that. And the co the cholesteatoma patients, you're absolutely right. They, they rarely complain of taste disturbance. Um, and I think it's because, for whatever reason, that, that cord has been irritated or damaged or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think when we were talking about informed consent, Particularly, well, I don't think any of you are young enough trainees here to be in trouble with it now, but I think if you've got a boss 
who's doing his AP surgery. It's one of those occasions when you probably should be having a nice chat with him and saying, would you consent this patient, sir, with your figures, or at least give me your figures? Um, because you really are supposed to quote so, the fig figures of the operating so that, surgeon. That, that, that's a good question, John. Yeah. Uh, what is your hearing outcome then? What, what do you, you tell them? Of course, uh, I w would consider you try a hearing aid. I mean, yes. it's elective surgery. Why not? That? We all love to do this yeah. surgery, but a hearing aid is an alternative. Yes. In France, not very popular, not luckily. Not popular in North America because of the cost. Uh, okay, so you say you do surgery. So what do you promise them? Uh, over 90% are going Nine, to... 90%? Over 90% are going to get good hearing. Closure of the air bone gap, I think, when we looked at it, which is actually about eight years ago, okay. is going to be... Very interesting discussion. Yeah. Closure of the air bone gap. Yeah. He's talking about the closure of the air bone yeah. gap. Okay. Closure of the air bone gap to less than 10 dB. Okay. 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 Uh, we'll get back. We'll, we'll get back to that difficult. in a minute. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I was used to use written informed consents. In France, we use them in, to some, uh, some extent as well. Does anybody else use a, a, a document that they need to sign beforehand? So, I mean, it saves a lot of patients complaining afterwards that I didn't know, doctor. Is there anybody working in a GCI uh, credited uh, institute? That's, that's an accreditation that a hospital can get, a GCI, a high ranking uh, accreditation like the universities have it. Officially, according to the GCI accreditation, it's an American institute. Huh? I mean, uh, your, your hospital gets ranked in higher ranks of safety. The patient needs to be able to repeat to the doctor all the complications. We had a macro um, in Word. And That's I would just wait a second, but I would all the patients got a copy of their letter, and I would say to the typist, my secretary, insert macro 10. And macro 10 was a paragraph. Yeah. We have discussed my results of this okay. surgery, and they are as follows. So they have oh, it, they have it, of course. Uh, like I worked in Amsterdam, we did quite a bit of tapers, they all sign, and, and I mean, it's it saves a lot of hassle afterwards of the patient not. Uh, claiming not having been told the, uh, the the risks or something. It's legal case for taste, mm -hmm. and I was able to produce the letter that ah. said there is a chance of taste disturbance. And to tell you, yeah. way. to tell you honestly, I always mention the facial nerve. Never had a facial nerve in my career, but I always tell them. I mean, that would be dreadful. But uh, of course, I think l from a legal standpoint of view, anything lower than one percent officially, we, we may not even need to need to mention. Anyway, um, so. We all talk about airbone gap closure. And the question whether is that that's uh, significant or relevant. Here, the, I compare Robert's data, but he, he'll, he'll highlight that even more. And the, from the Swedish registry, this national registration that they have. And it's interesting to see. In, in Sweden, on average, they do 12 stapedotomies per surgeon. And here, the, here they look also at the airbone gap closure, which I honestly think it's not a measure that the patient cares about. Uh, I mean, it's the air conduction, not the airborne gap closure. Uh, and you see a, a remarkable difference between the surgeries. And I think th there's definitely something to say about practicing and doing it frequently. And of course, the data of have falling within the 20 dB scale. And uh, have we talked about airborne gap, John, because that was the first thing that you said. And, uh, of course, if the airborne gap closure is like this, the patient is possibly happy, okay? But then again, if the airborne gap closure is like this, the patient is not. And your airborne gap, and your airborne gap closure, closure is still nice, uh, but there, is, uh, there has been a, a, an air conduction uh, uh, redu reduction. So I honestly think we should counsel the patient with the air conduction prognosis and not the airborne gap closure. Anyway, strangely enough, we uh, call no. John, get up. <laughs> Bill Cole, I always um, uh, inform the patient, or I try to manage the expectations by comparing the result to the contralateral ear. And I think that is uh, clear for the patient what he might expect. So I always tell him it might get for 90% in close range to your other ear, yeah. so that you are able to hear with two ears. Uh, I, I think it's a good good thing. However, if there's just a percentage lower after surgery, which is quite good, still quite a good result, the patients are not as happy. 
that's strangely enough, while the surgical result is good, the patient is not so happy. And um, I, like I told you, this, this, is, uh, this is why I think in general the abogaf closure is good for surgeons to show how big nature has given you, but it doesn't mean anything to the patient typically. But what means something to the patient is if you say to them, I expect with this degree of hearing loss, and they have to have used a hearing aid to say this, that you will be able to put your hearing away to away, away in the drawer and not use it again. Yeah. That, that not because that, not because it's not going to help you. <laughs> no, no, because the ear's dead, but because no. they've got very good hearing. No, of course, but it, 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 I mean, it's very difficult to talk in the language that the patient refers to, and not to the language that we like to say. Look at me, look at me. I'm 94% within 10 dB. Uh, I, th I think that I, th I think that's the point of when you counsel your patient. But that, it's also judging your patient, isn't it? We have a a, a full panoply of patients from the very bright uh -huh. to the not so bright. Um, uh, that's uh, and you, you have to put it in terms that that means something to them. As a doctor, you need to adapt. Yeah. Well, anyway, this was a study that we did in the past, and um, we looked at the airborne gap uh, or, or the hearing gain after surgery. And you would expect a, a, a patient uh, at a four kilohertz, it's not the American standard, it's four kilohertz. These patients were all very happy, more than 30 dB gain, which you can understand. But strangely enough, enough people still with a gain of 20 to 30 percent, there was still a percentage that was somehow not so happy. That is strange. I mean, you would expect the patient would be happy, and maybe it has to do with the symmetry yeah, between left and right, I don't know. But some patients were unhappy. And, um, and and that's quite strange. And then if you look at patients that lost some of their hearing, some of them were still happy. <laughs> no, but the, so I mean, you need to realize that. Uh, of course, the majority you 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 improved the uh, hearing. This was what we found, and it was surprising. It's published. But they say to you, doctor, you explained everything to me. I knew I was taking a risk. No, 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 it was my decision. And that I feel I did the right thing, you know. Some patients say that. These patients were just happy, and if you honestly look at the, their uh, their results, not so not so good. And maybe it has to do with the frequency distribution. But anyway, th these are the Fletcher indexes that uh, we were we looked at. So I think it it's been a, it was a very hot topic to start working with uh, PROMS, the patient related outcome me uh, outcome measures for uh, stable surgery. Is anybody using these? Does anybody know what it is? John, expi explain it to them. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, prompts are outcome measures, which are, I, I think it's probably related from the health insurance company. So they, they want happy patients and they want uh, less in, uh, invalidity, et cetera. Now, prompts, prompts. I don't think well, but the you're British insurance companies care a damn. <laughs> They want cheap this surgery. Is a, this is life. Even John. by the guys that fail, they would rather do that. Than no, worry I, about I, problems. I, I don't agree with you that. Can send that out the but but the, the thing is, we've been presenting for many years now our personal results in a way that we think, look how good my surgery is, and I think the patient is much more um, in need of re uh, outcome measures that are relevant to the patients, and maybe for uh, say uh, staple surgery is relatively limited. All other fields are, uh, in, in medicine use these indications. Eh? I mean, with uh, laryngeal cancer or orthopedics, they all use prompts to evaluate the patient according to measurements that are relevant to the patient. And uh, like you said, the airborne gap uh, closure is not so relevant to the patient. But nobody uses them yet. Well, ma maybe it's not going to come. In France, it's not going to come soon, so I will not won't be using them. But in the Netherlands, I think there, there was a hot topic with the insurance companies. Ah, yeah, that's quite ancient, yeah, as well. Uh, I think it it has its value value for many years, and it, 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 it allowed uh, allowed us to some extent compare data. But uh, it's good the question whether it's what the patient wants. But it, it's a pretty good scale. I I do, I do agree. Anyway, John, any other additions? That's you. Yes. Well, anyway, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Well, no, I don't think so. He, I think he has a presentation. Any questions?
Uh, I just want to to share my experience. You know, I, I've been operating. Can you stand up? Can stand, yeah, for sure. Um, I've been operating. You're, you're from Madrid, eh? Yeah, I'm from Madrid, Jose Carlos, and I've been operating. You know, step surgery since 15 years ago. I don't have any any problem with a patient, but this very December I have my first uh, my first patient with a dead ear, and was an infe infection after the surgery, and. After you know, when I see the patient, I realized that the the dead, the ear was dead. I was waiting one month because the patient has the idea that he's going to recover the ear, the hearing. So I asked uh, about his feelings, about what his, and he was really this uh, not disappointed, but I was more irritated because of the ear than the patient. And that was, you know, frustrating because I wanted a, a patient that was, you know, saying, okay, you don't, but I, I told him that this is a possibility. And the patient, a young patient that lose the ear and, and told me, okay, doctor, do, you told me that. I accept the risk and it's okay. So, but sometimes, you know, you are perfectionist. You want to have a patient well, say, you're, okay, you're you are you're not. You're just lucky yeah, with the patient. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, yeah. I think it's very important to say the patient, what you feel, you know, I sometimes say to my patient, I don't want to be the, the doctor that operates uh, step surgery, you know? It's very common for me that second opinion, come here and, and you are the doctor, you are going to yeah. operate me. And I don't want to be that doctor. I, I prefer to send to Miguel <laughs> on any other doctor. With, with the dead air. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I sent him because okay. For the other I don't ear. sell him a, a cochlear implant, you know? Yeah. Um, well, can you do that on one side of deafness in France, yeah, uh, in Spain? I, 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 yeah. In private, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Well, John, hold on. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious. You, you know, we when we do stapes, and you you go do the wards the the, the the moment after the surgery, maybe five hours later. What do you do if the patient is dizzy, tinnitus, and uh, doesn't look good? Smile at them. Make sure they've had on Dantrotron. <laughs> No, I, I mean, because these are the the announcements of uh, calamity, really. But it's happened to all of us. But but what what do you do? And you don't, you don't want to go back in. You're not going to find anything. And in fact, have you ever been back in? Your mic. Have you ever been back in and found it beneficial? The answer is no. Oh, wh I've why do you ask me if you no, give I'm me talking. the answer? Well, oh, the answer is no. I've been oh, back in no, two or three times, and I it thought, has never ever helped. I thought you asked me. Chris, did you, would you, have you ever? Don't listen to John. <laughs> it, it is uh, one of the slides in our talk later on. But oh, okay, basically, okay, 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 what okay. you do with the dead ear. But I mean, I think the general feeling if, uh, is that if you do enough stapy surgery, ultimately you'll get a dead ear. In my experience, I've never had a dead ear on the table. So they generally come 12, 24, 48 hours. And as Wilco says, they're often heralded by severe vertigo and complete Thank loss. And you. why that is, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I hear what you say about infection, and it certainly may be that, but the ones I've had, there's been no evidence of anything. And I've gone back and looked at the videos, and the surgery's been fine. They've, they've heard post-operatively, and you know, been delighted with that. And then suddenly they get this acute event. And the first one, I was, fortunately, I'd done about a couple of hundred before I got a dead ear. And, you know, I was thinking, oh, well, I'll never get a dead ear. I'm just so great. Uh, and then it is devastating, as you say, if it's really bad for you as a surgeon. I think if you share that with your patient, that they see that you're really upset, that that's an empathy that they would get. And I, I did go back and look in that, and it, it just looked absolutely fine. There was nothing to see, no granuloma, nothing, no infection. It looked perfect. So I've no idea why. Well, well, you, and you found a friend, which was me, and I, I thought yeah. you were never going to get one. Yeah. But I said, you know, we're all going to get one eventually. You know, just, yeah. So I don't think there's much evidence. But interestingly, at this meeting, uh, you'll see Thomas Lennertz, who I think is coming tomorrow. And he says that in Germany, if you have a dead ear post-op, you have to go back and take the prosthesis out. Well, and he said that he said that he's seen people recover from that, which I find oh, hard I to believe. That. But he the, said that. The, the question is, if you say dead air, I, th I think we should talk about a patient with tinnitus increase, dizziness, and when you do a bone conduction, you see there's a drop in hearing. No, well, we're talking about nothing. Well, you know, complete loss, and it's this acute event that is there's something devastating on it. It's either a bleed or a leak, or it may well be an infection. Yeah. We don't really know. But suddenly, from being absolutely fine, bang, they get incredibly dizzy and lose their hair. And it's how you respond to the patient as well. I mean, these guys, we, you know, we joke about it, but there was an incident fairly early in my career 
with a new laser and a new nurse and she tripped over the laser fiber and I was blinded and the patient had a complete facial palsy for 11 months. And I sent her to my best friend, the neurophysiologist, who wrote back to myself, copy to the patient and the GP saying, there isn't a hope in hell of this woman's facial nerve ever working again. And she was great. She said, you've done everything you could, doctor. I realized this was an accident. You were with me by my bedside when I came round. And 11 months later, her face started moving, almost a complete recovery, and she had the other ear done. Had I not gone to the bedside and admitted it and stood with her and held her hand, it would have been a big medical legal case. But if something goes wrong, deal with it on the same day. Don't, you're gonna be, you're gonna be absolutely terrified and depressed. But it's ten times worse for the patient. What? Okay. Oh, we we work. I just wondered from your collective experience, which is obviously not very many dead ears, but is there? Do you think there are any surgical factors that might predispose to that? Whether it's a fractured foot plate or um, an open vestibule, or you know. I've watched some of my colleagues trying to put prostheses in. I've seen a prosthesis put in upside oh, down. Point. You know, and you wonder what's happening in the vestibule. So you know. I think heavy-handedness okay. is probably. I, 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 there's somebody I'm discussing at the moment who had a six-millimeter prosthesis put in. I think that's a, a tad on the long side, and they're saying, "Why am I dizzy?" And you've got to be very careful what you say. Well, in in those cases, it makes sense to remove it. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and do a scan before. Uh, I have one question. Uh, we can take a break, and of course, we we will take a break, but. Uh, we have arranged always, because you, you never know with COVID, a backup patient. We can, instead of some presentation, we can do another live surgery by Robert. Does anybody, is anybody able to stand another surgery or do we do something else? Who, who wants another surgery? Another? What is it? An ear. <laughs> What's it? P primary stapes, I think. Um. <laughs> I, I have one question. Okay, we have a question here. Yeah, about allergic reactions to prothesis, because I had one problem, and I would like to know if someone has... Is it nitinol? Nit yeah. Uh, nitinol is nickel. You can get nickel allergy with nitinol. Uh, and also, I think with titanium you can as well. Yeah. I, I sometimes think that the Teflon prosthesis are less reactive. I, I used to prefer titanium. But, but now, but, pati um, now patients have read about Teflon and they think Teflon's poisonous. Teflon that's heated to 200 degrees centigrade in your frying pan is poisonous, but Teflon prosthesis in the ear yeah. aren't. It's very yeah. difficult to explain that to a patient. Yes, British patient. Yeah. A big problem with the Nitiflex yeah. uh, prothesis. That's nickel. That's nickel. That was a, a, a yeah. tremendous, really. Uh, so I made yeah, a revision uh, after five days, put a titan, <laughs> and it was okay. okay. But the patient was Just so give me a call. ugly Just condition. Yeah. So, ah, uh, because, because the yeah. company yeah. told me no. It's That's better. good. Uh, so okay. once sorry, I, I had a patient where after a perfect surgery with a Teflon coast prosthesis, had earache, unexplainable, and it really, uh, yeah, it, well. I took the prosthesis out and put it on the arm to see what happened. And after three days, she had redness of the arm. So I thought it, it's, a, it's a Teflon allergy. So I, I put in a, a titanium prosthesis. No problem. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so not, I think there is crazy. allergies for all kinds of bad material. Nah. And you should bear in mind that it can happen. People with perfect surgery, but it's sort of aching in the ear. You can't explain. Now, uh, Adrian, I, I've seen that with, say, a cochlear implant, with silicon even, that the patient had an ulcus underneath as a reaction to the silicon. It's very strange, very inert, but some people react. Yeah. So a, a good tip, because sometimes pain, I've had that, uh, taking the procedures out, if the pain is severe, makes sense. Yeah. Less pain if they don't have an ear. Well, it's, an, it's pain in the middle here, John. Uh, so it was just a comment about that nice and old um, allergy. Um, we had a patient recently for a, a SAPI surgery who was listed as a nickel allergy. We were going to use a titanium pros uh, prosthesis at any point, but then we started actually checking the literature to find out what is the, the situation. 
And actually, there's a load of evidence that's come out from cardiovascular stuff about nitinol that you don't need to test preoperatively for nickel allergy, that actually nitinol, true nitinol allergy, is vanishingly rare. Um, obviously, when it happens, if it's in a cardiac prosthesis or in it, something like that, it's a, a disaster. But actually, it, within ear surgery, it's, it's not commonly reported. And actually, again, it's, it's, va it's pretty rare in the literature. We probably ought to have the definition. We, we, we said one percent. I think one percent's wrong. Of what? I, I think when you're quoting to a, of what? Of anything. When you're quoting to a patient now, yeah. um, a complication. I, I've got a feeling it's one in a hundred thousand, isn't it? Not one in. Uh, no, it's it's got it's purely to do with what the consequences of that complication is for that patient. So in the UK, yeah. they've yeah. changed the law. And so facial nerve palsy, I mean, I discuss it with everything. I don't normally discuss it with state research, I have to say, but yeah. anything with a drill, you know, I, I always discuss that. Yeah. But you could argue that, you know, it definitely it's one in 10,000. Try your hearing aids. It's a major, major <laughs> yeah. thing. Okay. I, th I think we're going to have a break now, John. Yeah. Because uh, you look tired. <laughs> uh, but we'll be back after the break um, uh, to do surgery. Yeah. I do have just one thing that I say to the... Yeah, he never stopped. They're not very clever <laughs> patients. And they say, oh, 1%, doctor, that's pretty good. I'll take a chance on that. And I said, right, OK, I'm going to put a blindfold on you. And there's the auto route outside the hospital. There's 1 million euros the other side. There's a 1% chance that you'll die walking across the auto route to get the money. Would you do it? give them something that puts it into perspective for them. Because what that means not only do No, look, let's have a drink. And they're calling me for the last patient, the backup case. So I show you. Then I give my talk. All right. And then we do the, the uh, panel. And that's it. OK, so we'll push the bar. The bar the, Thanks, Joe Paul. The, 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 the car, the bus, <laughs> a little bit later. It's coming. It's coming back. <laughs>
uh, Robert, we're here. Can you um, put your audio on? Lo oh. Robert. Oui, oui, maintenant. OK, we can hear you, Robert. We can, Robert, it's a primary state. Stop, 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 stop. Hello. Where are we? See a primary stapes again. You can never see too many because um, they all vary slightly. So as you, that was a much more productive session than the last one because we all got talking. So all get talking and then Thank the you. alcohol this evening will make it easier. Oui. Oui. Stop. Il est net, lui, Alina, ou... S'il vous plaît, de lumière, s'il vous plaît. Il va nous gêner avec son oreille. <laughs> Robert. I, I think I can hear you, but I'm not sure. I, 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 think, you, I think we can hear you too. Il m'entend là? Oui, oui, oui. Hello, Robert. Par contre, euh, moi, je n'entends pas. Hein? No, but okay, we can no. hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you too. But we're, you don't see it, but you don't see anything now. We see a nice no, speculum. We can see what, it's one of your older speculums, which is much better than the new ones. So this is the left ear, and we have a 40 dB bone gap with a history of otosclerosis in the family, if I remember. And uh, right here, um, sorry, right here with the beginning of the mid hearing loss, also it's a bilateral mid hearing loss, mostly here on the left ear. The point is that we have a little bit of exostosis here on the left. Thanks, s'il vous plaît. And I'll make now the incision from 6 to 12 again, then 12 to 6, I would say. Same as before. So this is 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6, and 9 o'clock. Just at the moment of the panel discussion, we'll have a, a presentation, a short presentation by one of my, our colleagues uh, from Turkey. He has a very interesting case to discuss and to show uh, regarding a primary state operation. I just ask him to present it because it's really good. Very interesting. I never had a case like this, and I think it would be interesting to discuss this. Uh, difficulty with the uh, with the canal here because it's more deeper. It's deeper on the right, so I'll have to move a little bit my microscope also. Can elongate with this? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a tricky uh, canal, eh? <laughs> Décolleur.
Okay. I will increase the light, I think it's better, can you? Okay, so this is again the uh, mucosa. And uh, I will now elevate the, the left part of the flap. Okay, so you see this uh, exostose is embedding a little bit of you, so I will remove that first, correct? And I like to use the correct to do this. Sometimes I use the, the, the drill, but the correct, as you will see, quite efficient. I just need to reduce the size of this exostose in order to have exposure of the posterior inferior part of the middle ear cap, which is not the case here. It's a very efficient correct, and uh, it's one of the most important instruments that we have in our set, which is a cost set instrument from Integra, which is a French company originally. And the, the, that was originally was Micro France, that was the name of the company, which was then bought by uh, Medtronic. And I think it's now Integra, which is based in Nice, Sophie Antipolis. Very nice, efficient company. So you see that how it works and I like that because it doesn't make bone dust I mean you can control this bone dust which is a local one Inspiration. okay Correct, encore. So soon I will start the bony rim resection, but just want to reduce a little bit more this uh, exosome here. So it's the same thing, and trying to find the right view to be uh, safe and to have enough gap to move the instrument inside the middle ear. Because if you have the exosome like this, it's become difficult to have. The possibility to move the instrument, but now I think it's fine. Can we, s'il vous plaît? Okay, I'm happy with that. Now I need to elevate the corda. Un peu gros, ça. C'est plus gros. Oui, mais justement, il faut un plus petit. Il est trop gros. Curette, s'il vous plaît. OK, I will use the hook in a second. Allez, crochet pour le canal. The, the, the aim of this hook is to open up a little bit the canal in order to uh, be able to Elevate a little bit further the uh, uh, the chord symphony. Okay. Tête en proclive, s'il vous plaît. Okay, proclive la tête. <coughs> Okay, table vers moi maintenant. All right, so, so now I will do the bony rim resection, the regular one. The curette, with the uh, curette. Again, residual exostosis here, I will remove that. Now it's really fine. Okay. 
10 minutes of replay. I will check the, the quarter and then I will use the chisel, I think. Oh, it's really thick. Correct encore. Okay. It's coming better now. The shape of the canal is strange. Okay, try to better. I still don't see the uh, um, primer process. Crochet for the canal. I need to enlarge that a little bit more. This is the strong hook, which is really nice. Correct. Okay, it's getting better now. Okay, peut-être en procrive un peu encore, s'il vous plaît. Stop, stop vers moi. All right, I'm happy now with the exposure. Stop. So I will start now the inclusive separate joint separation <clears throat> with the joint knife. So you see the facial nerve on the right, you see the peroneal process here. And the promontory on the left. So I need to find the joint, which is right here. So I'm going to go into the joint. All right, I'm going to check now. Malice ink is first, which is fine. You see, and now the state is from the top of the head always, and it's fixed. Le laser, donc, hein? So again, we're going to use the combination of laser and muscle drill. Cut the tendon. And now we use, again, the laser to vaporize the superstructure. I will start with the posterior cruise. Uh, uh, this one is not working well. Uh, so you see, sometimes we have this problem with them, so it's not going to work. No worries. We're going to stop with the macro drill now. We have some problem with some of the fiber. I don't know. Uh, since few times now. So I'm going to drill out the posterior cruise. So I'm stabilizing the posterior cruise with my. Uh, my uh, suction tube on my left hand and I'm now drilling out the posterior cruise again just leaving the diamond dust doing the job as I said without any pressure and I think that's it I'm going to do it for the anterior cruise which is not completely hidden so it's better than the previous case I think I can see it. So again, I'm placing the sucker on the other side and just drilling out progressively without any pressure. Okay, I think it's done. All right, let's see if I can remove it for the hook.
I haven't completely separated ink from the status as you can see. Now it's done. That's a huge lentical process. <laughs> Very nice to see that. Okay, can this be prepared? So I'm going to check again now this increase. The very strange shape of the of the increase. It's very normal shape. But you see it's moving well. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to measure the distance from again foot plate to increase using this tape measuring rod. Now you see him dancing the foot plate and we are at four point five. You see the superior notch is in front of the increase. It's four point five. Okay, we, we have some residual posterior cruise, and I want to leave it because it's really thick. So I will remove it. That's why it's in bouquet. We can not to the one when I saw. Because I want, if I want to place the vein, I think it's better because I want to flatten the vein correctly. So I just want to remove that residual uh, posterior cruise. This will give me some more gap. There we go. For the two people play. Just a question of posting the foot plate. It's very bad that we don't have the laser efficient at the moment because it will, it was going to bleed, I'm sure, with the foot plate because we have some vessels there. Okay, pince. All right, let's try now to perform the statidotomy. Well, I think it's it's interesting to show you the difficulties that we can have while performing statidotomy if it's bleeding a little bit. Not yet, but I'm sure because there's a lot of vessels. So it may bleed a little bit, but that's interesting to show. I will try again the laser. I don't think it's going to work. Meter cathode. I don't think it's going to work. This is related to the fiber. Right? Uh, uh, I'm going to vaporize. That's all I can do. Uh, okay. All right. So I have a 0.7 millimeter uh, diameter suction tube and a 0.7 millimeter burr. Now I'm drilling out the foot plate. Now you see it's bleeding, of course. The safety bottom is done, but it's bleeding. And there's no way to stop it, just wait. And try not to suck into the labyrinth. It's fine. I think it's going to decrease now. Yeah, all is fine now. Okay. So now I will prepare the vein and put the vein over the safety bottom. Same as usual, this is the vein graph. Comment? 450. Tenu à la plaque, là, c'est vrai que la tendance a bougé. Ok. Okay, so I'm going to again introduce the vein with the sucker like this and then stretching the vein with the needle. Always, always the same, same way of doing it for me. Okay, that's it. All right, and now I'm going to prepare the procedure and I'm going to use a regular cost system. I think I would put that 4.75. I measured 4.5, but it was right at the end of, and underneath the uh, right a little bit underneath the lenticular, the increase, and the increase is pretty thick. So I will increase the size to 4.75. That's my equation of feeling. Okay. 
There we go. And now we'll open up the loop. Always breaking the memory. It's interesting the discussion about the allergy. Allergy can be uh, obtained with any kind of uh, materials, but in my experience, with uh, more than 6,000 cases now, uh, I think it's 6.5 or something, I never saw any uh, reaction to the testing, but it, it can exist, I know that. All right, so let's now place the shaft, the shaft first again. Okay. So what I do is I introduce the shaft first, and then the loop. Okay. Final point is to crimping the loop. with the two hooks. There we go. I think it's fine. Now we're going to look for the bending side. And it should be fine. There we go. Okay, and fine from the malice there. All right, so I just reposition the flap. So now I you give me some mi minutes to come and just prepare my, the computer which is ready and we can talk about uh, complication in state surgery. We'll forget the basic because we know now about the basics already. And we will go for a complication. I'll be there in a few minutes. Okay? What is it? Is everybody sleeping? That looks okay, good. It's good, Robert. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I thought you were sleeping with getting bored with my surgery now. <laughs> what, what a ridiculous suggestion. Just wake up everybody. He's worried he's not watching. <laughs> so, I'll be back. Huh? Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Robert, for his uh, hearing to me. Uh, I know the experience, it works uh, very well with such technique, but uh, to introduce uh, a, such a process with the easy and simple way, um, I, I want to say from my limited experience, it takes time. And it's, it's a tricky, sometimes it's not, I mean, lobing over the long process of Inca, sometimes it's coiled before you push it. Is there any tricks where you can just insert the prosthesis as easy as we can see right now with Dr. Robert? He breaks the memory. Did you I, see him? Yeah, he, he did break the memory. Yeah. And I want to say, it's, it has to be it has to be break, but sometimes it's loops before you insert it. Yeah. Pull from the finger. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a couple of tips on that. The first thing, actually, when he put it in that time, he rotated the loop over the lenticular process, and that you usually can't do that. So normally it's much easier if you do it the other way, so that the loop is facing upwards, because then you just over the long process of the incus. Um, if it does close, then if you take two hooks and open it, you'll find that it automatically, as long as it's pointing upwards, it will automatically slip over the long process. I'm not quite sure how it does it, but it always does it. Couple, Chris. Um, it's called the moment of a couple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, and then the other thing, I tend to use the same prosthesis, but I usually hold it with some crocodile forceps. And if you hold it just behind the apex of the loop, so you just round the back, but in the same um, same axis, so the axis of your crocs are in the axis of the prosthesis. It's very easy to put it straight in and just push it forwards. And as long as you've opened it up, it really goes, it's pretty easy to do that. It's a bit like putting a grommet in. So those those things may help a bit. And also doing six and a half thousand helps a bit, I think.
I'll do uh, anything else while we're waiting for Robert, so we're all happy just to sit and gaze.
Okay, so um, is it? No, it's okay. All right. So I will give uh, just a, a talk on um, uh, complication in in uh, stapy surgery. So I, I I will forget now the basics because I will basically you have seen it. So we need to go to difficult case, uh, including obliterative. Okay, malus ankylosis, etc., etc. So I'm going to go through the uh, different techniques that I'm using. And again, as I said, and that was also the object of a question about why do you use TORPS and not PORPS. It's because I feel myself that I, I, I'm more confident in my results with TORPS. It doesn't mean that you should move to TORPS. It's just you you find your best way to do it and then you apply it. That's what I what I'm saying. So um, I was talking about. The, the uh, bending side, which is a very easy uh, way to determine whether or not your process is on the right length, because sometimes you, you are happy with and then you check it, it's, it's not going to work. So, for example, in this case, you put the process on the right place, everything looks fine. And uh, uh, crimping it now like this, and then uh, and you will see that, in fact, this process was too short because by doing the bending sign, uh, remember that the piston should bend but not move. And as you will see, the, the, the piston will move completely away from the other window in this case. So it's it definitely, this one is too short. Well, on the other side, when I replace the process, because I, I determined it was too short, so I removed the previous process and, and I put a longer one. And then you will see that uh, the bending sign comes fine, uh, closing again, and then the, uh, the bending sign is going to come. It's a very uh, simple uh, thing to know. That the process is on the right side and on the right length. Uh, so uh, we talk a little bit about the uh, setup because I think you have to understand uh, how to use it, and especially the uh, micro drill. Just a way to remember that you have to drill out the state. It all means a nice way. Take your time, do it very gently. Low speed drill. Low speed drill, if you use that. Whatever you use of for, for drill. So this is the position. You've seen that, the position of a speculum with the speculum holder. My nurse is right in front of me. She can give me the, the instrument and I just stabilize my finger with the speculum. And that's because it gives you a kind of platform. And again, with the speculum holder, with the plate underneath, you've seen that. And this is just to focus on the position of the finger. You see my three fingers are stabilized on, 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 the, on the plate, I would say, which give me only the use of those two uh, to move the instrument up and down and to rotate. That's definitely a nice position. And if in, even if you don't have a speculum holder, I think you try to find a way to fix in some way your speculum and then use the platform of the speculum to find the stability of your finger. It's all that tricks that come with experience, but we are here to give you our experience that we have. Um, so now we go through uh, complication, which is the most interesting part of the subject. And again, uh, I talk about uh, different difficult situation we may encounter. I'm not talking about complication post -op. I'm talking about perioperative complication. So the first one would be uh, this uh, problem of obliterative fluid. You know the definition. It's a huge otoscopic focus covering completely the, the other window, which sometimes can fully block the other window up to the level of the fascia nerve and it could be really difficult to deal with. Uh, I'm not going to do, go into details but uh, we have two types of uh, obliterative case. One is a soft which is the major case and in that case it's fine. It, you have a specific technique to drill with but when you have a very strong otosclerosis like, like bone which is very rare uh, this is completely different because I have one case uh, that I did, I remember. I had a. It was a long-term, uh, uh, long-term. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> it's my daughter, so I <laughs> up. So and and then uh, when I drilled out this, I had the feeling that it was extremely strong, like 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 stone, and I could feel the the burning or something like that, and I was happy in terms of final aspect of the of, of the case but I had a complete dead ear post-op so I know that now if I f if I found again a case like this 
uh, I would be very cautious about making the right decision to stop to abort surgery or not, but it's very rare, but it's something that you can have in your mind. Um, so these are the, the numbers that I had in my series. So s more than 6,500 cases, and uh, that's an important number. The incidence was 2.5% on my oval series. But if you look to my pediatric case, only 47K, which is very rare, the incidence rising up 20%. So it means that if you are intending to do stapy surgery on a young child, there is a higher risk of facing obliterative case, which may uh, make the, the surgery more complex. And you have to remember that, that's interesting. And it's definitely autosclerosis. I know that some surgeons say, Autosclerosis does not exist with children. It does. It's very rare, but it does. Uh, so what I do, as you will see, same technique, but it specifically uh, two things. One is the way of drilling out the autosclerotic pocus, and the other way is to measure. So I will perform stapedotomy, but not the straightforward stapedotomy. I will enlarge progressively the drilling out procedure to flatten progressively the foot plate to make it thinner uh, until I find the blue line, which is the perilymphatic membrane, and then, only then, I will perform stapedotomy. Because if you try to perform a straightforward stapedotomy through a very thick foot plate, there is high risk of dislocating the foot plate, and having a floating foot plate with such a thick one could be a real issue. So it's, it's better to do it, I think, like this. So the first point, as usual, is to remove the superstructure. Once you have removed the superstructure, I can uh, accelerate a little bit the movie because we, we have seen that before. So we start with this. So you can see now the way I'm drilling, completely different than the, the, the way you show with my life surgery. I'm not performing straightforward, but just progressively leaving the diamond dust doing the job by itself without any pressure. And then also one point, I cannot show you this, but I, I use saline solution and I stop every 20 seconds, something like that, and I put the, 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 the drill in saline solution to refresh the, the burr uh, in order to decrease the risk of heating the lamarin. So because if you do it too strongly and in one, one time, there's high risk of heating the lamarin. And you see again progressively like this, and you see the way I'm moving the, 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 the drill to really flatten the whole foot plate. Um, and it takes time, but I mean, it, it doesn't matter if it takes half an hour more or even one hour more. We have plenty of time, but the, the point is that uh, if avoiding floating foot plate in this case and not creating uh, heating of the labyrinth. So do it step by step, very gently with the suction tube. And then the second point is to measure only at the end of the procedure, because we need to take into account the thickness of the foot plate. So if we measure at the beginning and we cut it, we, it's going to be too short because sometimes you have more than 0.5 percent, 0.5 millimeter difference. So it's important to remember that. And again, you remember I, I was insisting on that point, the way of placing the sucker, which is always close to the stapedotomy, but not at the level, just not into the labyrinth. Sucking into the labyrinth uh, would lead to a dry labyrinth, which is really bad. It's associated with uh, sensory hearing loss um, in most of the cases. So li like this. And then at the end, it will be the same. I will put the, the vein graph, but I will measure again, and I will put a, a probably a longer, uh, I will find a longer length, and then uh, I will put the longer prosthesis than what I thought. Uh, the second thing is the um, deicent facial nerve. We, have, we talked a little bit about that this morning because I had the case which was deicent, not very much, but you can really find deicent, uh, severe deicent of the facial nerve. So, uh, I use this prosthesis, you remember that? Uh, let me come back to the beginning. It's always the wrong position of the, of the video, but it's too late. Anyway, so I use this prosthesis with a hollow head. Again, when you are facing a, um, a, a decent facial nerve, it's very narrow. Once you remove the superstructure, once you find a way to remove safely the superstructure, you increase the view, and then you have a better access to the foot plate. So it's frightening in the beginning. You, you see, when you start the process, uh, you see such a, a decent facial nerve, but then you get a better gap. And then the way, uh, the fact that I choose this prosthesis, and I, I knew that some people who were online this morning were asking, they, they, don't, uh, they did not understand exactly why I was using this prosthesis. It's because if you put a, 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 a regular piston, then the loop will be there and the shaft will come here and will be come in contact with the facial nerve, which I think it doesn't create any problem. There will be a nice case from Turkey, which is not a Teflon prosthesis, 
we definitely don't have this problem. But if you use a bucket prosthesis, then the shaft is at a certain distance from the fascia nerve. So that's, I think, it's a really interesting uh, prosthesis. And of course, if you can put the wire loop over the incus, it's fine. But it's again, it's not necessary. It, had, it, it, it happened to me that I didn't have to possibly to put it like in this morning. Many cases, I didn't create any dislocation. Now, the other problem will be the uh, simultaneous malice ankylosis. Again, uh, if you look to my uh, general series, it's very rare. I'm talking about simultaneous and not same as the, the case you saw before, which is only epitempanic malis ankylosis. So the incidence was 0.4% in my series. So very, very rare. But in my children, 4%. So again, you need to be an experienced surgeon before trying to do stapy surgery on a young child because also there is a concept, a uh, chapter on congenital malformation. There's a lot of traps when you do stapy surgery on a young child. So it's very important to remember that. Um, so, of course, I will do the malleus to stapedotomy procedure we were talking this morning together with Miguel, uh, which is a, a, a nice procedure. Um, I don't know, did you show that, John, this morning? Or? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey? Oh. Yes or no? <laughs> because it's just the, the way to make a, a difference in diagnosis. It's an old one, but it works. So making the right diagnosis is always the it's the most important problem. This is why we always, uh, as John said, separate anchors from stapes prior taking the second chain mobility. It's all about life. Hmm? Excuse me, madam. This might do the trick. Oh. At Caltex, our staff will do whatever they can. Thank you so much. You're welcome. To help make your life a little easier. Well, if he needs a hip replacement, so the, the, making a good diagnosis Cut. is always important. Nice. We have seen this video since now, more than 22 years. <laughs> you still know it. <laughs> Caltex doesn't exist anymore. Oh, okay. All right. Um, but it's fun. I mean, I like it. So uh, this is the case of, of a very nice uh, anterior focus, and you will see uh, a very strongly epitempanic malice ankylosis. So uh, once you do this, you can definitely see both together, uh, malice ankylosis and stapes ankylosis. But if you do not separate, what's happening is that uh, in many of cases of uh, epitempanic malice ankylosis, you have a lever effect of the malice, which is fixed. So pushing a little bit of the step is down, that has been described. It's not me. Eh? I, f I found in literature to explain the mechanics of the, uh, of the problem. And then it's pushing a little bit of the step is down, so decreasing the mobility of the step is. So it gives you a false, a wrong impression of step is fixation. So if you don't care about that, you are going to remove the superstructure and then you find a mobile foot plate with a fixed malleus, which makes the surgery more tricky. So I will do the malice relocation technique. So this is the right here. You have seen that this morning. But uh, so we're going to pass. Uh, yes. Yeah. You you can do it. D to be honest, yes, you can do it. But I think there is a slight tendency to see the malice a little bit uh, coming back anterior, not as much as before. But to be honest, I've done that when the, I, I do revision and the previous surgeon has removed the head of the malleus, I, 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 co I, I keep the uh, uh, tense tympani intact, I, I s uh, separate the malleus from the tympanic membrane, and then you pull, and then you can rotate. And then it's, it's, it's not bad, to be honest. Eh? And then, so let's go now to the second part of the surgery, So because this you have seen that several times. So I remove the superstructure, do the malice relocation technique, removing the incus and then enlarging the uh, the gap, the bony room resection, and then again placing the circle. Remember that that's important because if I don't do that, when you pull, you can really dislocate a lot and you can get a loose malice, which is not good. So any, you, by putting the circle on the other side, you can control that. And again, it's always the same thing to try to find uh, finally a vertical position of the of the prosthesis, whatever you use. And if you use a mobile foot plate, a mobile stapes, then you use a porp. It's the same concept. Then at the end, you're going to have a vertical position of the porp. So it's the same thing. 
so again, this is will be followed by stapedotomy. Again, you can see that I'm sticking back the tympanic membrane to the malleus. And uh, I will perform the stapedotomy. Now I'm measuring now the distance. And again, if you do not relocate the malleus, you will have a malleus which will be anterior. So it's becoming really difficult to measure. In the past, we we're using with Jean Bernard, we we're using pre cut piston a different length, but we cannot use that anymore. So if you relocate the malleus, then you can measure in a vertical plane, which makes me things more easy. So that was the one of the previous uh, laser that I was using. It's a KTP laser, and um, so making a rosette, and uh, perform uh, followed by a uh, micro drill, as you said, as you saw this one. This is the same technique, and th the difference will be, of course, the use of a prosthesis, which will be a torp. So the torp is always the same with the vein graft. When we say vein graft, it's clearly uh, debatable whether we're going to use a, a, an interposition when we do primary surgery with the incus to stapedotomy procedure. I understand the concept of not doing any interposition. I fully agree. But if you use a torp, you need to find something, as we discussed, to avoid protrusion of the prosthesis within the labyrinth. And the fact that you put something between the labyrinth and the prosthesis decreases this risk, I think. Um, and I have cases of patients uh, scuba diving after the fact that I tend not to do it. They did it and they didn't have any problem, maybe because the vein is protecting. I think so, but I'm not sure. But anyway, with the top, you need to put something, and I prefer the vein, as I said, rather than other material because it's uh, more... Um, oh, yeah, it's most... Yeah, let's go back to this. I just make a mistake with the, with the video. So let's go to this position of the torp. There and there, and then the vein. Okay, this is the prosthesis where John helped me to design that with a hydroxylapatite head and a central groove. You see, you see the groove is in the middle, middle of the, in the center of the head, to accommodate the technique of malleus relocation, and it has a 0.4 millimeter diameter Teflon shaft. Very easy. You cut the prosthesis that are at the corresponding length, and then you place it just like a regular piston. And because you have relocated the malleus, it becomes very easy to place the malleus within the groove. Although if you do not re relocate the malleus, you have to adapt to anterior malleus, so you have to bend the prosthesis, and you cannot find a nice vertical position of a prosthesis. So again, I use, you notice that I'm using this sucker to introduce the prosthesis from the top of the head. The shaft is introduced first within the stapedotomy, and then uh, placing the uh, malleus within the groove. And in, in, w in this type of reconstruction, I, I look for the round window. I'm not looking for the round window for incus to stapedotomy procedure, but with torps, I always use uh, look for the round window. And that's it. It needs to fit well. And you, you see this groove is deep enough to receive completely the malleus handle here. With the previous prosthesis we were using, I used to drill a little bit the to drill out a little bit the groove itself to make it deeper. This is why when we design this prosthesis with uh, Grace Medical, I ask at the beginning to make a deeper groove. All right. Uh, so again, th that's going to be different with the malleus ankylosis. Again, now the perinfatic uh, gusher or floating foot plate. Uh, it's interesting because it can happen to I even to an experienced surgeon. While you drill out the foot plate, you can dislocate the foot plate and it can, it can float. And then in that case, my, my advice would be not to try to remove the foot plate because it's floating and there's a risk to dislocate completely the foot plate going down into the labyrinth and then big risk of dizziness and, and central hearing loss. My opinion is that if it's floating, you just leave the floating foot plate alone, cover it with something, vein graft, to avoid fluid leakage, and then put the prosthesis from the incus to the mobile foot plate, just like you would do it for a mobile foot plate. And then it works fine. There's no risk. The only thing is that it can refix again in the future, which is not always true, but it happens. And then in that case, you can come back and perform stay epidermy safely on a fixed foot plane. Um, so for example, I always illustrate what I'm saying with, the, with this case. Not this one, the, the, the next one. This one is interesting. This is a traumatic, traumatic dislocation of the stapes superstructure. So it's not the same concept of autosclerosis. 
But I'm showing this because in that case, you do middle exploration for a patient coming to see you for trauma. You're going to find a mobile foot plate with a dislocated superstructure. It's just like a floating foot plate. And in that case, nobody will think with will uh, ever any uh, anybody uh, will ever nobody will ever think about p uh, uh, performing a stapedolomy in this case. That's the same concept. So I would apply the same thing. I would do incus to foot plate uh, reconstruction. The only thing is more difficult because when you do a stapedolomy. You can put a little bit of a shaft inside the stapedolomy, so it's not complex to find the right length. But if you cannot do that, if you put a, the, on a mobile foot plate, it needs to be a very accurate length, otherwise it doesn't work. If it's too long, it will fix the foot plate and it's not working. If it's too short, of course it's not. So it needs to be very precise. And you will see that at the end, if you put the, the piston which has been measured, uh, then you put it on uh, like this. I use the 0.4 millimeter Teflon shaft. And you see the shaft now is in contact with the foot plate. I always try to, to look at the foot plate, the shape of the foot plate. And sometimes it's very freaking to find a kind of, uh, um, I don't know how to say that, a dip in, in some part of the foot plate. And then you can put the shaft inside this dip, which will help you to stabilize. It's not always easy, but that's, that's it. Well, perinephatic gusher, what I would do with the gusher. Uh, when we talk about gusher, the real gusher is very impressive. I'm talking about for to young surgeon because it will happen to you once. It's one per 1,000. And it's always very stressful because you, once you do a stay epidolomy, I remember at the beginning, it's like you have a feeling that the whole fluid of the patient is coming out. It's just increasing. It's just up to the, to the speculum. It's a lot of stress. What should I say to you with my experience is that you don't have to stress. There's no risk. There's no specific risk. The risk will come if you stress. If you do not stress, if you take your time, everything will be fine. These type of ears are not more fragile. I would probably think that really resistant. The only thing is you have to decrease your stress, take your time, uh, talk to your nurse. While you decrease, you have to suck the fluid because it's coming up and you have to control that. And once you are ready, even if you wait half an hour, it's not a problem. One, once you are ready, you need to be ready to do it very fast. You need to put the vein. The vein is important then to stabilize. Put the vein, put the prosthesis, cream the prosthesis, and that is fine. You have the first step. If it doesn't work, then you remove everything and you try again, unless you can, you can do it, until you can do it. Even when you do that, you have some fluid leakage, because if it's a real gusher, the vein will be pushed like this. So you have to find a way to control that. There are types of things like lumbar puncture and things like that, position of the patient. But what I do, as you will see, I fill completely the upper window with gel foam. The aim is to hold the vein down to control the position of the vein. So what I'm going to show you is not a real gusher. It's just a little bit of a pressure. But fortunately, I didn't have a gusher for a while, so I cannot show you a real gusher. But that's the same thing. This is the feeling of the... If it's a real gusher, you have to do it faster than this. But uh, that's the same thing. This is not a gusher, high pressure. So I will put the, the, the vein and the prosthesis. And you see it's quite a bit of a pressure. And uh, so I will put the vein and the prosthesis like this. And uh, I will now fill completely the over window with gel foam. So I'm starting with small pieces of gel foam and I really pack the over window until I reach the level of a facial nerve. And then if you do this, even if it's a real gusher, you will decrease 80% of the full leakage. So it will calm down <laughs> and then it will be fine. And uh, I mean, the results are good with this, with this type of uh, um, uh, problem. So again, this is the same. So we, you saw that this morning. I think. Don't remember. Well, it's something because if something is resisting to your technique when you do stapy surgery, and this will be my, the end of my presentation, if you have something resisting, something unusual, don't try to fight. Just think that there's something wrong somewhere and you have to find the key. It's not always easy because you want to go and see your patient, your wife, your, I don't know, drink something. I, you have to wait. You have to find the key point. And that's something all in this 
very teeny details that this type of surgery is very, 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 very nice. It's because it's always different that you can find some lot of fun funny times with this, whatever technique you use. Uh, so I'm going to show you a few things and we'll, we'll not cover this subject, which is a completely different subject, some part of congenital malformation. This is an interesting presentation. Because sometimes, even on the CT scan, you could not, could not see it. If the CT scan is not perfect, you, 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 can, you can pass, uh, uh, you can, you can uh, avoid that. Each time you see that kind of thing, which is two things. Stapes superstructure is not connected to the full plate, first one. And the second one, the full plate is extremely thick. Each time I saw that, there is a problem with the facial nerve, like in this case. It's a left ear, and you will see that the facial nerve is running on the promontory on the other side. It's abnormal root of the facial nerve, probably duplicated, of course. It's probably part of this in the uh, fallopian canal. But I mean, if you don't take into account this thing, then you can have problems with the facial nerve. So this is, you have, you have identified at the beginning a problem of the presentation. Something wrong with the superstructure, something wrong with the foot plate. There is a trap somewhere. You have to find the trap. In this case, you remove the superstructure, you perform stapedol, and you put a prosthesis. But that's not the subject. The subject is to remind you that each time you see something like that, like another one, see the facial nerve. It's easy to see the facial nerve here because you can see it. But I just show you because it's the same thing. The superstructure is not connected to the full plate. Uh, you see that again. Oh, the question will be, <laughs> can you do something in this case? Yes, because there is a gap here. So once you remove or not the superstructure, it's not mandatory. It's not when you can leave it sometimes. If the gap is, is good enough, then you can perform stay epidotomy here. It's yeah. only when you have a facial nerve running completely over the round, over the over window, covering completely the over window that, of course, we have to abort. But in many, many cases, we can do it. But the point, I wanted to show you this because there are traps. Again, we can talk about... Uh, Artery. And again, this is not the subject, so we're going to pass, but just a nice picture of that. And again, we can do stapedolomy here because after having removed the superstructure, it's always the same thing. You find a gap here, you know that there's a gap will be uh, fine after having removed the superstructure. But remember, do not try to coagulate these vessels because it's a drama. You can have a central nearing loss, you have a fascia palsy, so just keep it intact. Um, and finally, I always finish with this one because I think it's a very nice one. This patient came to see me. She was uh, something like 50, if I remember. She had a progressive mixed hearing loss on the right ear and without dating, just without nothing. So uh, at that time, we didn't ask for a CT scan. It was a long time ago. And uh, so we decided to do middle ear exploration. I was thinking that we're going to find uh, autosclerosis because she, she was fully uh, in this play, uh, plan. Uh, and I found this, a very a huge tapetal artery passing through the, uh, you, you can see stapes superstructure from the promontory to the fallopian canal. And uh, when you will see, when I tried to separate the increase from the stapes, I found not a complete uh, malice fixation, but a real decrease of malice mobility. So let's go to see that. So you see, we have a stapetal art uh, carotid artery there connected to the malice handle. I'm sorry, I just missed that, the previous, uh, but you can see the carotid artery, which is fixing the malice. So we decided to remove the carotid artery. <laughs> no, we don't do that. Okay, just to end, pr be preventive. I just want to put this last few slides. Just to give a message of being preventive, we know that. So each time we find something complicated, be careful with that. Each time you think you cannot do it, it's fine to say, I'm going to stop and I'm going to refer the patient to another one. I see many cases where the, the previous surgeon either tried to do it and have complication or say, the other thing is, I, I can't do it, but he could say, but other pe people could try to do it. But sometimes they say, no, there's no possibility to do it. Nothing, nobody can do that for you. So, I mean, it's try to be humble because uh, we need to be humble with this type of surgery. We all have traps, we all have failures, I have failures, I have complications. You, So, you know, you have to remember that accepting our failures 
be able to speak about our failures, sharing, sharing failures, which is very complex with the British people because they don't understand that. But 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 it's a could it could be a nice debate anyway, and I think it's important. So being preventive. Being preventive. And by Fun. the way, Sexy. it's interesting because the, the British, you know, there's a long history of uh, fights between British and French, a long time ago. And But they learn something about us, that's true. I'm going to show you something. They, they, they learn and they adapt. When you feel the first symptoms of a cold, use Vicks First Defense. It's a new microgel that attacks the cold virus where it starts at the back of the nose before it has a chance to spread and develop. <laughs> ah. New Vicks first defense works. Attack is the best form. Ah, the of women defense. are better than the men, and to understand this kind of thing. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. I think Chris, we can go to the panel. Oh, I thought you were in the piece. Uh, if you, if you <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, it would be nice. So then you can you can work on that, okay? Can can um, hmm? take it? Yeah. Uh, but you need the adapter. Uh, hold on. No, but just to put the uh, you have it, yeah. But he needs to link your. No, it's only. Uh, it's as as you might, yeah. That's it. Okay. Il faudrait que. It's okay. Is it okay? We are on. Yeah, it's okay. You can. Sir, uh, can we take the adapter, please? It's not work. Very good.
19 years old male uh, with uh, complaint with the right hearing loss is possible congenital. There is no any story uh, to beginning, and uh, it's conductive hearing loss uh, as you can see in the audiogram. And time time program is tip A, and no any stability reflex and no any additional history of the ear disease. Uh, now this is the video of the uh, endoscopic step surgery. You know, you see the maneuvering mal is located uh, posteriorly. This is the first step. Everything is okay, going right. And. As we can show in the tomographic images, there's a, a little soft tissue top of the uh, stapedial full plate. And the posterior part of the tympanic membrane is very thick and we have many fibrous tissue around it. And uh, we elevate the tympanomatal flap properly. And we so the incus and we saw the size top of the stapes uh, supra uh, stapes foot plate. There's a clear sac, and we saw under the sac a little hole, dark hole. It may be a, a entrance to the inner ear. Our graft is intact. Our flap is intact and tiponic membrane is okay. And we decide to push it properly like an encephalo cell. Uh, I don't have any idea during the surgery and I decide to remove this size inferiorly or to the facial nerve. I, I never aspirate to the area of the foot plate and decide to put a graft to the reinforce the tympanic membrane. And I use a totally Teflon prosthesis. And everything is good. And I close the tympanic membrane flap. And I explain to the problem with the patient this is the i think is the major point of the uh, management is the uh, explain everything to with the patient this is the end of the surgery but after the surgery patient suffered a twitching on the inferior part of the face no any facial weakness a uh, involuntary uh, uh, stop during the sleep but it's not cure i'm struggling to now i am struggling with the problem i revisit because hearing thresholds nearly 30 35 uh, gap and i decide to use it a uh, torp uh, we are another option, maybe use a, a, a Teflon prosthesis to the malleus to the staples. The foot uh, staples is maybe done. But uh, I can solve the problem. Uh, what is the problem? I don't know. Uh, in the literature, English literature, there is only 12 cases with stapedial agenesis. But uh, no one is have this like a kid sized. Uh, there's only agenesis. This is a size like an encephalo cell. The problem, regardless to hearing, the problem is the facial sinus. I don't know about it. Yes. Yes, your opinion. Yes. Yes.
here and get back. So yes. Yeah, because the problem is. Really but the other ear is very good because of that. Patients. Uh, yeah. I, the patient's not interested for hearing. Uh, patients uh, suffer well, from this, the this is twitching of the, your face. I think you. I think you take it out and you give him a hearing aid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's okay. So who would the uh, weakness? Yeah, the patient has no facial weakness post-operative. No. Only no. it's a twitching. No. Never. Okay. No. And and no in I explored again the, the facial nerve the trace is uh, everything is okay. I think uh, maybe a, a little bone fragment to the uh, s uh, spin out the, the facial nerve. I, ex I explored nothing. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. To Vincent is open your same. Well, I, think I, I said the same, eh? to remove the prosthesis in weight. I think yeah, it's really like true. When you did the original operation, they put this in. Yeah. Yes. No. No. Yeah. No. No. Any aspiration? I compress to the size, and then uh, gently, uh, inferiorly uh, dissect it. During the surgery, everything is going uh, good. Uh, I think this is the oval window, I think, uh, during the surgery. But uh, I didn't aspirate to the uh, oval window. Maybe I can aspirate li properly uh, for seeing the, uh, the right area. Uh, I, uh, they, maybe your, uh, there is a, some fibers of facial nerve just... Yes, thanks. Um, just a comment. Uh, one of the things that I will do, uh, I think that everybody is telling the, to remove the prosthesis is the, the, the best decision. But just to find out a little bit more to use the facial nerve monitoring while you remove the prosthesis mm -hmm. and you can trace I... if there are some fibers. Because if you have yes, facial right. nerve fibers, then you will get the stimulation with the, with the monitor. Yes, I use uh, the, and the revision uh, facial nerve monitoring, uh, but uh, the facial nerve is uh, give a stimulus. Did you use the not the on the oval window? Yeah, just to trace if there are some fibers. Uh, to yes, stimulate. Uh, I don't want to use it on top of the oval window. With the stimulator, so maybe I can do it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Is it working? Okay. Oh, great. That's fine. Uh, yeah, okay. Chris. Okay, we'll, okay, we'll put you on. I think okay. we'll put you on the panel. No, don't put the video. Don't put the photo up. I'm not going to put any photos on. Okay. I'm not, honestly. I just want okay. to. Okay. So th this is the inquisition that we normally do. And. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows everybody. So I think it, of course, Robert, we, I think we more or less know. John doesn't get the microphone. A, qu a, qu a quick introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm Miguel Ariste. I come from Madrid, from Spain, and I am a rhinologist. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just a pathologist and scoby surgeon. Yeah. Um, my name is Jose Carlos. I'm from Madrid also, and I'm a main ethologist all my all my days since 15 years ago. 
Nice to meet you. I'm Mario Milko from Varna, Bulgaria. I'm otologist and vestibologist. Great. Thanks. Roman Frostan from England. <laughs> okay. So I think we've, what we, we've obviously seen Rob Air's technique, but what we're going to do is just probe a little bit deeper and see if other people have got different ways of doing things. And the first thing we're going to start off is with just a basic, very standard patient who comes with an audiogram like that. So you've got a very good history, progressive hearing loss, normal looking ears, conductive hearing loss, there's a car heart's knocked there. You think this is otosclerosis. So Miguel, in Madrid, what workup would you do pre-op? Let's just say it's a really straightforward case. So lady, she's tried hearing aids and she wants her hearing sorted. So you think, well, we're gonna, we're gonna operate on this patient. What do you do in terms of pre-operative workup, if anything? For this patient, you mean, you, you mean from the otologist's point of view? Uh, yeah, for, put your rhinology hat to one side for now. And yeah, just yeah, yeah. I know, I know. But yeah. uh, I, so I, not the anaesthetic. I, I'm not bothered about her heart failure and all that. She's fit. Yeah, I tend to look at the nose, but anyway. Yeah. Um, okay, I would uh, speech discrimination score. I would like to have it also. Yeah. Yeah. In this okay. Case. So, so does everybody routinely do speech discrimination pre-op? Yeah. Do you? Because I don't do that anymore. I don't do it at all. But we're doing not, it. not with the norm. If they've got poor bone conduction, I do it. If I really think they're going to get a, a result where they might get improved hearing, but no improvement in their actual speech discrimination score. But with bone like that, I wouldn't. I would personally wouldn't do it. Does everybody do speech discrimination? Am I the outlier here? Who doesn't? Who doesn't do it? Well, who, who does first? Okay, who does? Mm -hmm. And who doesn't then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some people not sure what they do. Okay, fine. So it's, it's okay, very symmetrical. It's very symmetrical. So I yeah. would like to know, of course, the perception of the patient, who's uh, which is the worst. Uh, yes, here that's for, a good point for the so, patient. Yep. And uh, I know it. It may be debatable, but I ask for imaging. You do. So that's really yeah. what I was coming to. Oh, yeah. So, uh, what in terms of your workup? I mean, I'm a massive fan of tuning forks. Um, maybe a bit old fashioned, but I if they have a negative Rini at 256, 512, and 1,000, I just think they're going to do well. I mean, they quite often don't have it at 1,000. But a lot of our trainees don't know what a tuning fork is. You give them a tuning fork, and they've absolutely no idea what to do with it. But I think it's a really important tool. Do you, use, do you use tuning forks or not? Yes. Yeah, you do. I think they're really, really important. But yeah, so what about differential diagnosis? So. I mean, we've actually, we saw a, a case like this is one that I did years ago before we used to do CT scans. And it's just what you indicated, Robert. It's a congenital abnormality, although the history wasn't congenital. Uh, it's got a, a stapes which is no longer fixed. And of course, when you take the stapes away, the whole foot plate is replaced with the facial nerve there. So that was one of the reasons I thought, oh, maybe I should be doing CT scans. And this was at a time when people were not doing CT scan, it's quite a long time ago, but you can see the facial nerves completely over. That is not one where there's a gap you can get into. It's like, that's what it is. So the question is, should we CT scan? And so Miguel, you routinely CT scan these now? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I try to do cone beam CT. Cone beam think, CT, yeah, and you're in the same unit? So what about in Bulgaria? Do you have access to cone beam? Uh, Personally, not in uh, my hospital, we have routine CT scan. Yeah, But, but I think in Sofia, we have. You've got normal CT, though. Yeah. And would you do that routinely for otosclerosis? Routine for yeah. otosclerosis. And I mean, I know, John, you've come through a time, but you do now. And Robert, you have to do it here. Yes, it's and mandatory. mandatory. I, I mean, I, th I really think you should do it because just occasionally, you're really caught out. I, I was caught out by a patient with superior canal dehiscence, and I... I was sure he'd got a fixed foot plate and I did the operation and it was typically brilliant and his hearing was no better at all. And then I scanned him and he'd got a barn door superior canal. And I know the hearing test is slightly different, but I missed it. And I, it's when you go in and you think this is otosclerosis and the stapes is not completely mobile, you can sort of convince yourself sometimes this is reduced mobility. And I, I'm sure I made a mistake in that. Um, this is one with the fractured neck and malleus. Okay, you can see. Have we got a laser? Oh, yeah. That's you can interesting. See the, you can see the fracture would, here. Th this would be the case of tomorrow morning. A fractured uh, neck. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we, well, that's really interesting. There's a fracture here through the temporal bone. You can see the fractured neck there. Um, this was a colleague, very narrow niche with a dehiscent facial nerve. Uh, one of my ENT colleagues who, you know, it's quite nice to know that before you operate on them. Um, uh, another one with a dehiscent nerve. If, particularly if you're starting off, 
you know, you don't want to be doing the obliterative foot plate. So you want to know that before you operate so you can send it to someone else. If it's a tiny, tight notch, again, you might as well send it to somebody else. Um, as Robert says, once you take... Oh, no, I don't know why we've lost that. Once you take away the stapes, although this is a dehiscent nerve that's really coming down, there is enough space to do that. And that was my colleague. <laughs> Fix malleus, you know, again, uh, it's nice to know that beforehand, that that's what you're dealing with. So, okay, so we all CT scan now. And it wasn't that long ago when nobody was CT scan scanning. And it's a bit like cholesteatoma surgery. All you young surgeons coming through will all routinely scan. But when Grandad was starting here, nobody scanned. And so there was a period when people were saying, well, you should scan for And they were saying, well, we've never scanned. There's no need to scan. Why would you scan? We never used to scan. But obviously, as times change, we're all doing it. And I think that's the right thing. So... Treatment options. What are your treatment options for that first patient then? Uh, if you'd like to just explain what your treatment options are. Well, usually... So, so we think it's otosclerosis. We've done yeah, the scan. It is otosclerosis. It's otosclerosis. We've had a little bit about our pre-op chat, but uh -huh. in, in Spain, what do you do in terms of hearing aids and offering hearing aids? Um, we usually offer the hearing aids, but I, I usually advise for surgery, you know? It, it, so you advise for surgery? But... I usually, if the patient is not convinced, or if I, sometimes I, I offer the, the try of, of the hearing aids, yeah. you know, because sometimes it's good the patients have the, 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 the second uh, idea, you know, the idea of, of my hearing aids is like that, okay, yeah. I, I, I try for one month or something like that. And if not, he, he, he can come yeah. again and, and offer the, the But surgery. if they're not sure, you tend to advise them for surgery. Is that what you would say? If not no, if, no. If not sure, yeah. I, I try the hearing aids. Yeah, okay. I push for okay. the hearing aids, okay? And after trying yeah. the hearing aids, he can come, he can come again. And what's your impression of patients who've tried a hearing aid and then go on to surgery? Do they usually come back and say the surgery is better? Well, well what in do you Spain, think? usually that's, nobody now wants to have a hearing aid, isn't it? It's a problem of, you know, of nobody wants to, to have a hearing aid. Even, yeah. even senior people doesn't want a hearing yeah. aid. So they usually choose surgery before hearing aids. Yeah, so, okay. And Bulgaria, what's the situation with hearing aids? We start usually because many of these patients don't like operation and we start with hearing device sometimes. Yeah. Some of young patients, they learned too much from this course or from internet and want they want, <laughs> to, uh, they want uh, operate it immediately after two, three weeks and sometimes a cochlear implantation. Yeah. Okay, so Robert, just in France, What's the situation with hearing aids? Do patients get free hearing aids in France or do they pay for them? No, they have to pay. Yeah, well, so but it's a little bit better than before, but they still have to pay for that. So th in France, you get your surgery for free, but you have to pay for your hearing aid. So it, that tends it, to push people Spain. towards... It's, so it's the same in it's Spain. Same. You, you, okay. you can't say it's, it's for free because the government is paying for, for the patient. So it's not completely for free, but I understand what you mean. I mean, they... They don't yeah, pay. but for the patient themselves, it's more expensive for them to have a hearing aid than to have the surgery, yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the sort of financial thing that slightly skews people's practice. Because in, in the UK, we are very much encouraged to say, well, a hearing aid is a really good option because it is a good option for these patients. The, the thing but is I agree with you, most of them would like surgery. Chris, Chris, uh, yes, my, okay. my experience in France is that people do tend to prefer surgery because they really do not want uh, the, 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 the mechanical distraction of beauty yeah yeah uh, so i think cosmetics is more prevalent i can't imagine in england but in the south of europe it's very uh, prevalent uh, important to no them. it's a really math there are two things with hearing aids i think a cosmetic but it's this link with senility with old age right that okay people really <laughs> hate and they don't want to say i'm old enough they'll wear glasses right and the big, the big changer for us in the UK is that we now talk to elderly patients and we say hearing aids are not hearing aids, they're brain aids. They reduce your risk of dementia. And once you say that to your elderly patient, I know it's a different story because they haven't got an alternative, but with age-related hearing loss, if you say this is a brain aid and there's a clear link between hearing loss and dementia, they all want their hearing aids because the one thing, they, they, don't, they don't want a hearing aid, but they definitely don't want a bit dementia. So I walk out of the room for one minute wait and i put a open fit hearing aid in my ear with a fine tube and i walk back in again and keep on talking to the patient and then i say where's my hearing aid and they don't see an open fit 
hearing aid unless they look really carefully. Yeah, that's true. The other problem we have in the UK is for the last 30 years, there's been a big push from my part of the country to Baja. So if you live in the Midlands, every, everybody believes in the community that Baja is better than hearing aids or surgery. And that's not true. The gold standard is surgery. And it's the financial pressures and the, the peer pressures. So that's okay. difficult. So these are the latest from the UK. For those of you not working in the UK, this is what. So these yeah. are the, the open, latest, the latest open to fit. But you know, patients think that's what they're going to get. What about medical treatment? Do you use any medical treatment for otosclerosis? Anybody? No, no. Yes. No. Well, no. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yep. uh, definitely, with a com uh, uh, central component, uh, uh, the cochlear comp component, uh, we or at least I tend to prescribe uh, fluoride and uh, vitamin D. So fluoride and vitamin. D. What about biphosphonates? Do you buy? Uh, I have not found any. Uh, you know, I, I published or my team published a, a, pr a publication on the effic efficacy of fluoride and uh, vitamin D. That there is definitely some indication that it does something. That I've not found any. Um, no. proof on uh, any other treatment okay so, so unfortunately osvaldo who's one of our colleagues yep. from brazil <coughs> is a huge fan of biphosphonates well, well, and well, he gives a talk and presents talking uh, about level of evidence that's level five and yeah. it can be yeah. but there are no publications that prove that it uh, uh, no 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 look at uh, we, we did a systematic review and it's absolutely true that there's no solid evidence but there's definitely some indication that fluoride and vi and vitamin d together um, help or uh, reduce the speed of central okay all right but, but i mean i think it is out there and and interesting well, and what about interesting. fluoride in our drinking water and the toothpaste and yeah and the vitamin d that most brits take because we have no sunshine hmm. i mean do they play a part or not not enough. I hope you're not going to design a study <laughs> just sitting here while being retired, John. Come on, Chris, let's move on. Okay, so one of the problems with fluoride in the UK is that the standard dose is 20 milligrams three times a day, and our standard tablet is two milligrams. So that means our patients have to take 30 tablets a day for something that may, may possibly help, and they won't do it. Okay, so we're going to go on now, and we're going to... Sorry, yep, yeah, Robert. Rub on the, the quantity of fluoride we give to the patient, 20 milligrams three times a day, it's, it's a lot. I mean, it's yeah. quite dangerous. Yeah. I think, for, we we yeah. do only two milligrams. You do two. 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 Yeah, but I think if you look at the papers, that is what we call in England a homeopathic dose. That's not going to help. It might help their I mean, dental, their teeth. You know, there's no proof. No. There's no scientific so proof that it works or not work. But as, as Wilco said, there are some papers, including one by Sterkers, which was uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, look, in look, Paris, look it up. was did, in favour of that. We did a review on it, and there is definitely a light indication, not solid, and the risk of bias, of course, but there is an indication of fluoride, with, together with vitamin D, definitely. And you're using that, just to be clear, you're using that for patients who've got significant sensory no. neural cochlear are you? We use that. Since any time we think it's a cochlear to screw, yeah. start this, or any time we see a patient with a mixed hearing loss or conductive hearing loss, think about autosclerosis, uh, 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 then we start the treatment with uh, uh, fluoride too. Yeah. All the time. So you do that all the time, all yeah. your patients. So yeah. do they, even the ones who get surgery, what do I they can get see, it? Uh, what I can, yes, of course. What I can see is that I can feel the difference between the people, but it's not scientific proof, again, but it's a personal view with experience. Yeah. Uh, with uh, people uh, stopping the treatment and those who are not stopping the treatment. I can feel the difference, but it's not a scientific proof so just for sure. Because I'm, I, this is new to me. So you basically, your patients who come in, they have surgery, they get two milligrams of fluoride every day for the rest of their life. Not for the rest of their life, it's for, for several years. Depends on for the some years. years and, yeah. But that's a standard treatment at the clinic yeah. here. Yes. Okay, there you yeah. go. So that's news to me. I, I've, I've, anybody else do that? Okay. Chris, Chris, it could be a That's even if they have anything. surgery. So even if they have surgery so to prevent sensory neural loss for years, yeah, yeah. But Robert does have shares in a fluoride company, don't you? <laughs> yeah, not in the drinking water. There's probably a tree out there with truffles and cascades. Yeah, no, that's re uh, really interesting, Robert. Uh, do you, do, you don't do that there, Wilco. Not routinely. Yes. You do? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. No, uh, come on. You uh, read the literature. Two uh, we did publish something, I think, eight okay. years ago. I'm going to check this out before the end well, of the meeting. I, I think the, the thing is, Chris has not there. changed his presentation in the last 20 years, but we published but the, after that. But the, the questions are the same, but the answers are changing, and that's the whole point, isn't it? Okay, <laughs> yeah. that's fine. 
So next thing, what's your audiolog audiological threshold to offer surgery? Uh, how about in Bulgaria? What, what do you reckon? I mean, I guess this is a pretty barn door case. But what about this one? About this case or yeah, what about this usually? One? Yeah, I mean, what, the, what I'm trying to get at is, you know... Some of surgery start with left ear. Yeah, I wouldn't do the right ear, I don't think. <laughs> no. no, okay, so the left ear, there's a, definitely an air bone gap there. But I guess the question is, there's this sort of asymmetry of sensory neural loss. And we talked about patients being happy. I think Wilco showed some graphs of people whose hearing clearly improved, but they weren't that happy. Could that be because they don't achieve symmetry? And does that matter? No, it's, it's, this is not matter. But the, the last two years, we use uh, electrocochlography. Sometimes it's much better than uh, audiogram or databases uh, okay with uh, cochlography. And some of patients uh, has uh, not only conductive hearing loss and uh, some vestibulogy problems. Yeah. And then I need consultation with neurological department and then start uh, to prepare the to, to surgery. But some of uh, our surgeons prefer to start with cochlear implantation in these cases. Oh, yeah. I think that's too... Not, well, not, 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 not after, the surgery, after John's yes. operation. But look, in this case, <laughs> there are two things. The yeah. first thing you never know, you can have an overclosure. So yeah, for sure. Okay. for sure. And even if it closed like this, this will improve the efficiency of your hearing aid on the left ear. Yeah. So for yeah. me, there's definitely indication for yeah. surgery. So I think, I think the thing here is that there's no problem operating, but what's really important is to explain to your patient what they're going to expect, because there's no point saying to them, oh, we'll get you, yeah. we'll give you really good hearing here. If they do get great overclosure, they'll be really happy. But I think it's important to explain, yes, we can probably improve your hearing, but it may not be as good as your other ear. You may still need a hearing. I mean, I completely agree with you, but it's the chat that's important yeah. on this one, isn't it? Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah. May you can f skip out. It's not going to be the same as right, but it can be still be but quite be functional. Better. Yeah. But the question about uh, your question about uh, being uneven definitely influences this, uh, the satisfaction of the definitely. patient. Definitely. I'm sure that's what your graph was about. I was going to say even the definition of of what a hearing aid shows varies between us. The, the previous one, what what would everybody call the previous one that Chris showed us? Because most patients would bring that to you and say. I've been told I've got a mixed hearing loss. I'd probably say that was a conductive yeah. loss. Yeah. But a lot of doctors don't. So the patients are confused when they come through the door. Okay. Certainly more confused after they've seen me. Well, okay, so what about this one? So you, uh, this is the question here really is what's the sort of minimum air bone gap you're going to go for? This patient will not be happy after surgery, I would say. Robert, are you you're Depending on again, it's as you said. Depending on what you talk with your uh, chat yeah. you have with yeah. your with your patient, if you explain that it would be only this, but again, this might improve the efficiency of the ear again. I would do surgery, but you need to to discuss this point, and of course, you need to think about the acoustic in this case, yeah, because yeah. It, there's a lot of. Uh, but I think I, this, this is one where actually tuning forks help you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's one where I would definitely do speech audio. Yeah. Hmm. I would be reluctant to operate and on the MIGWELL. No, and, th and this is, of course, uh, a case in which you need uh, imaging and probably yeah, not yeah. only CT, but also MRI to rule out whatever it is because... Sorry? No, 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 absolutely not. No, no, I think you need an MRI to exclude uh, whatever it is. And I, I agree that uh, if finally it, came, it comes out that you have a... Uh, autosclerosis, I agree with Robert that probably whatever you improve this patient, it might be helpful for, for him or her. So, uh, But if you look at the air bone gap, what's your, do you, do you have a sort of minimum air bone gap you go for? Because we, we, you know, we're really happy if we get the air bone gap within 10 dB. So if they start at 15, 15. you're almost there, aren't you? So, uh, and certainly this one, if you average it out, it's not much more than but, 10, is it? But really? I think this patient maybe with surgery increase a little bit the, the, the bone conduction, you know, and, and the hearing aid is going to be better. Uh, the, you know, I think some patients have problems with the hearing aids and uh, only raising 10 decibels and you got, uh, you have a more comfort with the hearing aids. I think so. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, bit, but I, I had, I mean, it's very interesting what uh, Wilco said, because I had a patient that I'd operated on recently, just four weeks ago, uh, total perforation, no acicular chain, and I think it got a fixed foot plate. It felt fixed. So I put a prosthesis in, but, you know, basically didn't really expect anything. Closed the ear, and she came back and she said, it's fantastic, no infection, my hearing's much better. And I thought, oh, amazing, you know, I'm really pleased. Did the audiogram, and the hearing was worse. <laughs> but she was happy. She was really happy. It almost broke my heart yeah. to tell her the truth. <laughs> I only saw it yesterday. Yeah, no. yeah, just one thing. Can you put the, the previous one? Yeah, of course. Because, uh, I mean, if this was, uh, if you put this up, and this is, uh, I mean, with normal inner ear function, I will wait. But the, uh, if this is down in this case, uh, probably you have a lot of to offer and to improve this patient. So it makes a difference for me, putting those two curves upwards, uh, in a normal inner ear function with very low gap. Yes, okay. I will wait. So what you're saying but is that... But in this case, I think you have a lot to offer to the patient because you can improve. Uh, Maybe improve the bone. Yeah, yeah because I think so. M Miguel, I have a question about you because I'm learning something because I would do an ABR and if the speech still arrives at 100% or something, I would not do an MRI. But... You can have a normal ABR and you can have something there. And it's not only an acoustic aroma. I mean, you have to rule out many other things. I, I think you need it. Okay, can we ask, who does an MRI on this audiogram? I, I would definitely do an MRI. Okay, well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will. Okay, what about osteogenesis imperfecta? So very, uh, quite often a very similar story to otosclerosis. There may be a family history. There may be the, the patient comes in well known with uh, osteogenesis. If, you, if it's barn door osteogenesis, blue sclera, multiple bone breaks, does that make any difference to what you offer? Uh, Miguel, what do you think on this? Do you operate on osteogenesis patients? Well, I, I prefer all the ones to answer because I have no experience with... Uh, okay, well, let's ask uh, Robert because I know you have yeah, experience with this. And, uh, the, I do surgery yeah. on this patient and uh, I published this. And uh, the big difference is the incidence of obliterative yeah, cases. Dirty. It's rising 40% of the cases. And does that make any difference to well, what you do? You just treat it as an obliterative. The surgery is more tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, and really, and yeah. the long-term evolution of the pathology is still there, and there is a slight decrease of the bone connection, which is much faster than autosclerosis. But yeah. uh, but there is indication also, uh, because I you can improve I it. I have some patient, and uh, you will have to advise the patient that some, sometimes it's going to rise the hearing after the surgery, but it's more probably that in a short time, uh, maybe it's going to go, go in gorse because, you know, they're going to form new bone. But even if it's a short time yeah. or uh, not a long time, then you offer him something good. And I they mean, they usually good. accept the surgeries. I mean, my, my experience, I've done a few of them, and they're just remarkably similar to otosclerosis. You know, the foot plate looks they very, are very similar. very similar, but it's not the same pathology. No, no I, know that, I know that, but it's, it's interesting. Okay, what about contraindications to surgery? What would stop, would, would say, I'm just not going to operate? Not, we're not talk, talking audiology here, but what about other things with the ear? So, I mean, do you check the ear on the day of surgery, John? Do you actually look before they go on the table? We all do that. I don't do that, you know. I, never, well, I just see them on the table. I so you know, I see them in clinic, and I consent them in clinic. But on the day, I go and mark their ear, and I do the consent. And I, I, I honestly, I don't look in their ear on the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I have, I have had a patient on the table where I looked in, and that was what it looked like, and that's not actually the patient. But obviously, I decided not to do it. <laughs> yeah, just charged them for that and did a microsuction. Um, any other? Things that would make you feel you're not going to operate? Is it just infection on the day? On yeah, stapes we're talking about here. Yeah, if it's infected, then it's okay. Okay. All right. Now, consent, we, took, we touched a little bit on that. Um, but I think you really, and this is what's really tricky when you start off, because A, you've got to have a conversation with the patient and say, well, I've only done five of, you know, I'm a, newly, a new consult, I've only done five of these. And that's a difficult conversation to have because you can't really give them figures. Um, and I, I think it's really tricky when you first start off. And back in the day when John did it, he probably just yeah. lied, didn't you? You didn't discuss oh, yeah, it. Yeah, but they didn't have to. They didn't do, no, but people do now. So it's really nice if you can to have your own results. And I would recommend for all of you, wherever you are, have a database of your surgery. And Robert has the ONDB database, which I use, and I've used it throughout 
a hold of my career and it's fantastic because you can click and show them your results and what's more you can actually look at your own results and change your practice as a result of that and it's very easy if you're like me who thinks all my patients are amazing and do incredibly well because I'm so brilliant you get a very skewed view of your own practice you know you think you're amazing and then you look at your results and think oh I'm, maybe I'm not quite as good as I thought I was so it's really important to look and equally you get other surgeons who think I'm just rubbish and and so you need to know what your own results are like. And I, I put this slide up because laser eye surgery in the UK, they do 100,000 cases a year. And in some respects, it's the ophthalmic equivalent of stapy surgery because you've got something where you've got a good solution. You can put glasses on and you're changing a refractive error like a conductive error, if you like. And in the UK, the risks of blindness are one in five million. Serious complications, one in 500 uh, so decreased vision or, or hazy vision and complications, dry eyes, 5%. And I just put it to you that our dead ear rates are around about maybe half of 1% and their blindness rate is one in 5 million. And if our results were the same, so you're doing 100,000 cases a year, that would be 100 blind cases a year. And I think it's interesting that our patients are quite accepting when you say, oh, there's a risk of one in 200 of getting a dead ear, they're remarkably accepting of that. And I think somebody was saying they'd had a dead ear. Mm. In fact, you were saying about your patient, it was actually wasn't that fussed about it. You were more concerned because he knew about it. It's very interesting how we, the difference in perception, I think, with both us and our patients. I, I, a question. I remember all my dead ears. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. Um, I remember. Fantastic memory. Uh, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I, uh, four. four. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I know. I know what kind of work they were in, uh, and yeah, the struggle yeah. they had. Uh, yeah. a, a teacher having to leave her practice because she couldn't educate young children. Uh, couldn't understand English. Well, it's interesting. My perception is more like yours. That actually, I the, I remember the first one was absolutely devastated, and the patient was quite okay about it. I mean, we had sat down and discussed it before, of course, but it, it's. I mean, I guess you tolerate unilateral deafness reasonably well, but it is interesting. So, what are the other risks of surgery? Uh, what do you? Anything you specifically tell your patients? Anything that you really focus on in the discussion? I usually say the patient is ninety percent and everything is okay. Yeah, ten percent some kind of problems and one person uh, dead ear dead ear yeah but i usually said i never had a, a dead ear in 15 years so yeah. right now i say to my patient okay i have one dead ear yeah but the problem is that i think you have to be you know confident what you are saying and you know sometimes the patient will want you to to you know to offer you know security they want you to say okay i'm going to do this it's okay and but um in, in, in the in the private, when I see a lot of second uh, opinions, the worst thing people usually say is someone told me this is going to be great, this is going to be perfect, don't worry about this. Mm -hmm. And no, say nothing about complications, mm -hmm. nothing about mm -hmm. that. And th this, th this kind of patients, they are the worst because they don't, you know, they, are, they, are, they lose all the faith in, in, in medicine, you know. So I think it's very important to, to know the risk. Your, your oh, risk because yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's easier to say 90% of the patient is okay but my 100 first patient had a lot of complications so I, I got the, the 10% in the first high uh, yeah I, mean, I, I, it? I so, say to them it may be one in 200 but you've got to think it could be you it's not one in a million it can happen it's happened yeah. to some of my patients just it, think yeah. what that would mean sorry Jim if I get a patient who comes to me and says I've seen Mr X or Mr Y said he's never had a complication I said, look for the fire escape. Yeah. There's no, no such yeah, thing. Not enough surgery. There is no not such thing surgeries. if you've done enough yeah. as not having a complication. Okay, so let's look respect at that. essential equipment. What, what you, for your kit, what do you really like to have? What, what, actually, some, some people have been asking about speculum holders. Now, I know you've yours, Robert. Is that available still, or is it bespoke? The speculum holder that you have that goes under the table? Yeah you can still buy it because we, we were having some questions about where you get that from. Do you know? Okay. Well, we maybe, maybe we could look in ask theater stuff. One. Yeah, we do as well. Me. Medtronic do one or there's the oats it's bespoke. Not it's not approved by anybody <laughs> apart from oats. Some guy called Trump. <laughs> so uh, Miguel, uh, how about in Madrid and Bulgaria? What do you, how do you, do you use an end or incision? Do you use a speculum? What do you do for no, a most, most of the cases we use the uh, the canal with uh, with holder. 
Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's the serpentine holder. It's not the, the one you're using. Yeah. Uh, but we are not using the position that you, so we are, we like to work in the same axis as the microscope. So that makes a difference. Yeah. I think it's better the way you do, but we are used in this way to, to work in any middle ear surgery. So it makes a little bit more uncomfortable and you don't have the same, um, support in your, in your arms. And this yeah, that's is, what I mean. If you are like yeah. this, you cannot stabilize your hand. Yeah, yeah, that's like uh, absolutely true. Then you are you are in in the way you are doing it, you are closer to the patient. So I I agree that you are more relaxed and probably in terms of uh, tremor and so on is better. No, we're using this one. This is the one you use. Yeah. That's what I use, which is sort of the Yazagil yeah. or an adaption of Yazagil, and it's got a wire at the middle. The reason I like this is you you have a little bit of movement, and I think you can. That's how I do it. So I rest my hands very much like Robert, really. Um, although I'm the, the ear is not quite as flat. Um, yeah, of course. If you, even if you nice... don't have support in your arms, your fingers should be in this way. I think yeah. that that helps quite yeah, a lot. Yeah, def definitely does. Yeah, but that's I think that's quite a nice thing. What um, about what about lasers then, guys? Do you all use a laser? Yeah, you do. And what laser? Well, do you we use? are using laser in the in the private practice. I have no uh, availability in the public, unfortunately. So that's very interesting. Where you've got two separate practices. One with yeah. like, what's what difference does it make? Do you think where you've got? I prefer laser, of course. Yeah. I okay. prefer. Wait, what type of laser are you? Diode. 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 Laser. With? Are you happy with? Yeah, I, I, I wish I would have a CO2 laser, but uh, it's well, impossible. I'm, you know, I'm not so happy now because you notice that the last case was didn't, it didn't work well. When it works, it's very good, but it's a little bit unstable. So, so the, uh, the reason yeah. I like the KTP is compared to your, your probe, this is the new probe on my Oculite, and it is absolutely fantastic. It's so delicate. It's really is beautiful. Is this KTP yeah. or...? It's KTP, yeah, yeah, and um, definitely it's, it's so beautifully precise. Yeah, yeah no, it definitely in revision cases, uh, I always try to have a laser, even in the public, I ask someone to bring it, okay, and to have it with me. Okay, yeah. and in Bulgaria, do you have access to a laser? No, no, I haven't information about laser. No, and do you so on the when you're doing your stapedotomy, do you use a drill or a hand trafine or fracture or two methods, uh, drill or special instruments about. Uh, Little hand, uh, manual yes. hand trafine. Yeah, yes. okay. Yeah, it's fine. And is well, is, uh, in the private, it's, it's same, like, it's same, the same. Let me remember. In the in the public, they they ask me, they they ask me to o operate all the the two sclerosis, and I yeah, ask I for the laser yeah. and also the Leila and everything, you know, because I I want in the public the same and in the pri in the private. So I, they offered me, and I use the Fox uh, laser diode, and I think it's is a good laser the problem is i think is when you make the the rosette uh, you make the, the point in the if you per, make a perforation in this foot plate it's much better not to use the laser anymore because the heat can damage yeah, that that's the point with the diode yeah. where that with the co2 there's no no risk yeah. theoretically but the, when it works fine it's very beautiful it's this beautiful, one yeah. because you one shot you make a rosette yeah. and then you just have to do yeah. that this is my stability mod. <laughs> hang on that's not working now. But I think I like that because it gives you nice stability. Here you go. <laughs> okay. So what about endoscopes? Tell us about autoendoscopy and staple okay. surgery. <laughs> okay. Take uh, care. Uh, what you're yeah, yeah, say. no, I know, I know. No, you say whatever you like. You say whatever you like. No, I, I usually, you know, in, in Spain, when they began to perform endoscopy, um, people usually think about to use it for for uh, uh, autosclerosis is i don't think is the is the way you have to begin with endoscope you know That's it's the last part of the endoscope because it's difficult to to manage with one hand and sometimes if you have any problem or or you know complication you need the other hand so at the beginning i tried some cases because i wanted to to preserve the coda tympani and uh, reduce my aticotomy and things like that because i can see better with the endoscope with the angle of endoscope even better than with the microscope. But the problem is that in order to to, to work in the stapes, I have to, you know, to make the articotomy because the instruments, even vent, can perform the surgery properly, you know. So I began using, I think, 10, 12 cases. Uh, I don't like it because of uh, because the views are amazing, but, you know, it's difficult to work. I changed to, to nitinol processes, laser, 
um, because the crimping process is dif is really difficult because you have to you know change your your position. You can use the the other hand to hold you know the 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 wrist. Yeah. So it's difficult. And after 25, 30 surgeries with good results, everything okay. But you know, I I, I was not comfortable. I have to say that at the beginning I thought, okay, maybe it's me because I'm not so senior. I don't have all the experience, and maybe I need the other hand. But when when the revision cases come, the the obliterative uh, cases come, I, I now never use the endoscope for autosclerosis. That's because it's for me it's important to have the CT scan. If I know it's autosclerosis, microscope, and and transcanal approach with the microscope. If it's an exploratory tympanotomy, I can use the endoscope because I can see much better. Yeah. But if I have to work in the middle ear, I think I, I, I usually use the, the microscope. Well, he, had an angel. I mean, he, had, yeah. he had an angel close to him always. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. A demon. <laughs> I have a demon inside and the angel yeah. said, yeah. don't do that. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. I mean, I'm a big fan of endoscope, yeah. but I have to say I've never seen any point of using it in stapley surgery. And I was, I didn't even realize that you still have to do pretty much the same removal of bone to get the instruments in to actually get the prosthesis in. So I, I, it doesn't. I don't. Does anybody do endoscopic stapley surgery? Yeah. And what are the benefits that you would see for that? Grab a grab a microscope. Cases, all the revision cases with microscope, of course. Yeah. Uh, you with endoscope, you don't need a more uh, bone removal of the scutum. You can see wide view all the stapes area easily. It's you can see that, but I, I mean that's what I'd thought. Oh, well, it sounds quite good if you can see it and not. But you have to remove bone to get the prosthesis in, don't you? And to drill the foot plate and to do the. Do you not yes, have to do that? Uh, I can. I use a Fox uh, diode laser. Yeah. Uh, just on the muscle and uh, just in one w watt uh, with coagulation uh, on the super, uh, foot plate. Yeah. And then drill. Uh, it's uh, easy to hand sometimes, but you know. Uh, so do you, routinely, would you do, not, do you not take any bone away at all? You can get round with the scope? Sometimes. You, okay. uh, no need uh, any bone removal. Uh, you can see the wide view of all the area sometimes, but you well, sometimes with the you microscope. Need some you, curate, no. you can use during the endoscope. Uh, we are a, a team in Turkey, endoscopic uh, ear surgeons. Yeah, uh, we use it uh, frequently, but uh, some is uh, I think is that uh, we uh, like it. A team, you can use any everything, uh, microscope, both of them. You can use. Yeah. It. Okay. I've got. Do you want to pass it? Let's get some more involvement with the floor. How, how are we doing? Again, again, to be the devil's advocate, even though being a rheumatologist, I think that um, I tried doing it. As, I was classically trained in you know, the the American way of of doing wide exposition and doing posterior incisions and just seeing everything before removing anything. And I really like that. I'm big, a big proponent of that. It's cool. And now, and endoscopic surgery feels a little bit forced on the younger population because there's lots of courses, lots of people asking for it, asking, are you doing endoscopic, endoscopic surgery? Why aren't you doing endoscopic surgery? And honestly, apart from not having one hand, which is quite important, um, I think the technology should, uh, should fit the surgeon, not the way around. And a lot of people are fitting are changing their practice to uh, to fit the technologies that's been introduced and i think that you should first be safe for the patient and use the best technique that you feel the most comfortable with and not not regressing into something that the industry is telling you or that your your insurance company is telling you or somebody else so regardless of what you use both techniques are proven proven to be wonderful but uh, i think we're first of all we're surgeons and we need to see we need to make, be sure and we need to be sure of ourselves and of the anatomy and then enjoy and not just go back to small holes and uh, small bones. Well, they're all small holes anyway, aren't they? I mean, let's yeah. face it. They're pretty yeah, small. but... I've got, got another comment? You, you, you got my point. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. No, I, I, I agree. Thank you.
the right tools in the right situation. Yeah. yeah. I, I think like all surgeries, um, the endoscopic surgery also has a steep learning curve, but um, I, th I don't think it should be dismissed. Uh, there is a scope for endoscopy for limited cases. Like you truly pointed, you can't use more uh, instruments inside. Uh, especially you might require curating endoscopically or drilling endoscopically, but it's possible. Not that it is not doable, it's possible, but uh, revision in certain cases, I think you should revert back to a microscope. So you should have possibly a good selection of cases for an endoscopy where you have a wide canal. Probably you can do a little better job. Endoscope is not a bad idea. I don't have the numbers. I've done yeah. roughly around 30 cases, but it's not too bad. Okay. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of endoscopes. I use them all the time, but I just don't really see it so much in this. And I've not, you've not sold it to me yet. And when, uh, just, yeah. just a comment. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say 80% my, of my, my, my practice is endoscopy. You know? Yes, yes. 80%. Yeah. And, and you get your, your ability and you, you can perform the surgery and it's safer for the patient, safer for the, the it's patient. It's safer it's for the safer patient. Why in, is it safer? In, because in the end, you are not, you know, speaking about, you know, uh, um, uh, staple surgery is, is not, is not the, the point, you know, but it's a small cholesterolomas in the attic, limited. Is is much better for the patient because you you don't have to remove a lot of mastoid yeah, just no, to sure. go through the part. I get that, but we're talking about so. I, I mean, I, I you don't. Know what I'm, I mean, I'm you a know, fan because sometimes I think okay, I, I step back in some kind of surgeries because I think you have to think which is the proper way for this patient, not use that or use that because it's needed. No, no, no. I think okay. you have to adapt to it. We'll probably get more of a chance. Yeah. The most important thing is that the results should be the same. Otherwise, you can choose whatever you want. But the yes. results should be the same. And you were speaking about changes in results from so many years ago, and we have not advanced so much. I mean, people were using different techniques with very good results, no? So, but you have yeah. to have your the same results. Yeah. Well, I think we have to thank John Shea. I mean, it is a great operation, isn't it? I mean, we've we've had good results, and it is a fantastic operation. And I know there are subtleties that make a difference, but generally, it's a good operation. And it's exactly the point that you were making earlier on that the reason stapedectomy is so successful is you've got real tolerance on it. So it's clipped onto the incus, but at the foot plate, the length is not absolutely essential. You know, if you're a quarter of a millimetre too long, you get a good result. If you're doing it with a, fix, with a foot plate that's mobile without a stapedotomy, the length's absolutely critical, and it's really easy to get it wrong. So I think that's why we get such reliably good results with osteoporosis. Um, I don't know how we're doing time-wise, guys. Five minutes, okay. Because we, I was going to look at some complex patients cases, but you've sort of covered most of those. What about bone removal? What do you use for that? So I was interested to see uh, you using the hammer and gouge because that's something a bit new. I think maybe Grolman has influenced that a bit. So Professor Grolman's come down from uh, Utrecht, and he used to use hammer and gouge. And I've never seen Robert use a hammer and gouge. I, I, I do, but, I do, but very now, rarely. <laughs> but now he's doing it every time. But interesting. You can see the and, difference and in the size. So these guys, that? you have to do it. I do it. Because I don't want to be. <laughs> so he's using a hammer and gouge. And Wilco, rare. who never used a vein graft, is using a vein graft. These guys, they're sharing ideas. It's good. under influence. Yeah. But this is what I use. This is yeah. a, a curette. Yeah. And I think the key thing about them is to change them and make sure they're sharp. Yeah. Do, do any of the guys who use the endoscope use the pizza electric? Do you know the pizza electric thing that actually sort of vibrates and breaks the bone? Have you used that? I've tried it, but I don't use it anymore. Yeah, pizza. Do you use that? No. Okay. Okay. It's too big. For it's too big. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Too big. Okay. Uh, measure. So we saw Robert measuring. Um, so some some people will say, well, it's four point five millimeters. And now That's Wilco is also do. measuring. Yeah. 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 So do you guys measure? Yeah. For me, it's, it's crucial, you know, you have to measure. Yeah. I think if you do revision cases, you soon realize you should measure because the, some of them come and the, you know, the, the piston's just clearly too short and they've not measured and they've put in a standard piston and it hasn't fitted. So I, I definitely think you should measure, um, but I know some people don't. Do you measure twice? There you go. What is that then, John? <laughs> yeah, if it's a thick foot plate, Clearly, what you're looking for is where your stapedotomy goes through into the uh, inner ear, and so you have to you have to measure at that point. And you showed that very nicely with the obliterative one. What about what pistons are you using? So, Miguel, which piston do you use? Uh, we're using a regular one. Uh, it's um, it's titanium. No, titanium, Audi, Audi. 
titanium. It's from audio. I think it's uh, titanium and fluoroplastic is the, the shaft. I think so. And is it a clip or do you no. crimp it? No, we have a crimping one. Yeah. And yeah. we have also a knitting on one. You've it depends on well. the cases, yeah. And why, the how do you choose between knitting all and the one that you crimp? No. How do you, dis oh, how well, do you decide? Uh, because we don't have always knitting all. But if we have the, the case and we are able to have it and then the so uh, would that the be company your preference provides it. If you had the laser and you had it, yeah, th that's I, what you would use. Yeah, I think you you avoid crimping. It's yeah. not an easy okay. maneuver. Yeah. And yourself? It, it, it's the same. I usually okay. in the in the public we have the the audio processes is the what they have. Yeah. And in the public in the practice in the um, private private yeah, yeah. Uh, the patient usually choose the the processes because it has to pay, and we prefer it and all. So with but the, the new one, the new one that is is wide. You know, not yeah. the one that's the wire. Okay. The one that is the, is wide. And why is that better? Why do you Be prefer because that? Because the the strength that makes is not in the same point because we have uh, at the you know, it spread the, the pressure on the on the incus, you know? Yep. So it's different. I think so. So do you, because I mean, one of the things I worry about nitinol is that maybe it could over crimp because you, you're yeah. not manually crimping. You So could mm -hmm. it strangulate the... But, but use the, the, we usually use uh, one bat yeah. and, and you can use two or three uh, shots, you know? And yeah. you can see how the nitinol is closing even, yeah. you know, further. Okay. And in Bulgaria, do you, what processes do you use? Uh, for about nitinol, this is the big discussion because you know the nitinol is uh, not this is uh, old material it is or secret material in russia in 1965 and uh, then we see that this prosthesis i think since 2004 or five personally i have i haven't uh, experienced with nitinol but we use teflon about 50 percent uh, and uh, titanium, different type, for example, Kurtz or uh, another brand. But uh, between 2001 and 2008, we prefer prosthesis in my city about uh, from a material, dentistry material, Targis Vectris. And this is very comfortable technology and we have the good res audio logical results. But after these years, we stop with this. Uh, this is the this is piston prosthesis, but uh, this is not plastic like uh, Teflon. Uh, it is mm, hard prosthesis, like a uh, ceramic. The, yes, yeah, like okay. a ceramic. Yeah, okay. This between plastic and ceramic, okay. uh, the material come from uh, Liechtenstein. Okay. And we stop because some surgeons uh, have the problems when they cut prosthesis. It's broken. It fractures. It's yeah. fractures. Okay. So Robert, I mean, you. I know you use Teflon and you use the bucket handle, and that's that's it really, and the revision prosthesis. Wilco, because yeah. you. Sorry, I mean, but that's what you use, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Wilco, what uh, about you? Because you came yes. not using Teflon. Didn't Almost you? exclusive titanium. Yeah. Titanium, and, and you, and, yeah. And now exclusive <laughs> Teflon. And, yeah. um, well, we did use Teflon once in a while. So sometimes you have an ear that was perfect surgery and the hearing is not good. You open it up and you see a lot of scar tissue. And I definitely think that a Teflon prosthesis, uh, I mean, if you look at titanium, it's a little bit rough on the edges. I think a Teflon still functions better, even if there's scarring, than if you look at uh, titanium. Well, I like titanium. I think a titanium is easier. It's easier to crimp, et cetera, et cetera. Teflon can be more challenging, but I think Teflon is even more inert than uh, yep. the metals. The other thing about Teflon is it's cheap. It's a pretty cheap prosthesis. And you have the one prosthesis cut to length. Mm -hmm. So that's quite nice. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I'll tell you now, it's a long way away for most of you. When you retire, you will get hundreds of letters of previous patients asking you to guarantee that they can go through the MRI scanner because they've all lost their little cards. And my secretary, who still answers those calls, says he's never used anything except Teflon, and that cures the problem. All those things are my own. I know they are, because you've tried persuading that to our radiology colleagues. They want a written affidavit, even though they know they're not going to get it. So I think we'll just, we'll probably finish now, but I'll just show you this one. So this. This is a smart piston, nitinol, and I, I think I was the first person in the UK to use it. So the rep brought it, having never seen it used, and told me all about it, as they do. And so I put it in, and then 
so it's just sitting there on the Incus. And I got my laser, and I was sort of not quite sure. And <laughs> so it jumped off. So I, I call it the smart jumping p p piston. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. So I think if you're going to use it, you have to actually physically hold it because it just, uh, they may have changed the design, but it crimped and it just came straight off. <laughs> Ten rods, yeah. So yeah, we're going to wrap up now, but if there are any questions from the floor to the panel, um, I think we've had a great day. Thank you so much, Robert. It's been really interesting surgery. Thanks for the panel. Thank you for Thibaut, absolutely, um, who was here a second ago. Really, really good. One question. Yep. Hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm Miguel from Spain. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, if you propose to a patient to use um, hearing aid, and you and the the autoclosis uh, progress, it will change your outcomes if you lately use the surgery. Uh, good question. So the used to, I mean, it used to be said if you operated early. I think Jean Bernard used to say that you could prevent the sensory neural development. I think. Do you think that's true? I don't have any proof about that, but I think it's true. I think when you put something, in, uh, when you re rebuild the middle ear mechanism, it seems to. I'm not sure, but it okay. seems to be that. But if you, if you, the the, the, other, the question, the the way of answering this question is slightly different. If you wait, then the bond connection will drop down, and then of course the result will be not as good as the one you could have at the beginning. So I think when there is indication, if the patient agrees, of course. If you have to, you have to talk about a hearing aid with him. I think it's better to do it when the bond connection is fine. Then he would be very happy. Otherwise, if you do it with the bond connection dropping down, he will not so happy. So it's, so it's you, you, something like you that. You tell the, to a patient that if it uh, waits more time, then no, I don't say that ah, because okay. because again, I don't have any proof. So okay. you cannot say if you wait, it will be decreased. No, certainly not. But I feel that it helps. And it's more more difficult to do the surgery. No. You? the same thing. No, it's not it's really usually not unless they've got obliterative. Mm. Otherwise, it doesn't yeah, make but it's interesting because there's no relationship <laughs> between obliterative otosclerosis and importance of the airborne gap. You can have a small no, no, airborne gap with obliterative cases. That's true, but if you've got an obliterative case, they they do sometimes progress. So if you've yeah. got one that's really bad and you look at the other ear, there's quite a case to do the other one sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's a slightly different argument. I think the thing about uh, surgery and it, making affecting disease progression is is very it's a bit dubious really isn't it I mean I, I know people say that. but what you might say to your patient they sometimes come to you and say well I want surgery uh, but you know sh would it make much difference if I delay and I sort of think well if you're going to have surgery you might as well have it you know just get on with it and any other questions yep yeah yep. can uh, we pass uh, just yeah, one. sorry yeah of course no uh, just another one if you have a, a bilateral lotus sclerosis with a mixed uh, hearing loss which one you start to if you if you or if the patient choose to be operated the worst ear the worst one with the uh, sometimes worst bone sometimes conduction? if they are equal you have to ask the patient which one is the the worst for him he feels something and but then if it is a mixed one it's the, the a bilateral mix yes. hearing loss he will decide in that case okay. well, and if they 20, genuinely yeah, can't decide mm -hmm. ask them if they drive if they're the driver or the passenger so if they drive all the time you should do in the england mm -hmm. you do their left ear facing their passenger mm -hmm. away from the window mm -hmm. Yeah, they may not want to hear the wife yeah, or the husband. Yeah. Miguel. Can I ask them a question? Yeah. Uh, if you find a, a very nice view of the footplate, have you ever tried the reverse technique? And what do you think about it? I never tried, and I don't believe it gives the same result. But uh, I never tried, so I cannot tell you. Did you try? Why, why did did you? Yeah, I, I, I'm not using it, but sometimes uh, I have a, a, my previous... Uh, chief in the department was using it very commonly and once he said uh okay you have a very nice view i don't do it and but, i did it can you put so a vein, can you put a vein graft in the reverse technique? sorry can you put a vein graft in the, in the reverse technique no because you've still got the no no we're not there. using grafting oh, so it goes against the philosophy of vein graft could be but um yeah. just for everyone in the audience the reverse technique is where you do your staple off meaning you put your piston on before you take the stapy superstructure away 
And the advantage of it is that it's a very nice stable incus to put your prosthesis on. It doesn't move at all. The disadvantage is you've then got to manipulate the stapes and take it out yes, when you've actually got a prosthesis a through to the inner ear. And it strikes me that that's dangerous. You know, you've got to divide the joint, take this, the, and that, all that movement. If you've divided the joint, if you reverse the joint, no, but you no, it was fish didn't. He used to just leave it and then put the prosthesis on and then take the superstructure. Yeah, yeah, we usually use the laser to for the crewers and everything. So okay. in the end, it's so that's so not smooth when you remove. Yeah, it. yeah. You know, but but it's against. You we, can't we, do the vein graft because there's no space. For it. Well, it's a, a debate of with question. or without yeah. interposition, yeah. and I think it's the same result with or without interposition. Yeah. Just let them finish. Okay. Uh, so yes. just a couple of quick questions. Uh, firstly, um, what's the panel's opinion on stapes in the only hearing ear? Um, and secondly, how long do you follow up your patients for? Okay. Uh, only hearing ear? Robert? <laughs> you have two ways of answering that. The official way is to say, don't do it. Because if you have a complication, that would be a problem. But things progressively are moving because of a cochlear implant. So the presentation will be different. To be honest, I've been doing few cases, very few, on unique ear. But it's a long-term discussion with the patient. And you have desperate patient with a very big airborne gap, and the hearing aid is not working anymore because the, it's, very, it's very bad. So, I mean, as a human, you have to do something. And of course, you are afraid of having a complication. But I think in this specific case, my opinion is that you have to take a risk. But to take a risk with the patient. So I asked him a, a full written letter that he ex yeah, I explained everything, he understood the things and everything and everything. And I had a good result with that. I uh, did probably something like uh, 10 cases, or something, no more. But they're all, they're all cases with really bad hearing yeah, yeah, in their yeah, hearing yeah, sure, ear. Sure, sure. So you clearly wouldn't do it on where, where they're going to do yeah, really yeah, well with their hearing aid. They're patients who are going to struggle with the hearing yeah. aid. And I've done that for exactly the same situation. Yeah. Uh, and you said another question or is that it? Oh, how long do you follow up for? What do you mean? I see them at three months, one year, every year, if possible. So, you know, and uh, then the maximum follow-up now is probably 25, 30 years, unfortunately. <laughs> they, some of them, of course, they're not coming at, tw at 30 years, but I have patients after 30 years, so it's interesting. Good to see, because you can see the evolution of the bond connection with time. And I've, I've published that in the paper. What about uh, in Spain? Do you How much follow? Because I, I follow them up. Uh, I see them at two weeks, I see them at six weeks, and I see them at six months, and that's it. Not because I don't want to, I'd very happily see them, but nobody's going to pay for that, either on the NHS or privately. So uh, that's what I do. How about in Spain? But, yeah. So I was going to say, as a result of Robert's um, research, there were, there were pundits in the UK who were saying, uh, stapy surgery is the first stage of a hearing aid. We'll go and say, my stapy surgery. Um, and you went down 10 decibels per decade. But his follow-up has showed it's three decibels. It makes a big difference to the patient. Yeah, it was less than one decibel per year of it. I was able to f follow a court of patients, and I published that on ontology and ontology. I don't remember the name. The court was something like, I don't remember, around 100. And they were followed over 10 years. And the evolution of the bond conduction was exactly the same as the normal population. 0.4 decibel per year, something like that. What about follow-up in Spain? Well, we usually follow, in my case, in the in the public, usually discharge the patient after one year yeah. because it's impossible to yeah. see all yeah. of them. But in the in the private, we try to see the patient all, all, every year if possible. Okay. Just to follow and, and to learn because it's important keep learning from your patient. So, so it's important to know. And do you charge them every year when they come to see you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, so it's okay, partly to learn and partly to pay. Just pay to two charge. very quick questions. Because <laughs> otherwise you're going to miss your... Yeah, I keep learning and earning <laughs> for my patients. Very quick, very quick response to the reverse fish technique. Uh, the reverse fish technique, we've uh, just authored a paper on 400 uh, reverse fish techniques, stapedotomies, and the results are basically the comparable to, so, to uh, a normal technique. Mm. And it's just, uh, since we're 
using the perforator, it just gives you a nice point to lean on the stapes right. as it is there if you're using a manual perforator because it's just gonna it's gonna help you guide the perforator toward the the the, the foot plate. It's gonna help you just feel uh, the the trepanation happening. Yeah. And we've ha haven't had any issues or complications or anything other. And the success rate is 90% uh, within 15 d dB and uh, about 82% within 10 dB. So and that's you, that's comparable you, to just, a discopic. Just and, this business with the superstructure. What do you do? Yeah. So you got your piston in, and what do you do with the superstructure? Then? You have your piston in, and yeah. you just uh, slide it a little bit toward uh, cranially, not to get in the way, and yeah. then you divide the uh, incontestipedial joint with a, any sort of instrument you want, the beaver yeah. knife or whatever, yeah. or, or, a, yeah. or a hook. And then you just, we use a, a small hook to uh, uncouple the posterior crust, just to, we get it inside the posterior. We don't use a laser because yeah. yeah. it takes too much time. It's too expensive for creation healthcare. Okay. Uh, but we use the, the hook and then press it gently at the posterior crust and then just kind of wedge it in yeah. and then divide it gently uh, until it breaks. You have to be really gentle and kind of, you know, be one with the foot plate. Yeah. And the stapes, and then you just topple the stapes over. We don't do divide. We don't divide the interior crust. We just break it, and very, very few complications. Possible. Uh, possibly we do we do test. Why do I always press the we always press the the, the joint, but we can't know always. Yeah, uh, for that rare occasion, we you know just uh, leave it to chance. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much. It was really good. Uh, thank you all very much, and we will see you guys tomorrow. Okay. Good, good, good. Thank you very much. No, 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 no. I made a mistake. No, no, no. Would you, would you move?